Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us virtually for our post-budget town hall. We usually have hundreds of people sitting inside of our Manny Cantor Center, the Education Alliance. And um, for those of you who I haven't had the opportunity to say hello to, um, as all of you know, I am Yuleen New, and I'm the assembly member for the 65th district, which covers lower Manhattan. And I wanted to take this time and moment to give a special thanks to our panelists today and also to all of the elected officials um, who are joining us today uh, for taking the time um, to help us to improve our understanding of the issues uh, that we face together as a community. Um, I also wanted to thank the constituents and the New Yorkers who are joining us today um, from three different kinds of feeds and uh, today um, I just wanted to make sure that folks are getting their answers, uh, their questions answered and the answers that they want to uh, know about, uh, about the the laws that are being passed and the uh, budget uh, that was passed and the cuts that are coming. And so uh, I'm just so happy to be here today with all of you for our post-budget town hall. Uh, first, I want to quickly explain how our town hall works. So usually um, we have note cards, et cetera, and they're color coded and very, very organized and people can ask questions live. But um, right now, because of how uh, the, Zoom atmosphere has become and because of how like we are now doing uh, presentations and uh, meetings through um, different applications, we wanted to make sure that your questions can still be answered. Um, you can directly chat the questions over to our office staff, who will then forward the questions over and place them in our right panel. Um, you can also feel free to email questions over to our email, and I'm just going to say that that's uh, at info at yulinu.org, and I'm going to spell it for you. It's info, I-N-F-O, at Y-U-H-L-I-N-E-N-I-O-U dot O-R-G. And again, that's info at yulinu.org, so my full name dot O-R-G. And so please leave your email and or your phone number uh, so that we can follow up with your questions in case we don't get to them today. We're gonna try to get to everything, of course, but as you know, we are already a very long program and we are also very crunched in time. Um, in the last week of March, I just wanted to let folks know that we gathered as state legislators to vote on all of the proposed budget bills. The are uh, all of the bills that, there's seven in total, that have the content of our entire state's budget in them. Um, there are some wins in this budget. Uh, the 2020-21 uh, budget uh, includes a measure that authorizes, for example, the use of e-bikes. And um, the use of e-bikes right now is very, very crucial due to folks um, being uh, you know, needing our essential workers who are delivery workers to be able to deliver food. Um, the use of e-bikes is incredibly important for our delivery workers who now find themselves on the front line of this pandemic. And um, we also did things like banning fracking and the use of uh, polystyrene single use containers, um, both of which are devastating to our environment. Um, we also passed a bill that will require annual sick leave policies for all private sector employees. Um, you know, there's a couple of good things like that in our bill, but overall, I just wanted to note that um, our budget was not optimal and not ideal. Um, I am very sad, very angry, and very frustrated when I look at the past budget bills. Um, the budget will leave many people, many programs, and many policies that we all agree are vital for our state, uh, you know, rather unfunded and unable to fulfill our goals. Um, as as legislators, we were left with very little choice but to vote for what we all know is a flawed budget despite our misgivings and despite the fact that it further erodes the balance of power that should exist between the legislative and executive branches. Some of us in this room voted yes, some of us in this room voted no. I was a no vote, um, but I know that it is a very tough spot to be in um, because of the way that uh, the budget is framed and the budget was uh, written. And so um, I wanted to uh, also talk about how I believe that we had an opportunity in this budget to make a bold shift to a state spending plan that truly values all people and embraces a future in which we are actively moving to do things like reduce poverty, build stronger infrastructure, expand housing and transit, to honor our health workers, and also to 
our teachers and our first responders and to create good jobs across our state while preparing for future challenges. We had that opportunity and we are letting it pass us by in favor of a budget that allows New York to basically barely get by, but little more. Um, today, we want to discuss with our amazing panelists what these budget changes mean for you, our community, and what we need to fight for going forward. And I just want to go through um, and say thank you to all of the panelists again. And I also wanted to give an opportunity for our uh, electeds who are joining us on this call to say hello and to also be able to um, tell us a little bit about their thoughts on the budget and also a little bit about what they're uh, working on during the pandemic right now. So first I want to um, really, really, I want, sorry, that was my partner. I wanted to very quickly say um, a huge welcome to our amazing Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. Gail? Well, thank you very much, Assembly Member. I do miss your wonderful uh, events that take place. We sit on stools and we then go and have great discussions um, at Educational Alliance and it, it's really missed. I don't miss everything, but I do miss those and because they're very special, both for the women, the one you did on women and for the, the oh, specific topic. So, but anyway, we'll learn a lot today. And that's a little bit what I want to talk about for a minute, which is the future. And I think as a Manhattanites, and elected officials, we should be doing two things, and I'm going to work on it with the community boards and Manhattanites, which is the, the, the mayor has a group of people, I've seen the list, I'm sure you have also, who are the what's going to happen in the future people, and then the governor has a list, some of whom are upstaters and some of whom are New Yorkers, and I think as a group we should be putting together, I've already started what we want for the borough of Manhattan, and there are uh, so we're different. And so I'm working on that. I'd love to have your input. But one of them is just even things like testing sites. The only one on the Lower East Side that's a public, I think, is Gouverneur. And we need to be, we need more testing sites in the borough of Manhattan. Um, we also need to think about, you know, what does it look like for the future, for the restaurants and for the bars and so on, because we have so many of them. And my understanding from the governor, and you know better than I, is it's gonna be very industry-based. You know, what does the uh, Hospitality Alliance, Restaurant Association, NYC and company, et cetera. So what do they think should be happening? But I think the community boards and local officials should also be thinking about that. I've been talking with Steve Levin, whom I adore as a uh, council member about, there are some groups doing some really interesting work in Massachusetts and California in terms of surveillance that doesn't cross the line around civil liberties and HIPAA issues, which are really important. And we can talk more about that, but they really are able to say where there are issues and where there are not using fascinating data in a positive way. So that's something to think about for the future. And then the schools. I've been on the phone because we appoint some of the CEC members, as you probably know. So we've been virtually meeting with them on a regular basis. Um, we appoint two on every CEC. And I think you know some of the issues, but um, what is it gonna look like in September? What do the CECs and the parents want it to look like in September? What do we want it to look like in September? And all those kinds of issues, I think they need to come up more and more because um, that's what we're gonna be dealing with. So without getting into all the specifics, um, you know, off the call, we need to have more discussion about what is the future. Those are just some of the things that I've been thinking about and there are many, many more. But in terms of working on topics, obviously uh, we've been, we were able to convince the mayor and I thank him, thank him, in particular, uh, Catherine Garcia to get the uh, fresh direct contract uh, to exist because they were volunteered before. So uh, from the top of Manhattan to the bottom of Manhattan, we've been going to the NYCHA developments on the Lower East Side, as Harvey knows, it's on Friday. And that's been very successful because it's 500 uh, packets of food and we've been trying to distribute them within the community to the different NYCHAs. Um, I think the seniors and food, just not just NYCHA, is better. Catherine Garcia has finally gotten the 311, I think, not always the best quality of food, but at least you don't have to call every two days. The seniors were frustrated beyond belief. I was worried, you were worried. 
Um, so it looks like if you're on the list, having called 311 and asked for the food line, you do get food. Finally, last week, every senior center got the list of who's on their list and who's not, because they really didn't know. They'd added people doing grab and grow. They didn't have the list. And most of the senior centers have been trained on the platform that the city is using, and they have found it to be easy to use and responsive. So let's hope that that helps. It was really challenging, to put it mildly. Um, I think we're all trying to get masks to people. We did get uh, 50,000 on Friday, and we distributed about 50,000 around the borough. I know uh, Vanessa uh, Diaz from our office, who I think you know, did a lot of distributing around the Lower East Side. And the, the need is tremendous. Um, I know, for instance, I went yesterday, the mayor, to his credit, said, we're going to give out masks in parks. And I think they did some on Catherine Street this morning. But I went to Central Park yesterday just to see how it would work, because that was their first stop. And uh, it was a 10 o'clock to 12 noon time frame for the PEP, the PEP officers, to give them out. And they were gone by 1030 or 1045. Um, so everybody needs masks just because we're supposed to wear them. People are really needing a mask. So, and they're not so easy to find. So we just need to keep doing that. I know that we're getting more on Monday and we'll be in touch if anybody uh, needs more, we're getting more on Monday. Um, nursing homes. So obviously we read about them. I think I did say to the mayor, you know, five weeks ago, nursing homes, because I was getting calls and it's a real one of those state city issues and it's they fall in between the cracks so we all know there are some like isabella which i we're all very fond of that nursing home so it's very challenging to hear the stories i don't you know i've heard the story from the nursing home isabella i've heard the story from uh relatives and i've heard the story from the governor and the mayor so it's uh in people died and that's the worst part and i know um I've been working with Kohler and Roosevelt Island, and obviously we all know Gouverneur, and I'm sure you know others. But I think, again, long term, we need a whole lot of work with the nursing homes. Um, people are scared to death to go in. They don't know the communication is challenging, and sometimes the ownership is challenging. So you know that from Rivington, it, loving it in the past, not sure what's next. So I think that's a topic to uh, pay attention to in the future. Um, the stores, we all know uh, PPP issues. SBS, the city has been trying. Um, I think that it's a, the banks who have been a challenge. My understanding from uh, your congresswoman and uh, Congressman Espiat and the feds in general, and Congressman Nadler too, that there's gonna be a fifth stimulus. And some of these bank issues were tried to be dealt with. Um, but I can tell you just from neighbors and friends who own businesses, no question, but to go to a smaller bank was a ticket as opposed to working with a large bank. I mean, almost exclusively because who knows who the big banks were working with, but not the small businesses for sure. So we need to work. I, I worry so much when I hear something like 50% of the small businesses aren't gonna make it and a third of the nonprofits aren't gonna make it. And the arts organization, we've been working with a lot and they even have more challenges because if, if there's no box office, the virtual is great, but it doesn't bring in a lot of money. So we have to think really creatively about the arts. Um, you know more about housing than I do, but I certainly know we've been supporting zero increase. Uh, we wrote a letter, I think, with others of Red Guidelines Board. And certainly, it's great to have a moratorium, but God help us when the rent is due. So I know I happen to support, I didn't even tell him in advance, Senator Kavanaugh's bill. And um, there's money. People need money. Very, very finally, I just want to mention on Chinatown, as you know, the REDC, the state, the state officials know this, the states divide up into 10 regions. Uh, we're in a region in the five boroughs, and every year $10 million for commercial is given out in a uh, region. And in the past, the Bronx got it, Brooklyn got it, Staten Island got it, and Queens got it. We should get it. And so I'm advocating that Chinatown get it, and we're working to make that happen. So I just want to bring that up. And um, thank you very much. I will just, uh, as you know, as I said earlier, people asking me about weddings and I understand the city clerk is gonna be ready 
at the end of this week to have the paperwork so it's 100% virtual, and then I'm sure you can Zoom it, and the rest is history. Thank you very much. Oh, there we, there we go. Sorry. They said, thank you so much, Gail. Um, I just wanted to, uh, speaking of Senator Kavanaugh, bring up Senator Kavanaugh to talk a little bit about, um, you know, his thoughts on the budget and um, also what uh, is going on in the district on his end for uh, the COVID response. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Eileen. Uh, and uh, I echo uh, Gail Brewer's sentiments, your uh, town hall, your in-person town hall meetings really had become a wonderful fixture of our community um, and, you know, a great opportunity for it to get together um, and hear from each other and learn what's going on and all of your wonderful work. Um, this is, you know, a great substitute. Uh, I think it's going to lack the, uh, you know, food from various uh, restaurants in the neighborhood that we usually enjoy, sometimes while the speaking is going on and sometimes after, but uh, really, again, appreciate the opportunity to be here and your role convening this and your great leadership in our community and in uh, your work in Albany. Um, I, I wanna, so uh, Gail Brewer covered a lot of uh, what's been going on on the ground uh, throughout Manhattan and certainly um, all of those issues are, uh, you know, primary concerns in our community. Um, we've been working very closely with uh, Yulene's office and all of our colleagues uh, to make sure that the, all of these systems that we had to stand up very rapidly are in place and are improving day by day. So everything from uh, making sure uh, seniors who previously relied on food uh, in person at senior centers got that system transitioned to a sort of a distribution system, uh, making sure also food at the schools has been available. Uh, and, you know, uh, in addition to the direct deliveries, um, that Gail Burr was talking about. Um, uh, an issue that uh, is really a state issue, it's a, it's a distribution of both state and federal funds uh, that I know was very, very difficult initially, initially and still continues to be difficult has been the uh, implementation of the enhanced unemployment benefits uh, that people are supposed to be receiving. Um, that system was clearly not designed uh, to take the volume of people who came all at once seeking benefits as the economy shut down very rapidly. Um, we've worked very hard to improve that, to work with the State Department of Labor and push for uh, elimination of barriers and moving that system to uh, a system that can get take the application without people spending hours and hours on the phone. Um, uh, on hold and uh, make sure the benefits are flowing. Um, it's still not, it's still a work in progress. Our offices, uh, if you are having a particular problem, can contact the DOL directly and try to get that addressed. So please do contact us and I'll give my contact information at the end or obviously uh, Eulene's office uh, can be very helpful as well. On the budget, I, I you know, you, Eulene, you said it well, it was a very difficult budget. Um, as we know, the, the budget is ultimately a product of something the governor proposes to the legislature. There's negotiation about what that's going to look like. At the end of the day, the legislature has to do an up or down vote when the clock runs out and the negotiation is over. Um, I share the concern about um, many of the uh, cuts and uh, the uh, things that were omitted from that budget. Um, we and we're going to we're going to continue that story. It's going to be a continuing challenge. One of the things that was uh, contemplated in that budget is a process by which throughout the year there'll be a reassessment which will begin by the governor proposing um, changes to the budget probably uh, likely mostly cuts to the budget um, as the economic emergency continues and as tax revenues continue to decline so uh, the first of those um, the first round of that is actually uh, upon us uh, it, it was supposed to be no earlier than uh, May 1st, which was Friday. Uh, so, and the governor has signaled that there'll be a set of proposals to reduce spending in certain areas will be coming. Uh, we will be monitoring that very closely. And the provision says that if the legislature uh, can come up with a better plan, um, we can substitute that for anything the governor is going to propose. But that's going to be very challenging. And so people should pay attention to that. Uh, the budget process usually ends on April 1st, and then we come back next year. But this is going to be an ongoing struggle in New York. Um, one issue that was not really addressed, and Gail Brewer alluded to it just a moment ago, is this question of housing and support for people who can't pay their rent, and also people who can't pay mortgages uh, during the course of the crisis because they've lost uh, income. So as the state budget was passing, 
There was also this allocation of mo some money in the federal budget through the CARES Act for housing uh, expenditures. Um, and it was a significant amount of money. It would actually, in normal circumstances, getting hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government would, consider, would be considered a great uh, boon, a very large amount of money. Um, it's relatively, it's small relative to the enormous uh, challenge we have before us uh, with you know, thousands, really tens of thousands of, of tenants unable to pay, and also people having trouble with their mortgages. Um, we have proposed, uh, there are uh, several different approaches to this. I know uh, some uh, people, including Yulene, uh, have proposed uh, a, a cancellation of rent. Um, we've been working on a proposal that would permit uh, the government to pay the rent for people. Uh, and it, so we're developing a program at the state level so there's a clear understanding of who's, whose rent would get paid and how it would get paid and who would be eligible uh, with the goal of avoiding that thing that happened with unemployment where the money came and then we had to begin to figure out how to work out you know, what the payment would look like um, and how it would be administered. So we're trying to work out those details now in negotiation over a piece of legislation uh, and we've gotten broad support for that. The critical thing, though, is that the only entity that has the money necessary to cover those costs at this point is the federal government. The city and the state budgets must be balanced by law. We don't have the kind of credit of the federal government that would be necessary to run large deficits. The federal government has already decided uh, to allocate $2.7 trillion uh, to address uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And as has already been noted, there's an ex expectation of another round of stimulus. The message need to be said over and over again, loudly and clearly, that the federal government needs to step up on and cover the real cost of housing to make sure tenants have the resources to pay their rent, to make sure landlords have the resources to maintain their buildings and pay their property taxes that are going to become going to be critical to the city government in providing services, and to pay. Uh, their, their own mortgages and their uh, employees' uh, uh, wages and benefits. Um, and so uh, our several hundred of us have written to Congress at local elected officials around the state, uh, as well as advocate, advocacy organizations, calling for a $100 billion federal allocation nationwide, of which New York would get $10 billion. Uh, that, that was our ask. Um, and several members of our congressional delegation have expressed support for that, but we know it's going to take a huge push. So please, as you're talking, we, we're getting contacts from our uh, constituents. Uh, I'm sure you lean is and, and I am in the state Senate and, and city council members and Gail Brewer. Please make sure you're including advocacy. If you're contacting elected officials, contact your federal officials as well. Your, your U.S. senators and your Congress members and ask them to make sure that is a priority. Uh, just two other briefly on housing issues, on uh, mortgages, uh, homeowner mortgages. Uh, we have a piece of legislation that would address that to the extent we can at the state level. Uh, it basically takes, there's currently a forbearance period uh, during which the bank is not permitted to collect your mortgage uh, payments or take any adverse action against you if you can't pay. Uh, the, the bill we have would extend that period uh, for to a six month uh, forbearance. It's currently uh, three months with a possibility of an additional six month extension after that. And it would take all of the payments that are due during that period, which are currently going to come due right at the end of the period, and it would move it basically to the end of the mortgage. So if you have a mortgage until 2030, until January 2030, it would, uh, it would extend that mortgage to July of 2030 or uh, January of 2031, so that you, you're basically making those payments at the same pace you're making them now, but many years from now. We believe that would uh, leave people more or less such that their mortgage effectively didn't um, impose any burden on them during this crisis. Uh, so again, that is a bill that we have the authority in New York to do with state, with mortgages that are backed by state banks, or we believe also that are carried or administered by state, by mortgage service companies in New York. There are many mortgages that are instead administered by interstate banks or by the federal government. We believe the federal government has the authority to do the same thing as that, uh, that we're doing at the state level. With, with respect to federal mortgages. So we've worked with uh, Congress uh, member Kathleen Rice the day we introduced our bill. 
uh, she uh, committed to introduce a comparable piece of legislation at the, at the federal level. She's a caucus member from Long Island. Uh, so again, we hope that through those tools, we can make the uh, mortgage situation for homeowners uh, better. Just one more brief thing on housing homelessness. Um, it's become, people have become more aware than ever before of the crisis that is homelessness in New York. As much as we understood uh, it was a terrible tragedy that so many people were living in public spaces and living in shelters uh, and, and at numbers that are just, you know, outrageous, even in normal times. When you're dealing with a contagious disease that is a pandemic, it is especially critical that people are not uh, forced to live in public spaces or live in congregate settings where they can't maintain the kind of distance that we're all talking about uh, as a critical part of our response to this. So. Uh, a key part of our housing strategy needs to be providing much more affordable permanent housing for people and also increasing the capacity of the shelter system to uh, get people out of congregate settings, get people off the street. So we're working on that as well. And that should be part of the funding that uh, the federal government provides. Again, sorry to go on for a while, uh, but again, it's a great, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And um, I look forward to the rest of the program today. And thank you so much again, Yulene, for all your work and your uh, collaboration on so many of these things. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, I wanted to call my next, my next speaker, which is actually my other senator, um, Brad Hoylman, who's working on a lot of things as well. Brad? Yeah, you share. Um, but I uh, wanted to say hello to my colleagues and uh, all of our shared constituents, Yulene. Uh, and thank you, you know, I have to say, you really, um, you really are a standout in the assembly and I know Harvey agrees. You're, um, the way you are able to focus on an issue uh, as we've seen during this budget process and, you know, give truth to power, encapsulate it in a um, policy, initiative um, is really inspiring. So I just really want to thank you for our partnership and everything you're doing for your district. You've been particularly, um, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, courageous uh, even before COVID-19 even like landed on our shores. We saw that um, uh, your community uh, had to be outspoken and uh, I'm very grateful for everything you've done. So um, I just want to share in uh, Senator Kavanaugh's concern about uh, housing and tenants' rights and wanted to thank you again, Yulene, for your cancel rent legislation. Uh, I, there's no more important issue right now that I'm hearing from my constituents than their, besides their health, it's their economic health. And so many, uh, and I know my colleagues agree, so many of our constituents are calling us on a daily basis. We become unemployment insurance, you know, uh, liaisons, whether we wanted to or not. That's, that's kind of like our full-time job. And I encourage all of our constituents to continue to call our offices about unemployment insurance. We can take uh, a case and try to usher it through to fruition. That's, that's our job. And I know that Caroline Wexelbaum, who I think is on the line with me, my colleague, has been doing that so uh, effectively. M one of my former staffers, David Kruger, who I think some folks know, uh, bad news is he left my office a few months ago. Good news is he landed up in the Department of Labor. So he, uh, he's able to be kind of our insider uh, in my office to help usher these cases through. So I wanted to encourage people to do that. And on the cancel rent movement, um, you know, <laughs> I think Senator Gianaris, your co-sponsor, said it best, which is whether there was a rent strike or not, uh, effectively, um, it exists because we know that our um, many of our constituents just don't have the money to pay their rent. Right? And they, you know, so many of them are uh, not well, their family members are ill, um, they're battling illness, they're homeschooling, they've lost their jobs. I mean, it is, it is a perfect storm of of proportions uh, none of us could have ever expected. That's why I appreciate Senator Kavanaugh's efforts and your efforts. Um, a bill that I've introduced with Senator Kruger, uh, which I think fits into both of the legislative strategies that you heard outlined, would um, give tenants, and whether they're commercial or residential, 
uh, six months after the state of emergency is declared ended to get healthy, get back up on their feet, uh, get their jobs back in place, and then start paying rent and give them eviction protections all the way through that period. As you know, the governor's eviction moratorium ends on June 18th. My concern and Senator Kruger's concern uh, is that landlords could be filing eviction proceedings as soon as the courts open up. And on June 19th, you could see a whole slew of evictions across the, across the city. So thanks to, to Ellen for helping us craft this legislation uh, that I think we want to try to build into whatever um, proposals we pass back in Albany when we start resuming our virtual legislation. Um, so wanna wanna thank you uh, for your efforts, uh, Ellen. And then, um, you know, we still have so many other issues um, that, uh, that we have to pursue simultaneously. I'm very concerned about this the inaccuracy of the antibody tests that are currently flooding the market and the fact that so many New Yorkers now have this false assurance that they've been exposed to COVID-19, yet the reality shows that some of these tests are 16, give 16% 16 false positives. Uh, I was, you know, I took a walk last night, I'm sure a lot of you did, and you saw people congregating on street corners with their face masks down and, you know, sipping their, their their rosé out of uh, out of thermos bottles. Uh, it's kind of nice to see that public spirit, but it seems very risky, um, given that you know close to three hundred people died yesterday, um, and uh, this you know this crisis is uh, while we're going down uh, the curve, uh, like the governor just said this morning, the risk uh, remains very high. So we still have to continue our social distancing and make certain that people are getting accurate tests. And clearly uh, the antibody tests have shown uh, some concerns. The only tests that I think that public health officials are relying on truly at this point are the diagnostic swab tests where you actually know if you're COVID uh, positive or not. That said, um, you know, I'm you know, um, going to continue to work with uh, all of my colleagues on this line and making sure that people get the supplies they need, whether it be food or sanitizer. Um, we've all been working together extremely well um, in Manhattan. And I just want to thank my colleagues again for, you know, whether it's food pantries that, that Harvey uh, has helped organize with Carlina Rivera's office. Um, we're getting hand sanitizers, you know, that were, you know, you lean, that we're all trying to uh, uh, organize and Senator Kavanaugh to our, to our public housing. Uh, and ensuring that um, you know we check in on our seniors and vulnerable people. It's been a wonderful group effort. I think it, you know, while this is a dreadful time for us, it has shown the best of our communities uh, in many respects. And um, uh, Eileen, I know this is a budget conversation, and I think that you know what you know as well as I do, hanging over our heads right now, are ten billion dollars worth of proposed cuts um, that the governor has threatened. Uh, if it is a if it is a strategy to get more federal money, uh, I commend him for that because I, as Senator Kavanaugh said, we can't do this without the feds. Um, I disagree with Senator Kavanaugh the, to the extent that whether the state can borrow, you know, the state has already borrowed and we continue to borrow. Um, and if we need to clarify our borrowing abilities, we should do that. But I do agree with him that we shouldn't borrow until we know what we're getting from the feds. Um, and that fight has to continue with um, our Congress members um, and ensure that they have the backing of everyone here on this line. Um, but, um, you know, so when we go back, Eileen, um, we got to figure out additional revenue. Uh, if the feds aren't giving it to us, how are we going to get it? And, you know, um, is it, you know, there's a lot of great proposals out there. Um, I, I, I've introduced some, um, I think, you know, um, I, whether it's, uh, the, the, Harvey's mezzanine tax, uh, which is, I think, is a really creative solution. Uh, whether it is, you know, the personal income tax that, you know, if you want to tax rich people, that's the most efficient way to do it. Uh, whether it's looking at uh, some taxes that, that um, New York has, um, you know, not collected well, 
over over the last uh, 10 to 15 years or tax cuts that we've instituted. You know, I think everything like Andre Stewart Cousins said has to be on the table. So uh, that's going to be, I think, one of our biggest responsibilities. I think the biggest mistake would be, Eileen, is if we cut during a recession. I think that's been shown to to double down on um, the, uh, you know, uh, economic uncertainty and and actually create, not only does it create greater hardships for the most vulnerable, but it slows recovery. Um, we need a stimulus package. Uh, we need money uh, at every level. The state cannot be responsible for cuts to, you know, healthcare, schools, seniors, homeless. Uh, uh, it's just, it's immoral and, and effective. So I join you, Eileen, in the call for greater revenue. Uh, I know my colleagues are in lockstep on that point. How we get there is going to be, you know, um, it's going to be our sh shared fight. Uh, but I look forward to continue partnership in that regard. I know that um, we'll have great support from our constituents because they've seen, as we see, um, and as the calls we get and the contact we make with our constituents, um, our public is hurting and we need to help them out. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, as we all know, and as this uh, pandemic has shown us, you know, we are very interconnected. Um, we might not be on the same boats, uh, as a lot of people say, you know, oh, we're all on the same boats. Like, actually, no, some people have yachts and other people have dinghies and maybe a floaty device that has a hole in it. Like, I don't know, but I do think that, um, you know, we all are interconnected though. And um, helping your neighbor is helping yourself right now. And also helping um, each other is helping uh, all of us uh, get through this. So thank you so much for your thank wide work. Oh, let me just wait, may one more. Thank you to the borough president for getting so much food to our constituents. I mean, thank you it's so just much. been, it's, li it's life-saving. And uh, I'm just so grateful that I hear reports from seniors who have gotten, you know, fresh pantry deliveries because of her efforts. So thank you, Borough President. Yes, thank you, Gail, for all of the work you've been doing, uh, making sure that our uh, districts have the supplies that it needs and the PPEs and the, um, you know, and the food that we've been uh, desperately needing. So I wanted to really uh, focus on your efforts there for a second and say thank you because we can't, we really can't um, do the things that we're doing now without your help as well on that upfront. Um, I also wanted to say uh, hello to my neighbor, to the east north, I guess, northeast. <laughs> and I just wanted to say that um, he's been an incredible partner in all of this. And, um, you know, we, uh, we fought together on, um, on, on raising revenue and uh, making sure that we can get the things that we wanted in the budget. Unfortunately, um, you know, we didn't get what we wanted for NYCHA, for Medicaid, for um, education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, he was also a partner in uh, voting no on the budget this year. So Harvey Epstein. Thank you, Yulene, and really want to thank you for your leadership and really good to hear from Brad and Brian and Gail. And you know, we, as you, we do such a good job here in the East Side, Lower East Side, working together. We just are a really strong team. Just want to raise a couple of things if I can. Just want information things for people who are on here that we're giving away masks tomorrow at Sixth Street in the FDR with the mayor's office at 10 a.m. If people want to come over, give away free masks. Like Gail mentioned that also. With all the offices here, uh, with Eileen, my office, with Brad, Brian, Gail, just food delivery. If you need food, reach out to our office, Eileen's office, Brad, Brian, Gail, Vision Urbana, Henry Street. We're great community partners who are doing a lot of this food delivery. So together, if you do need food, and there's a lot of great fresh food that's going out, you should you should reach out to us. Um, you know, there's just get out these big jugs of hand sanitizer. Unfortunately, it's hard to, to do anything with big jugs. So we're trying to work on getting it accessible for people. So you can reach out to us around, you know, hopefully have little bottles that will be in place for folks in the near future. Uh, also, there's been a lot of testing going on. We haven't gotten a night to site down by us yet for to doing testing. There's been some of that happening in the Bronx. I've been told, at least from our speaker, Eulene, 
that we'll be getting some sites, some testing done by us at some NYCHA developments. I don't know, I heard that at the end of last week and hopefully that'll be happening soon. We do have Gouvenier, by the way. Gouvenier is doing testing right, right. now. Yeah, okay. but they're going to do, they're going to go on site at the NYCHA development like they did in the, sorry, in the Bronx since we have a, yeah, such a high a, supply of NYCHA. Not, there's nothing down here. There, there is a Gouvenier as a site and then we also are placing two more sites within NYCHA complex. Right, exactly. Um, so we've heard from students, you know, CUNY, SUNY, about remote learning and some of the problems they're having there. Same thing with uh, problems on education. If you're hearing, if you have a problem, if you're a public school parent or you're a student at CUNY or SUNY, you should reach out because we're trying to manage that. Brad mentioned the unemployment benefits and the crisis that are going on. It's really outrageous. Uh, as two last things, I just want to mention there was a recent uh, a police um, assault on some constituents of mine that happened last night in the Lower East Side. We had called on the commissioner to investigate that right away. It's, it's really disturbing the videos that we've seen at this point of, of the violence that was perpetrated against some people in our community. It is, you know, especially in a pandemic when you're saying that they, didn't, they were arresting people for not social distancing and you can look at Central Park, the idea that someone's sitting on a, on a stoop on uh, Avenue D and 9th Street um, is social distancing and it deserves that kind of physical assault when you see lots of white people in Central Park not even wearing masks and not social distancing. It's, it's, it's really awful and we, we've called on the commissioner and the mayor to do a full investigation and we do need the body camera. And just the last thing I'll say is just around the budget. Uh, and <clears throat> As Eileen mentioned, it was a tough budget. We fought hard against a lot of things. The changes in bail were, were awful, especially in a pandemic. The idea we're adding categories to crimes in bail, zero sense. That we didn't engage in any level of budget justice in an economic downturn, when millionaires and billionaires are doing just fine. We've seen reports of them even doing better. The top 10 millionaires, billionaires in, in New York have gotten raised revenue, more money coming to their pockets, not less. 30 million people getting unemployment. The idea that one or two percent increase in their tax basis on the city and state level, they wouldn't even feel it because they're getting so much more money. And we didn't stand up this year for New Yorkers. Now we're going to have a shot to do it three more times this year because the governor is going to propose three uh, revisions of the budget. And each quarter he's going to propose cuts and we're going to have to propose new revenue. So we're going to need your support here, both in the assembly and the Senate side to stand up and say, the only answer has to be new revenue. I get that the federal government has to come in and provide support and we need that desperately, but New York needs to stand strong as well. We need to stand strong, whether it's like Brad mentioned, the mezzanine tax, we're doing his Pieter Ter tax. You know, Eulene's got amazing revenues or bills that we want to talk about. All of those things have to happen and we need to happen now because the idea that we're gonna cut from Medicare and Medicaid, we're gonna cut our health and hospitals, we're not going to provide any resources for public housing. We're going to cut our school aid. We're going to cut services for people with disabilities time and time again. That can't be the answer, especially in a pandemic, especially as a, uh, the budget collapses. We can't do it. And the way to do it is to really help people, to cancel rent and put a hardship fund available for, for, for landlords if they need it, to protect the commercial storefronts. We have plans to do it. And I think in the next week or so, we'll be holding hearings. There was an announcement at a joint Senate and assembly hearing around potential hearings. And I plan to be there. And I know my colleagues will be there to push the things we care about because we have to cancel rent. We have to protect our small business and we have to fight for a better budget. And I stand in line with you. And Yulene, thank you for what you do. Thank you for being such a good friend and a colleague. And I look forward to your virtual town hall. We're all getting used to these now. So I'm sure it'll be fabulous. Thank you so much, Harvey. Um, I just wanted to uh, say thank you again to all of our elected officials who are here. Um, I had gotten some messages from Carlina on things that she wanted us to plug in. Um, she unfortunately couldn't be here today and I'll plug them in uh, as we are going through our panels as well. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, right now my district is going through a lot. You know, the things that Gail had just mentioned about small businesses is such a huge uh, concern for us um, because uh, my district, um, and especially in Chinatown, we started to feel the effects uh, much earlier than anybody else because of some of the racism that was going on, the xenophobia. And, um, you know, it was very hard to, um, 
you know, very hard to uh, take that up to Albany and have no response. And it was really hard to um, hear from folks that, um, you know, oh, now that we're all shut down, we have these things that we're going through. Well, actually, um, there's a lot of things that were happening um, before. And, uh, and, and, and this is why, you know, when I, when I talked about um, the budget um, on the floor, I really wanted people to know that these are choices that we're making. These are really clearly choices that we're making. Um, and, and I wanted to echo what Brad was saying, that, you know, when we are choosing to um, take as the government a little bit of the blow a little bit harder to us um it makes it so that we're not suffering for decades to come um for our people right and i think that like i i think that that these are choices that we have to be very conscientious about because um if we are if we're not raising revenue if we're not um making it so that our budget is the thing that takes the hit and not the people. Recovery will be much harder. And I think that we have to uh, really be conscientious as we make these decisions going forward. Um, and I, as we are talking about the budget, I hope that people can understand how dire some of these things are as we speak. Because when we are, when we are looking at each piece, and how the trickle down effects will affect people. Um, we're gonna have our panelists kind of tell us a little bit about what's going on on the front lines. And then also, um, you know, all of our elected friends here, um, please stay on and please, um, you know, chime in when you need to about the issues that, you know, have been affecting your district. I think that that's really, really important. Um, and I hope that we can um, talk a little bit about each of the pieces uh, and, and in the era of, now, right? What what the what the budget was when we passed it, and then also what the trickle down effect has been now, and what these uh, future um, stop gaps can be to make sure that the um, that the uh, trickle down domino effect isn't continuing. And so we can we uh, after all we can suggest answers and we can suggest uh, policy proposals and things, you know, as we are working right now still to the governor, um, but. You know, of course, we all have um, we all have uh, our our roles to play here as well to make sure that our uh, governor is hearing what we are proposing and suggesting, uh, and and what what is coming from our constituents and what is coming from their concerns as well. So um, I just wanted to run through, and I, and I think my staff is on here as well. So I just wanted to run through. Um, some of the things that happened in this year's budget. And as Brad had mentioned, and Brian has mentioned, there are $10 billion more worth of cuts being proposed on top of what was proposed already. And so I'm going to go through what our budget says, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the things that were also proposed. Um, and if, uh, Lawrence, if you can make sure that folks um, have our budget cheat sheet. A lot of folks know I'm very famous for my budget cheat sheets. We put them together um, with uh, a lot of effort. It takes us a long time to really be able to put it together, hours and hours of work. And um, I want to thank my staff for being so diligent about um, reading each line and putting together this budget cheat sheet. So um, it, you know, please print it out if you want, um, keep it with you, open it up on your on your screen right now so that you have it with you. Um, and, you know, there's a it's, it's inside of our Google Drive that we've opened up to folks to be able to get. So please view it, please take it um, and, 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 you know, use it, you know, feel free to take pieces of it and use it in your discussions with folks and also in, um, in, in, in advocating for the issues that you care about. So um, I just wanted to go through really quickly before we start our panels. Um, for education, this year's budget includes $27.9 billion for education for the fiscal year of 2020 to 2021. That is only a 0.3% increase over the previous year, which means that it does not account for inflation and in fact is much below it, um, but is still short of the $4 billion also of what the state needs for a truly equitable education system. We know that we have been owed uh, a lot of money for a very long time. Our district has the largest income disparity in the state and our schools reflect that disparity. Our schools in Lower Manhattan alone are owed over $44.3 million in education dollars and full, uh, fully funding our public schools is incredibly necessary for our community, especially now as students um, have missed 
large portions of the school um, and when people are not even given uh, laptops uh, in a timely fashion or might not have parents to get them for them um, or might uh, be homeless and in a shelter and cannot access the internet. And so, um, you know, public schools should give our students the resources that they most need, but they are unable to do that if we do not even have the proper funding. I want to I want to note that very loudly because it's not that they're not trying; it's that we don't have um, a lot of the funding that we need to be able to access um, the, the the things that we need to. This year's budget did not include the dollars that we need for truly equitable education for all of our students. Um, moving on to housing, this year's budget includes no additional NYCHA funding, but uh, instead reallocates the $350 million meant for infrastructure upgrades that we won that was allocated in previous years. I believe that this is very unacceptable. And in our district, 30% of our constituents live in public housing. And the number one issue that our constituents bring to our office is related to public housing. NYCHA's um, failing uh, you know, infrastructure is estimated to need $31.8 billion over the next five years, yet state money uh, allocated in previous years to repair and upgrade NYCHA's aging infrastructure is now being redirected instead um, for of uh, being distributed for their original purpose. Um, I think that this is a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, as you know, I was the person who carried the letter for um, NYCHA funding for the last uh, four years. And you know, this year we got extremely close. Um, Ellen can tell you a little bit about it, but we got extremely, extremely, extremely close to getting allocations for the next five years um, for NYCHA. But unfortunately, unfortunately, um, we then fell into this pandemic and uh, it gave the government the excuse I think, to not fund public housing the way that it needs to be. And especially when during a time when housing is actually healthcare, this is a, this is a, a very dire and um, cruel neglect. And I think that this budget is insufficient to meet the vital funding needs for our housing system. And we have to continue to fight for the housing revenue and funding that we need to solve our crisis in our city. Public housing is affordable housing. And it is one of the last uh, real affordable housing that we have here in our state, in our city, and we need to make sure to protect it. It is extremely important that protecting Lower Manhattan from climate change is a priority. Um, my district was obviously hit the hardest by Sandy, and at this point, there's no doubt that there will be another severe weather event like Superstorm Sandy, and the question is, when it will happen. We need to ensure that Lower Manhattan and New York State as a whole is as prepared as possible. The budget bans the use of polystyrene, AKA styrofoam, uh, food containers, and institutes a permanent ban on uh, hydro, uh, hydraulic fracking. And these are wins for our community and working towards a better environment, but this year's budget allows for New York State also to issue bonds in an aggregate, aggregate of $3 billion towards the Restore Mother Nature Act, which is dedicated towards climate change mitigation, environmental restoration and conservation and resiliency infrastructure. This bond is something that's very, very crucial, but we believe that the amount could have been a lot more. Um, we feel like this bond is something that is long overdue and we need to make sure that we are uh, also continuing to support it. This budget also allows municipalities to legalize electronic bikes and scooters. Delivery workers, many of whom live in our district and who are on the front lines of the pandemic every day, depend on e-bikes to make a living. And at our city level, we have been cruelly uh, fining them, um, but uh, we believe that this should not be criminalized or fined when they are just trying to achieve a, a living. And I am glad that the state has taken the step to uh, allow eco-friendly alternatives to cars, but I am disappointed about um, the legalization of e-scooters, which are insufficiently regulated and pose accessibility issues to our seniors and the disabled. And I have been um, included, and, and they have been included without uh, a lot of deliberation. Um, this is not something that is, uh, you know, used for delivery <laughs> and is not something that um, has been um, uh, even seen as a real alternative for car usage the way that e-bikes are. Uh, for the MTA, the budget also provides a dedicated funding stream towards the $54.8 billion in financing support needed for the 2020-2024 capital plan. Our district has some of the worst performing lines, some of the most inaccessible subway entrances, severe congestion, and poorly protected bike lanes. With organizational sh shuffles in the MTA, it is vital that we work to ensure our community's needs are heard. And so we will be hearing a lot of, about that from our transportation uh, panel as well. This year's budget rollbacks um, 
uh, th this year's budget rolls back uh, hard fought criminal justice reforms by extending. Time, but there will also never be a time to give into the racially motivated fear based attempts to roll back bail reform and go back to a system which worked against our communities and led to an inequitable criminal justice system in the first place. As we all have known for a very long time that there should not be two criminal justice systems, one for the rich and one for the poor. And we should make sure that um, that our criminal justice system is actually equal for everyone. And I wanted to say that I'm proud to have st stood up with my colleagues against bail reform rollbacks and um, I will continue to fight for more equitable um, systems because we all know that some systems it within actually most of the systems within our government uh, are designed to uh, hurt certain communities and help others. Finally this year the state's uh, Medicaid redesign plan cuts 400 million dollars to hospital spending but increases overall medical uh, Medicaid spending by 500 million 3% more than the previous year. The Medicaid redesign plan also makes modifications to the 300 million dollars of restored funds from the previous fiscal year's budget which includes 94 million dollars to reduce across the board cuts for most Medicaid providers, 70 million dollars for indigent care pool funding for public hospitals and 33.2 million dollars to restore enhancing safety net hospitals. Cutting Medicaid in any other budget year means that New Yorkers already suffer, that hospitals go without, that nursing homes close, and that there are staff shortages. But this year, cutting Medicaid means that a lot of people will die. And older adults and people with disabilities will end up in our emergency rooms because they can't be cared for in their homes and they will also die. And immigrants, black and brown New Yorkers, LGBTQ New Yorkers who can't get care at our community health centers, which are also being cut, uh, will die and healthcare professionals who are already overworked and underpaid, yet still on the front lines, putting themselves in harm's way to keep the rest of us safe, will continue to get infected and die. And so I wanted to um, take a pause here for a second because we know that um, so many of our friends and family have passed away and so many of our neighbors have gotten sick and we need to, um, to recognize that uh, that, that this has been a very difficult time for so many people. Um, sorry, I'm gonna take a pause. Um, we had a previous question in our question and answer and I hope that this will also be helpful, um, but naturally occurring retirement communities, NORCs, and neighborhood naturally occurring retirement communities and NORCs, which are crucial to the comfort and wellness of our seniors throughout my district, will be funded at $4 million each. Um, the settlement houses, which are essential to our community, will be funded at $2.4 million this year. These programs play an integral role in our community. This year, I've written budget letters in support of funding settlement houses and NORCs, and I will continue to fight for additional funding to ensure that these programs are able to adequately support our rapidly aging communities. Um, we have one a lot of uh, funding in these last couple of years um, to build up the North program. And now we are seeing the, the, those wins um, paying dividends because I think that without the infrastructure that we have been able to set up with the funding that we were able to get, um, that is uh, that we would be in a much worse situation right now for a lot of our seniors in our community. And I promise that we will continue to fight for the funding necessary to ensure that our community organizations and settlement houses receive the crucial funding they need to operate. Our district was hit, um, again, our district was hit by COVID-19 before we as a state knew what the scale of this crisis would be. And we are months ahead in the economic devastation, like I said, of this disease, because um, a lot of our small businesses started to see a lot less foot traffic, especially in Chinatown. There have been racist attacks and our community has not had access to the resources that they need. Um, and all of us in our district have been acutely aware of just how much this pandemic has changed and will change our city and our state. This pandemic has put a harsh spotlight on um, what is going on that we have not been doing on the state and the city level. And um, this is a reality that is not just of this moment, but it will be uh, continuing into our future and made worse by all of the decisions that we've made on the budget, um, but also um, will be worsened if we do not do something now about things that we need to change today. Um, I will continue to fight for the needs of our community in the continuing remote 
legislative session. I hope that we will be able to come back. We need our community to fight for us to come back. And we also need to um, protect our healthcare workers and our essential workers and all of those deeply affected by the ongoing health pandemic. And we will be talking to a lot of those experts. And again, I want to thank all of the electeds. I want to thank Gail, especially for some of the PPEs and the food that she's brought to our district. I want to thank um, my partner, Harvey Epstein, um, and also uh, my two senators, Brian Kavanaugh and Brad Hoylman, for all of the work that you guys have done. You guys are amazing in helping us keep that communication stream. And um, I wanted to say thank you to our um, two city council members who are today unable uh, to join us um, for, for their work as well. And during this town hall, um, I know that we were, we're gonna be speaking to a lot of the experts on a lot of these issues. So I know that there's been already a lot of questions rolling in. So we'll be taking those questions in each of the sections that um, our panels are speaking on. And so I wanted to start with one of the biggest things that has been raised and of course, Folks know, folks know that this has been one of the biggest things because we're facing it day to day. Um, housing and senior services, uh, which I think are um, two of the biggest things that we're dealing with, housing especially uh, as yesterday, um, I will say that when I dropped in my rent check, I myself was able to um, pay the full amount. My partner was not. Um, this is something that is hitting every single person um, as we uh, as we move forward, because um, the reality is, uh, you know, this is this is what we face day to day, um, and unfortunately, um, you know, there are whole industries that are no longer operating. There are people who um, can't make ends meet day to day, and uh, in it, you know, even as a regular <laughs> New Yorker, I would say that you know, even though people. Um, don't realize my my um, my income is not like super small, but at the same time, um, it is uh, you know taken up fifty percent of by rent, right? And so, if my partner, for example, wasn't able to um, you know pay his half because you know of whatever reason, right now, right now his entire industry shut down, so we have no income on his end. Um, if I was to pay his entire half, we would have no money for food. <laughs> so I just wanted to say that this is a reality for a lot of New Yorkers, uh, and myself included. And um, you know, so we're going to start with uh, you know the amazing Ellen Davidson, um, staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society, who has been one of the biggest champions of housing um, that I know and. Um, I know our district loves you greatly, Ellen, so thank you so much for coming. Um, Carlin Cohn, who I think is still having some difficulty with her camera, but um, Carlin is the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer at the Chinese American Planning Council. And then we also have Rocky Chin um, from AARP, who uh, will talk a lot about some of the senior issues that are going on. And we also have um, Melanie Wang um, with the Chinatown Tenant Union um, leader, oh, sorry, with CAV, sorry, but she, she's the Chinatown tenant union leader uh, and organizer at CAV. And so I wanted to say, um, you know, thank you to all of you. And I also wanted to uh, invite our elected officials to stay when, because they have, um, you know, Brian is obviously uh, the Senate housing chair. So we're lucky to have him here. And also Brad and, uh, you know, uh, Gail have been very outspoken about housing and uh, property taxes for for landlords, uh, and also for making sure that um, you know that uh, you know our our commercial tenants are also taken care of, et cetera. So I wanted to hope that you guys are able to stay, um, and I wanted to thank um, uh, Nora as well for being able to speak on our Norks and and Norks and our neighborhood houses. So thank you so much, Nora, for joining us as well. Uh, and uh, you know we wanted to kind of go through a little bit of some of the highlights um, uh, and that are district specific points uh, for folks. So some of the district specific points is that Governor Cuomo introduced a 90 day moratorium on evictions, not on rent, on evictions. So um, so even this morning, somebody called me and asked like, oh, so, you know, for rents, like we're, we, we're not, we're, we don't have to pay, right? There's a pause, right? And I was like, no, no, there is no pause on rent. And, um, and it's for commercial, no, no pause on commercial, no pause on residential. There's just a 90 day moratorium on evictions. Um, and so uh, we wanted to, you know, make sure that people knew that. Um, we, I introduced a series of bills that will uh, forgive rent for those who are significantly impacted by COVID-19 um, and led a budget letter with fellow members to allocate additional funding to NYCHA and ask Chair Russ to provide proper PPE to um, all NYCHA staff and uh, residents. And so we wanted to make sure that uh, 
you know, those things are obviously um, some of our biggest uh, issues and we wanted to make sure that people could get the numbers for those bills and to read them as well. Um, so my staff will be putting that into the chat. Our uh, NYCHA budget letter for this year's budget, we requested $2 billion for the fiscal year 2021 to be used for emergency capital improvements. I also request an additional $1 billion for public housing outside of New York City. Um, we were very, very close in getting these funds. Ellen, you can talk a little bit about that. Um, and then um, unfortunately we did not get that funding. Um, our settlement house program budget letter, our settlement house programs were not included in the ex executive budget for fiscal year 2020 and 2021. And we are requesting, uh, we were requesting $5 million of funding for 48 settlement houses across the state. Um, and this is something that, you know, Nora can speak to a little bit as well. Our NORCs and NORCs budget letter, we, uh, we are currently 43, there, well, so sorry, in our state, there are currently 43 naturally occurring retirement communities and neighborhood naturally occurring retirement communities contracted through the New York State um, Office of the Aging, which is NYSOPA, and we're asking to maintain the $8.055 million allotment for NNORCs and NORCs, as well as an additional $1 million in funding. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get the additional, but we did get to keep what we had uh, already gotten in past previous years. Um, as you know, I've been fighting for NORC since uh, I joined the assembly and we were actually able uh, two years ago to double um, the amount that NORCs and NORCs were uh, getting funded for in our budget. And we have slowly added to that little by little, but we have not yet um, achieved what we needed to, to be able to grow an even more robust network and um, system for our seniors. Um, so I just wanted to throw it to our panelists. Um, each of you, please um, take the time time to introduce yourselves just a little bit, but also um, talk a little bit about some of the things that have gone on in our budget that, uh, that our district should know about. So I wanted to start with Ellen Davidson. Hi, uh, thanks. I love, I love your town halls. I just want to say I, I, I feel very uh, privileged to be invited. Uh, so thank you. Um, so uh, it is really hard to get housing money in the budget. Um, uh, and I want to say that in sort of thinking forward, because um, I hear a lot about uh, like hopes that we're going to get money for state uh, states and localities from the federal government that will come into our state. Um, I have fears that if the money isn't directed to housing, um, it will go to other important things like schools and healthcare. Um, and so uh, I just want to have people thinking about the fact that in order to ensure uh, that we get housing money, it has to be strictly targeted to housing money. But the two things that we at Legal Aid were fighting for most in the budget for housing were uh, money for public housing. Um, and uh, we've been doing this for a long time. And this was as close as we got. Um, it really looked like, um, as we are watching other of our priorities fall off the table, um, for the first time, it looked like we were going to get a, not only money in the budget, but also uh, a, a plan for a five-year plan so there would be money in the budget for the next five years, which is incredibly important. Um, and then COVID-19 hit, um, and it was gone. Um, the second uh, thing that we were fighting strongly for in the budget that also disappeared uh, was money for homeless New Yorkers, uh, money that would uh, allow homeless New Yorkers to have a path to permanent housing. Um, I think it's very, very clear uh, more than ever that housing is healthcare. Um, and that, um, you know, I, the, there's been a lot in the news about canceling rent and rent strikes, which is really important. Um, how, I'm, we're part of Housing Justice for All, as is CAV. If you look at our agenda, it is, it is more than just talking about renters. We talk um, and we speak about the issues of homeless New Yorkers uh, an awful lot and our agenda. Uh, some of this has gotten, I think, hidden by uh, people being excited about rent strikes, about how important it is for us to figure out through this crisis, how we get to a place where first of all, homeless people are out of the congregate shelters where they're getting sick and dying um, into hotels and having FEMA pay for them, but also having um, the ability for uh, homeless New Yorkers to get vouchers, which would allow them to move into permanent housing. 
Um, and then the last thing I'll say before I move on is, um, I, because this is important for your district, is that there's also a federal moratorium that is slightly different for people who live in public housing, people who live in project-based section eight, and people who have vouchers. First of all, if you live in any of that type of housing and you've lost income, please go and get your rent uh, readjusted immediately. Um, uh, I, I can't promise you the systems are set up, project-based section eight, um, there are a lot of rules about how people should be able to get their interim adjustments done immediately. There, the federal moratorium for those types of buildings is actually a month more. It's to, into the middle of July and nobody can be uh, brought to court for rent that was owed during this period without an additional 30 day notice. And the third thing I want to say, which I think um, the federal government did well, which is unusual for me to say, is that if you're getting the pandemic um, unemployment, which is the extra federal money, and you need an interim recertification, that money, that $600 a week will be blind. They will not consider it when setting your rent because it's a temporary, it's only temporary. Um, so please, please uh, go and get your rents readjusted um, and, and don't worry on June 20th, if the governor lifts the moratorium, you should be looking to the feds that are a little bit more protective of you. Okay, and I wanted to bring up uh, Rocky next. Thank you. Can you hear me? Great. <clears throat> well, thank you again, Yulene, and I, I know this is a long session, but I wanna thank all the elected officials also. Um, we happen to be also celebrating the Asian Pacific Heritage Month, so I want to, uh, <laughs> it's a very, very difficult time, but I did want to say that um, although I'm wearing the senior hat today, uh, I also am a member of the Human Rights Commission, and as Julene said, there's been a really disturbing uh, documentation of increase of anti-Asian violence, and so I don't want to get into this in my particular presentation, but I want people to know that the Human Rights Commission and a lot of partners in the community are tracking this. It's really important to document it, even if you think it's minor, even if you don't, you know, even if it's not so-called legally uh, a hate crime or even a biased harassment as per the human rights laws. Uh, and elected officials can do a lot to help spread that word. Uh, if we, it's kind of like COVID-19. If you don't track it, you don't, you know, you don't really know what the extent of it. And we're seeing this all over the country. So my concern is as we go into a <clears throat> difficult time, a lot of people are very angry. There's a lot of finger pointing and scapegoating and so forth. So this is where people start to fall into, at least uh, some people fall into bigotry and scapegoating. So um, uh, I I'm, I'm, wanted to share, share a few things in terms of ARP. <clears throat> I think the main thing that I really like about your town hall and about also some of the work that Educational Alliance and other uh, settlement houses do, is that you really focus on organizing the community. And this is really important in this time when we're all in this kind of digital world because we feel kind of disconnected. But this is such a critical time because a lot of things can happen with the budget. As you already mentioned, the budget is not fixed and the governor has this tremendous power. And we could really have some really disastrous things. Um, but the budget is also tied to the federal government. And uh, I'm not gonna go into that depth, but ARP is very concerned about the federal budget um, because it's gonna impact the state. And one of those programs is the SNAP program. Um, one of the things that we found is that the, uh, there are a lot of people have SNAP in the most recent uh, stimulus has increased funding, but there are people who've maxed out already and they're not gonna get anything. And they're really the most vulnerable and many of them have 50 plus in their households. So let's just uh, make sure we continue to, to track a lot of this stuff. Um, I wanted to just point out that we have had um, disturbing, Gail mentioned this, uh, uh, the borough president, uh, disturbing deaths in, in nursing homes. There's been 11,000, over 11,000 deaths in, uh, nationally, but New York State has 2,690 deaths in nursing homes. And in Cobble Hill Health Center alone, there's been 55 deaths. It's about 15% of their entire beds. Um, and we're just finding more and more. So a lot of this has not been reported, 
The governor had issued an executive order fairly recently, but even before that, ARP was really encouraging our members and our friends to ask questions to the governor also, but also to the to these health centers. And I'm gonna go through these questions very briefly, but you can find them on the ARP website. They're very common sense, but that I, I wanna just encourage people to, to um, use the phone, or use the email or whatever, during this time, there's a tendency just to kind of like veg out, you know, during this time. But, but we need to really um, make our um, nursing home officials and the oversight officials accountable. So the first question is, has anyone in the nursing home tested positive? Okay, Governor Cuomo has this executive order, but it may not be really followed. You know, you need to know the staff, have they tested positive? Have any of the people who are living in these nursing homes? Remember, they're people who go in and out of the nursing homes. They may be plumbers or they may be people who work in the kitchens. Are they being tested? And you can't just be tested once. You have to be tested every time, you know? So this is the problem right now we have with testing. There, and, and also the antibodies, as, as, as you have said, uh, assembly member. It's not perfect right now. And so we really don't know to what extent, what's causing this high rate. We know there's a lot of congregation that people live in in these nursing homes. They're elderly, they have a lot of risk factors, but until we really have a better sense of testing and protocols and so forth, we really, we really haven't gotten on top of this issue. Uh, the second is, what is the nursing home doing? That's pretty obvious. You should really demand answers. You know, don't get all this wishy-washy stuff. And by, by the way, you know, when we ask these questions and you get these answers, write it up, and send it to your elected officials, send it to Governor Cuomo. We wanna really know that. Um, we have uh, in ARP joined with 1199, which has a lot of healthcare workers and also the NAACP, the Urban uh, New York Urban League, uh, the Hispanic Federation and the Asian American Federation in a call that the governor has to put together a task force to look at these long-term care. You can't just kind of like, you know, deal with all these other task force and not deal with this particular one. And so that's something that um, ARP is trying to push forward. It's, it's not a budget issue per se, but it, you know, everything's a budget issue in some ways. It's a priority issue. Um, we also feel that a lot of the staff do, do not get the equipment they need. And you've heard this already, so I'm not gonna go over it, but you know, these are the people who are dealing day to day with, and they may be nurses, they may be just uh, caregivers. Uh, they may be just people working in the, in the food service, in the nursing homes, but they need to be getting all that care. And if you've seen any of the, of the video coming out of, let's say, some of these other countries where people are all you know, dressed up, we don't have that kind of protection still. And I'm glad we're starting to get some of that here in New York City, but and, you know, it's, it's coming kind of late. Um, so the other question, number four, is what is the nursing home doing in terms of keeping people connected to their families? Are you getting the right information? Are you um, being told, you know, like uh, if something happens, what's happening in, in real time? Um, families are very concerned. They're stressed out over what's happening. I'm gonna add a little bit here since I'm in this district and Yulene, you know, are they getting the food they want? You know, a lot of the food that we're getting now is great, but you know, it's not necessarily culturally, you know, uh, specific and and I'm not saying you have to have rice for every, everybody but you know I, I remember after 9-11 we got a lot of junk food and stuff like that and you know we really didn't need it so I think the that, that's very important when we're telling, dealing with these nursing homes uh, and there should be a plan from the nursing home as to how they're going to communicate important information on a regular basis um, and finally are they currently staffed up you know, if they have somebody who's lost either because to coronavirus or even just regularly sick or whatever, we need to know that. You have, you have these nursing homes that may have like, you know, 10 staff and then all of a sudden they have two staff and they haven't even know, told anybody. And we've seen the results of that. Um, the, the last thing I'm gonna just mention is that, um, you know, in terms of, of, of Kind of advocacy. I guess this is this is one of the concerns that we have. Um, we need to be organized on state, local, and national levels together. I'm really happy the way that you're trying to pull together the 
the city council and the state. And, and, and so ARP is doing some fairly heavy lobbying right now with the Congress um, as well, nationally. Uh, but I think we realize that we are in a moment in this country where we could really go one way or the other. Uh, on the one hand, we're realizing that all the things that we were, that you and other people on this call have mentioned that we, we need, you know, infrastructure for housing and, and programs for low income people and all that, all that's becoming kind of homeless, right? We know that these are problems, but they've just been exacerbated by this crisis. And we have the opportunity, obviously, to say, hey, we get to step back and, and not let this crisis uh, result in just making these matters worse, which could happen. Um, but maybe we can, can really jump up and say, we need a kind of different system. We need a different, you know, a different economy. Uh, that isn't a guarantee at all. And so I want to just end with this, con this, this thought. Uh, just as the bias stuff is a concern for a lot of people, especially Asian Americans, so is the fact that black and brown, and I think other peoples of color, are dying at a very high rate. And that is so shocking. And we need to look at that as a racial disparity. So ARP has been working on, recently on racial disparities in terms of the 50 plus. So I want to thank you again. I can answer questions of specifics, but the budget is so critical because you aren't physically there. You're not even in you know, his room. The governor is, can do a lot of kind of things. And same with ARP. We're trying to figure out how do, we, how do we impact this process. Thank you. Thank you, Rocky. You touched on so many important things. I just wanted to um, kind of uh, just really quickly respond to one of the things that you said about the food and the nutrition. I think that you know we saw a lot of the boxes that were given out that was very, very, um, uh, I felt like not nutritionally uh, proficient, um, you know, and especially for seniors. Uh, I mean, if you're giving them a box of cookies, milk and applesauce, I mean, if you have diabetes, that could be a very big issue. And I think that, you know, we have to be very careful and cognizant about what um, is in those uh, meal packages. Uh, it's not, I mean, this is why, you know, um, one of the things that I was doing just for mutual aid was I worked uh, with 46 Mott Street to get um, Chinese food, healthy Chinese food that was hot for a lot of the seniors to get. Um, we were, we, we called through the district to deliver, et cetera. And I just wanted to thank, thank Gail for, again, for Fresh Direct um, services to some folks who can't get it. Um, and, you know, it, it, the nutrition uh, portion is so important. So thank you so much for touching on that piece. As well. Right. And there, and there are. Food, and culturally appropriate food. There are a lot of great. Um, leaders in our community that are doing a lot of work with the small businesses, the restaurants, you know, in terms of providing. So that's just wonderful. Thank you, Rocky. Um, and, you know, one of the other things I wanted to mention was also, um, you know, there has been a lot of uh, discussion about the senior uh, center and the um, nursing home issues. Um, so uh, thank you so much for bringing that up as well. Uh, and I, next I'm gonna, I'm, I'm kind of switching between social services and housing a little bit. And next I'm gonna bring up um, Melanie uh, from uh, CAB. Hi, hello everybody. Um, I wanna thank all the folks participating in the panel and our elected officials and especially you, you lean for just your like, amazing moral clarity in this moment and particularly your ability to communicate with that that with the public i really appreciate um you know the way that you voted on the budget and how loud and clear you've been about the ways in which this pandemic is really compounding the systemic disparities we have um in the district and then also of course in new york city and the country as a whole um and my name is melanie i'm a tenant organizer at cav we at CAV organized tenants in public and in rent stabilized housing, public housing primarily in Queensbridge houses, which is outside the district, of course, but the largest nitrogen development, um, uh, in, in, the largest nitrogen development, full stop. So a lot of shared um, concerns with the district. And then um, in the district in Chinatown, uh, where I mostly work, we, we organize rent stabilized Chinatown tenants, um, uh, immigrant folks, working class folks, almost entirely people who um, do not speak English as the first language and um, I think really represent so much of what makes Chinatown Chinatown. Um, and as many folks have spoken to, um, it has been, it's been a really difficult time um, for the neighborhood as it has been for the whole city. But you know, um, 
for our neighborhood in really specific ways. Um, we are also, um, as Ellen mentioned, we're part of Housing Justice for All, which is the statewide coalition um, organizing tenants across the state, uh, uh, both to um, demand rent cancellations, to demand mortgage relief um, for homeowners and small landlords, um, and then also to demand housing solutions for the homeless that really address, again, the systemic issues, right? Um, and um, uh, speak to some of what uh, Samir Kavanaugh brought up in terms of like um, transmission congregate settings and so forth. Um, we did on May 1st, tenants at 81 Bowery launched a rent strike. Um, and I just wanna see if I can, oh, have I done it? I've done it. I wanted to share the photo. Wow, this is the first time I've done this. Um, uh, we did a banner drop alongside many other tenants um, across the city and state. On the, on the right, we have rent strike and then the, I don't know which way is right left, but in Chinese it says Chu uh, Xiao Zujing, which means um, uh, cancel rent. And one thing that we're really proud of is that this image um, and reporting about the rent strike is um, on on the front page of the World Journal and Sing Tao this weekend. Um, outlets that um, you know may not be known to the broader community, but which are widely read amongst the Chinese immigrant community. Um, and uh, I think you know, one of the first things I want to talk about, both specific to Chinatown, um, and then also thinking um, more broadly about Asian immigrants in the city and immigrant communities in general, is how much language access um, and, and uh, uh, issues like class um, and education and documentation are again like compounding the effects of this crisis, right? So what we're seeing on the ground, working with tenants in Chinatown, so many folks um, don't speak English that their primary news sources are Chinese language social media like WeChat, um, Chinese language papers like Tsingtao and the World Journal, uh, which I will, will note do a great job of covering the city, but you know, obviously there's much less coverage than there is for your average English speaker reading the press or social media. Um, and, and then, you know, and they get information through their social networks, um, through social service providers in the neighborhood, um, like uh, like CPC, right? And so we're seeing that there's a profound disparity, I think, between um, what English language speakers are able to access in terms of public health information um, and uh, uh, social services information and so forth, um, uh, and then what Chinese language speakers are able to access. And I mentioned in the chat a little bit earlier um, one thing that is coming up constantly when I'm doing mutual aid calls, check-in calls um, with Chinatown tenants is folks saying, oh, the 90 day, 90 day thing, that's rent suspension, right? We don't have to pay rent and we'll be fine. And having to clarify that an eviction moratorium is not the same thing as a rent suspension. And they could, you know, their landlord could be bringing them to, to, to court on day one after the, um, after the moratorium ends. I really, I cannot make sense of Governor Cuomo's um, repeated insistence in press conferences that uh, eviction moratorium until June is all that tenants need. It's as if he doesn't think the month of July will exist um, <laughs> or that we're all just gonna fall off a cliff at that point. Um, but uh, the fact is a lot of folks in the neighborhood, a lot of folks that I'm talking to um, because of insufficient language access and also just like confusion about the issue in general, um, think that the eviction moratorium um, is a rent suspension and it's really not and they're not paying rent because they can't pay rent um, and we're really worried about what that means you know at the end of June and July as this moves forward um, then language also access is always also impacting things like um, obviously being able to apply for unemployment right folks don't have the tech they might normally um, get help from social services to do do those kinds of paperwork and things um, and having really limited access to what is already a difficult system to access right we're hearing lots of stories about folks perfectly um, capable with the online tech and filling out English language paperwork and so forth having so much trouble with unemployment um, and yeah so the language access issue um, class and education issues I see really impacting how folks are able to access resources um, in this particular moment. Um, our tenant base in Chinatown is primarily home care workers, restaurant workers, construction workers. These are folks who are really, really hard hit by the economic impacts um, of um, 
yeah, of, of the crisis. Um, and then the folks in our base who are not those kind of types of workers are generally retired, right? And they have their own concerns um, about, about age and health and being able to stay home. Um, Chinatown is a very densely populated neighborhood. There's a lot of overcrowded and subdivided apartments for economic necessity. Um, and um, not all of those setups are legal. And it means that we have folks squeezed into really tight spaces. Um, uh, so I think the, there just a tremendous amount of fear um, amongst folks. Uh, the other thing I wanna say, um, also what we're seeing, you know, it's been referenced a lot, the um, rise in anti-Asian sentiment um, and the kind of fear and tension that's creating in the neighborhood. Um, it's definitely, it is a concern. It is every single member meeting I have held since January, we have talked about this, every single one, right? <laughs> and we do like at least two a week. Um, every single one, it is on everyone's minds. Um, uh, and I want to I want to highlight to you it's it's not just you know focused on the Chinese community. I think the unfortunate thing is that um, because of just like sheer ignorance, whether um, uh, whether malintentioned or not, you know, a lot of other Asian communities will also be targeted um, because of anti what is specifically anti Chinese sentiment gets mapped onto all sorts of East Asian communities, all sorts of South Asian communities, right? Um, and then they face the, the, the dual, you know, violence of being targeted um, for hate violence and then also being erased in their actual identities and histories and backgrounds. Um, but then I think I'm also, like, we're also hearing a lot how in other countries and other areas, like, you know, it's not anti-Chinese sentiment, it's like anti-Muslim sentiment, you know, um, being used as a, um, scapegoat for the crisis in India and so forth, like, I think whenever we see this type of stress in societies, right, it becomes a youth, it becomes a tool um, for those who are invested um, in hate and also in structural discrimination to, you know, kind of wedge that gap even larger, right? Um, so I think it's a, we see it as a huge issue in the Chinatown community and the larger Chinese immigrant community, but I think it's also really important um, for the Chinese community to stand in solidarity um, with other targeted communities, um, with, with um, the black and brown populations, with the South Asian populations who are being really strongly hit by COVID um, from a health and kind of like structural, um, uh, structural vulnerabilities perspective, right? Because um, if we kind of zoom out from this moment, we know how much this is part of a bigger picture. But then, okay, bringing myself back, what I wanted to say um, about anti-Asian sentiment in the neighborhood is that, again, from like January, February, this is something we were talking about on a daily basis um, with tenant members. And a lot of folks, uh, a lot of cab members stopped working in January or February, right? Either because their restaurants closed down, because there wasn't enough business, um, because they were scared, because they're, you know, hyper folk, they get a lot of their information from mainland Chinese media and they were hyper aware of these threats long before the rest of the city was, or long before there was, you know, strong data-based reason to be concerned. Um, in early February, we strongly considered canceling one of our membership events, our, our annual Lunar New Year party, um, uh, because of coronavirus concerns. Um, and it was, you know, just a really scary time. So um, echoing what Yulina said, like, um, the Asian communities and the Chinese community, you know, folks stopped working earlier, um, folks started practicing social distancing earlier, and all of that has had cumulative health and um, economic impacts. Um, and also, I know a lot of folks who are afraid to go to work, not for health reasons, but because they're afraid to get attacked on the street. Um, earlier this month, I had a long conversation with a member who, um, whose daughter stopped, they, they have no income, not because you know, she has no work, but because her daughter was assaulted um, in the subway station on the way to work, um, this would have been like you know mid to late March, um, and uh, and then she decided to stop going to work because she was scared for her personal safety, right? From a, a violence perspective, not from a health perspective. This is a, a relatively young woman, um, so um, these are the types of concerns that we're hearing about from members. Um, Finally, I want to speak specifically to the housing and, and tenant issues that we work on um, and also um, 
uh, about Eileen's uh, three bills in the legislature, which we are deeply supportive of, and we really want to see um, uh, the, get passed or, or other kind of other initiatives um, are calling for similar things to get passed because it's, it is fundamentally clear that we need um, rent cancellation for New York tenants, right? Um, we need relief for small landlords, right? And the, as a tenant movement, we're supporting that. Um, I think that gets overlooked a lot and this gets framed as tenants against landlords. In fact, it's, it's really not. Um, it's really not the, the housing justice for all and the larger tenant movement um, is, is supporting relief for small landlords. Eileen's bills obviously um, set up measures to that end. Um, and, and it's not about tenants versus landlords, especially in a neighborhood like Chinatown where small landlords are so, um, uh, so much a part of the neighborhood's um, fabric and history. Um, what it is about is addressing the most dire concerns of those who are most deeply impacted among us, right? Poor and working class people are dying the most from COVID. We know that, right? Also, one thing we know about poor and working class people in New York is that rent is almost universally their highest expense, right? And it is honestly unconscionable for the city and the state and of course the federal government to leave um, poor, poor and working class people, to leave tenants, to solve, like to bear the burden of this rent crisis alone and to make those, have to make those decisions between rent and other necessities themselves, um, to be doing it alone without information, without language access, without a clear understanding of what's coming next for them, right? We have to work together um, as a community, as a society and a city to provide solutions, right? And that means doing something like rent cancellation and figuring out um, uh, more structural solutions to make sure that we can preserve and sustain housing and support the landlords who are doing that. Um, because the fact is, like, your average, you know, there is no one kind of tenant or, or landlord, but your average New York City landlord probably has a lot more resources to figure out how to apply for um, uh, relief and, you know, um, and, and talk their elected officials and so forth than your average tenant. So we need to really take advantage of the the structural um like organizations and setups that exist to be able to protect the most number of people um and that's why it's really really important to cancel rent and just um take that burden off of individual tenants and start looking at um broader solutions right um so um that's why that's why 81 bowery is on strike um the Tenants in that building leading the strike are extraordinarily brave, um, extraordinarily clear about the moral necessity of their actions. Um, and we look forward to continuing to organize in the neighborhood and especially to um, bringing vital information um, uh, to the Chinese community in the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. <laughs> That was so good. And talking about language access is so important. And, you know, Rocky touched on it, you touched on it. But, um, you know, we know that our black and brown communities are hit the hardest right now because our black and brown communities are also our essential workers. <laughs> and um, our Asian American communities are our essential workers. And our, you know, communities of color are the ones who are taking the most risks at this time to make sure to keep everybody else safe. And this is why we are seeing such um, harsh numbers when it comes to um, the percentage of uh, folks who are passing away or um, who, are, who have gotten um, sick and um, have had the hardest time recovering as well because of resources. And so I wanted to thank both of you for mentioning that and also for um, helping us to really get to um, some of the places we needed to be conversationally. Um, I wanted to bring up Colin Cohn, who's been um, incredible, not just advocate, but also organizer on the ground for a lot of these um, different issues. Carlin, are you still there? Yes, I am. And I'm sorry, I'm having a video failure, but that means that none of you need to experience my wild quarantine hair. So, you know, we'll take the, the bright side of it. Um, so I'm Carlin Cohen, uh, pronouns they, them, or she, her, and I'm with the Chinese American Planning Council, CPC. Uh, we are a social services agency doing um, a wide variety of social services across uh, all five boroughs, but rooted in uh, Chinatown, as well as Flushing and Sunset Park. 
we also do policy and advocacy. So I uh, was really thrilled to join at Eulene's initial budget town hall at the beginning of the session because a lot of the things that we were fighting for were, um, you know, exactly what is being spoken about at this town hall today. So we were fighting. We we're also um, a supporter of the Housing Justice for All Coalition. So uh, fighting for good cause eviction, universal rent control, um, more affordable and supportive housing, and then of course housing all of our homeless community members. We are fighting for increased funding for social services, including senior services, uh, senior affordable housing, and other key critical social services that support uh, people of color, immigrants, low-income community members. And then of course we are also fighting for better health care access, particularly for immigrants, especially since the public charge rule went through on February 24th. We know that it's now more urgent than ever um, to have universal guaranteed coverage for all New Yorkers. Um, and we see that now during COVID-19 more than ever. And then lastly, of course, um, fighting for budget justice. So the assembly member, um, as well as a lot of the other elected officials on the call spoke about the importance of of taxing the rich, the ultra wealthy and corporations who are doing fine right now um, and actually raising money for all of the services that we need uh, so that we don't actually have to cut services to the communities that are being hardest hit by COVID right now. And you know, the reason that I talk about what we were fighting for in the beginning is that I think it's really important to note that what we're seeing right now during COVID-19 is no different than the problems that we were seeing before. It's just very much amplified, right? So we already had community members that didn't have access to secure, secure housing. We already had community members that didn't have, um, as seniors, didn't have food security, didn't have access to the resources they needed. We had community members that couldn't access um, all the services that they needed. And that was already a problem that we were fighting for going into this budget season. And so now what we are seeing is that all of those systems of oppression that already existed, were already alive and well, are really just functioning through COVID-19. And something that Eulene says that I think is really important to, to amplify now is like, it's not that the systems are broken, it's that they're working exactly the way they were supposed to. So of course, we're seeing that um, Black and Latinx and people of color are being more impacted by COVID than um, white and wealthy folks. Of course, we're seeing that the people that are essential workers at the front lines of this without protection, without adequate pay, are, um, you know, people of color, immigrants, low-income folks. And of course, we see that the people that are struggling to pay rent, to access food right now, to access services right now, are those communities as well. So we're just really seeing an amplification of everything that was already an issue going into this budget session. And that's why we see it as more urgent than, than ever that as we go into you know, the April 30th budget cuts and then going forth um, through the legislative session um, that we keep fighting for uh, raising revenues, that we keep fighting for canceling rent, that we keep fighting for increasing services. And I'm really grateful to Assembly member you, as well as the the other um, state electeds that are on the call today for fighting for all of those things. Um, I wanted to share some of the things that we've really been seeing on the ground, particularly around housing and senior services. If I if I shared everything, we'd be here all day, um, and I won't do that to you. But since we uh, went on lockdown, CPC all social services are designated as essential, so they're still continuing. Um, but the ones that we've been able to convert to remote, we have, obviously you can't make meal delivery remote, you can't make home care remote, but we can do things like citizenship classes, adult literacy and language classes, benefits enrollment, housing support remote. Um, and we have been doing daily wellness checks with our community members um, to make sure that everybody has somebody that's checking up on them, attending to their needs, we can support them getting medications, prescriptions, um, navigate the unemployment system, whatever it might be. And just a few of the things we've seen, um, I know that the borough president already spoke about the senior meal services, um, which are definitely beginning to improve, but we're seeing food insecurity just on a huge rise among seniors. 
and the city really, you know, initially struggled to convert the food program, but has been working very hard at it, obviously. But as, as Eulene mentioned, we've had seniors that are either not getting food and we're having to supplement um, through donations and work like um, what Patrick is doing at Mott 46 and like CPC and other organizations getting donations and bringing them out. We've also seen seniors that didn't need food supports before needing food supports now, um, which just speaks to the growing rise across the board in food insecurity. And then a lot of seniors are having difficulty getting prescriptions because the drugstores that they were used to using have closed or they're scared to go outside either because they're scared of COVID-19 or they're scared of the anti-Asian discrimination that they might experience. Um, and then of course, mental health is a huge issue, not just for seniors, but obviously across the board, anybody that's facing this and the trauma that particularly the communities of color that are bearing the brunt of this is, is really significant. And I think it's important that we talk about that. Um, senior isolation has always been an issue and a concern, but even more so now um, than, than it was before. We have also in our wellness checks found that housing insecurity, which was again already a problem before, has become rampant. Um, over 50% of our community members in the wellness checks reported that they had either lost income, lost jobs, or were otherwise experiencing financial insecurity to the point that they didn't know how they were gonna support their families in the coming months. Just as an example, one of our preschool classes um, has 24 children, which means that we support 24 families, right? Because it's always wrap around, you work with the entire families, not just the child. 20 out of those 24 families lost jobs or income within a two week span of time. And less than half of those families are going to be able to be eligible for any sort of federal assistance for state unemployment insurance or anything like that. So they're being fully left out of all of the relief packages, which means that you know these families with small children are not sure how they are going to make rent. Um, Melanie talked about the, the lack of information and language access, and this really compounds in this scenario because we do have families that might think that the rent moratorium is actually means that they don't have to pay rent and might be misinformed. At the same time, we have families that don't know that there is an eviction moratorium right now and that you know, they do have rights as tenants. So something that we've been working to do is certainly know your rights um, around this and all of the other issues. And, and CAB has also been doing an amazing job at that work. Um, but the language access also cuts across everything from accessing benefits during this time to um, just proper information around like what best practices are around social distancing, access to testing and treatment, and all of those other issues. Um, and then another thing that I think is really important and urgent and cuts across these issues is that because public charge went into effect, and obviously there have been some federal exemptions around public charge because of COVID-19, but a lot of community members don't actually know their rights around public charge and they have they've been fearing that when they access housing, if they're seniors and they try to access services like SNAP, um, and even in the cases that they're trying to access testing and treatment, we've actually seen that they have um, been scared to do so because of public charge. And so that's adding another layer um, of uh, another barrier for our immigrant community members. Uh, so, I mean, all in all, like I said, I think that we're really just beginning to see all of these systems amplifying, all of these systems that you know have already existed just becoming much, much more clear and you know, thank you to, to all of the other panelists for speaking. Thank you so much, Assembly Member, for continuing to fight for us. And, and we're really excited to keep fighting with you. Thank you so much, Carlin. You raised like all of the points, and I love it. Um, I just wanted to also um, uh, welcome Nora Moran. Um, she is uh, with um, our amazing settlement houses and neighborhood uh, houses. Sure. Hi. Um, I'll keep it brief because lots of folks have already said all the things that I would say. So I'm really grateful um, to all the other panelists and to Assemblywoman New for hosting. Um, I always learn a lot in these town halls. So it's really, it's really fun and informative. Um, and I'm just happy to be here. Um, you know, I, I think broadly on the budget, 
Um, it certainly was a really difficult budget. Um, lots of us were hopeful for things uh, that were not funded at the end of the day. Um, you know, we, we've known for many years that our safety net in New York is funded very thinly. Um, and I think the fact that, uh, you know, we now have a, a major public health crisis is, is really um, showing just how, um, you know, underfunded some of our, our human services and other systems are. Um, on the senior services front, um, you know, we're certainly so grateful that uh, funding for the NORC program was restored. Um, you know, I think uh, you're exactly right that this, these services are preventive and the fact that we've been able to invest and expand in them over the past couple of years has given us a little bit more of a, an infrastructure now in place to respond to uh, COVID-19. You know, we've heard from so many of the NORCs that their nurses are busier than ever, um, you know, educating people, making phone calls, helping them understand how they can get their prescriptions, um, just helping them understand what is COVID-19. How do they keep themselves safe? Um, and I think you know it's certainly a very um, interesting model to look at. As in the future, I think we're as a city and state going to have to really rethink um, our public health infrastructure and just how we respond to public health and how can we embed nurses and community health workers and others into um, programs where you know maybe they didn't have a health focus before. Um, I think it's just it'll be a model I think that that we'll have to look to more seriously in the future. Um, we're also really grateful that there was funding for the settlement house program in the budget. Um, you know, the settlement houses in District 65 and across the state um, have been doing incredible essential work to respond uh, in the past couple of weeks. Carlin, you know, talked a lot about the work that CPC is doing, you know, organizations like CPC, the other settlement houses are, are feeding people, are trying to organize private donations, are speaking out when, you know, city and state systems have failed, um, particularly around, around hunger and around getting people food. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's just, she gave a, a small taste of the work that's happening on the ground. Um, you know, I, I think just looking forward, I think that's super concerning for us is the fact that um, the governor does have new powers now in the budget to readjust every couple months. Um, and we already saw a uh, reduction of $10 billion at the end of April from, from when the budget was passed in early April. And so we know now um, we have to be really vigilant over the next couple months. Our advocacy and our organizing has to continue because um, this isn't like previous years where the budget's passed and we're kind of done and can go home until next year, but we need to really um, stay focused on sort of what's coming out of Albany and, and spending moving forward. Um, and also just want to say on the point of organizing, um, uh, the census is live and, you know, it's really important for folks to be filling that out, um, particularly, you know, if we're, if we're thinking about ways to organize and to connect as communities, um, you know, filling out the census is so essential for older adults who are, are often an undercounted population, um, but for everybody. Um, we're, we're at lower uh, than we should be in New York City right now at our self-response rate. Um, so we're, you know, just putting that plug out there. I feel like I say it everywhere I go, um, but it takes 10 minutes. It's super easy and uh, helps define our next 10 years. So I'll stop there. Amazing, amazing. Um, now I want to um, ask a question. I know that uh, Brian is still here. Brian, what did he leave? He wanted to talk about it too, but um, Section 8. Um, anyways, um, let me just ask this question. I know Ellen had answered a little bit, but this is Cheryl from 10 Stanton Street. My question is, what kind of help is there for people who live in privately owned Section 8 buildings and the owners are still getting the federal help to offset the course of living while the tenants are struggling to pay rent and feel that nobody cares about them because of living in a privately owned building? Well, as I mentioned before, that is part of the Federal CARES Act that was passed on March 27th. There was specific relief. Oh, I think she froze. Oh, there she is. I, you froze a little bit. Yeah, you froze a little bit. All right. Um, so uh, first, uh, people have the right to have um, their rent adjusted. Um, and because and HUD has put out guidance saying that people can self-certify of loss of income if they can't get actual documentation. Second, um, there's a different moratorium. It's longer. It's better. Uh, for people who live in project-based Section 8, it goes until July. Um, and it, it uh, uh, 
and it I think includes people not having to pay late fees um, because they weren't able to pay. Um, and then uh, third, um, if you have lost your work and if you um, get unemployment for that, the pandemic pandemic unemployment, the six, extra $600 a week from the federal government will not be considered in calculating your rent um, for, uh, for, because it's a temporary uh, income. Um, and so when they do the interim recertifications, um, they won't count that, which would be helpful. Amazing. Um, and I just wanted to uh, take a quick uh, read of a comment from Trevor Holland. Thanks to all who volunteered and provide resources for some of the Section 8 and affordable buildings in the Lower East Side. We would really like to see a coordinated effort to support these same buildings who are not getting PPE supplies or regular food deliveries. We will certainly take gallons of hand sanitizer as it is at that point. Um, and we will try So, So the gallons are very unwieldy and we will try to do our best to get some to everyone. But um, as of now, it's been uh, it's it's kind of interesting because the state didn't even ship them to um, us yet, and so they called us to let us know that some is coming, but I don't even know when it will. And um, and you know, it they also told uh, us just yesterday the city called me to say that they had 500 cloth masks to give out for us. I was like, that is like a package of this big and way more than I've already given. Uh, like way less than I've given to already every every single organization that's out there that I uh, can help to procure masks for. So I'm I'm a little bit uh, startled by the lack of um, consideration for a lot of things. But I wanted to say, uh, Trevor, I got you, and I will make sure you know to uh, talk to you after this to make sure that we get more supplies to the folks that um, are in the same situation as all of us. Um, let me uh, just ask another question that had been uh, brought up to us was. Um, basically, how uh, will the state ensure that low-income senior citizens will be able to maintain a good standard of living throughout this time? Because uh, people are, um, some, the, the, the writer was very shocked by the food options that were given. I guess, Rocky, I guess we can pinpoint that one towards you. Well, it's a very good question. And <clears throat> I think in general, the, the concern right now is the low income uh, residents and, 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 you know, not just the seniors, but, but I think the, the, the question really gets back to the budget, I think. Uh, we have a certain amount of safety net uh, that we're realizing is not that strong. And the SNAP program is just one program uh, Somebody else mentioned housing is another problem. You know, if people, um, I think people have to realize that I think before this crisis, uh, there was some figure that uh, the average American had only a couple hundred dollars like in their savings. Uh, and that if there was a crisis, uh, they would use that up and they would basically have nothing. So that's shocking. And so I guess my short answer is, is we, 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 we need to think about obviously the seniors, but this is just the tip of the iceberg problem. We just have a maldistribution of income in this country. And, and uh, the fact that the governor has uh, kind of uh, the power right now, uh, I don't think he has the power totally. We need to make sure that we all weigh in. But I think the issue is that we need to, um, we, we need to uh, insert a very big narrative that the maldistribution of income is a problem that needs to be addressed. And that can't be done by just uh, the governor on his own, as much as he's been very good on some other issues. Uh, I don't have a specific answer. I know that ARP um, does encourage people to get involved and that if you are a member, uh, it's very easy to get involved. If you aren't a member, it's very easy to also get involved. Um, what that means, a lot of people don't realize that ARP is a big lobbying force. We have 2,000 members in New York City. We have 2 million, the state and uh, ARP is lobbying with other groups. And so we're trying to join with uh, <clears throat> 1199 and some of the, group, some of the you know, workers who are affected in this effort to lobby uh, Albany as well as City Hall. But, but uh, the, the key thing uh, really is the federal dollars right now. You know, New York State has to balance its budget. I mean, New York City has to balance its budget. Uh, and frankly, New York State um, has, doesn't have the ability to just print money, so to speak. Um, 
when it comes down to it, the, 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 the short answer, I think, and the long answer is the federal government really has the ability to rearrange the allocation of resources. And we can't do it without probably a different uh, income system. And, uh, and we don't have that right now. So, so uh, I'm sure we're going to come out of this in one way or the other, but it's not going to be like the, we can't go back to the old normal. Otherwise, we're going to have vast portions of our population uh, in poverty. Thank you so much, Rocky. That's so that's not a short answer. I'm sorry. No, no, it's, it, it's a very thorough one. And, and uh, <laughs> we, have, we have a lot of work to do is what it sounds like. So I just uh, wanted to say thank you again. And that's all uh, that I've gotten from the questions from folks. But I wanted to say thank you again. This panel was so thorough and um, so uh, amazing. And you know, I wanted to acknowledge that there are many, many bills right now um, that are out about um, social services and housing. Um, we are um, supportive of just making sure that people are getting help where we're at right now. I think that it is so important that we're discussing all of the different policy um, answers that have been suggested. I think that we need to, as a state, be able to go through and really kind of look at how our system is designed and really dismantle some of it and think about what we need to do to change um, how the um, how we failed here, I guess, is the, the for lack of better um, terminology, but like for, for how we failed. And I think that, you know, whether it's, uh, and we'll talk about it in the health and hospitals portion, for example, but um, whether or not our plans to uh, in the last 10 years to have shed hospital beds was the answer. I don't know. I, I personally think that it, if this uh, pandemic happened 10 years ago, before we shed a lot of the hospital beds, we would have been in a different situation. And I think that, you know, we need to kind of think ahead of, um, ahead of time and, and do some advanced planning. And um, more than anything, I think that, uh, like our panelists have said, um, you know, uh, you know, like our like our panelists have said, you know, we are able to, um, you know, uh, really recognize that that housing is healthcare and that our um, social service safety net is very very important. So wanted to say thank you. Um, also, I think that Felicia Gordon wanted to speak, so uh, she wanted to ask a question, and so she want she didn't want to type it, so I'm going to allow her to ask the question. Felicia, Felicia, are you there? Hello. Hey, Felicia. Hi, everyone. Happy Sunday. Yes, it's not, people are allowed to talk. It's just really about making sure that um, we keep things to a timely manner. We're about to switch. No, okay. Yeah, go I ahead. Get it. Ask your Don't question. be long winded, Felicia. I get no, no. it. Ask your question. Ask your question. <laughs> okay. Um, for those. Those of you that aren't aware, I am a NYCHA resident association president, mm -hmm. um, and the chair is actually texting me now. Um, and obviously, I have several concerns being a NYCHA resident. Several of you have brought up very pertinent concerns. Um, you, there's been a lot of message, a lot of uh, mentioning about the disparaging, disparaging, right, and and races and. Uh, the inequity as far as um, financial stability is concerned, right? Um, and there was a lot of mention about NYCHA. NYCHA is always frequently mentioned. Uh, I see Gail Brew is no longer here, but in the beginning of March, I reached out to Gail Brew along with some of my other um, elected officials uh, with my concerns uh, regarding NYCHA being an incubator for the lack, lack of a better word, for this virus. Um, I've had several meetings in regards to the funding. When I first called into this Zoom conference, you guys were talking about how the feds didn't allocate any funding for NYCHA, uh, federal funding for NYCHA, which is insane to me. Um, I just had a meeting on Thursday that the chair was involved in, as well as other people, where there was mentioned that there was a $70 billion ask that they haven't necessarily got a definitive yes to, but they're hoping to get a large portion of that ask. If that is uh, allocated to NYCHA, would that remedy some of the elected officials' concerns? Some of them. 
So the bill that you're referencing is the bill that Media Velasquez is, uh, is the sponsor of. And I believe that, you know, this is the, the, the funding is for public housing across the state. And I believe that if we did get that allocation, a large portion would come to New York. And that would be very, very, very helpful, of course, um, in, in billions of dollars that we would definitely need. Obviously, just for capital, okay, just for capital, but, um, repairs alone. Sorry, I'm going to mute you again because there's a little bit of noise. Okay, Felicia? Is that right? Uh-huh. Um, so um, just just from the, um, the capital needs alone, um, it is already, uh, you know, over almost $40 billion. It's almost $40 billion just for our state alone. So we just wanted to recognize that, you know, this is something that is very, very dire. And, um, you know, when, when there's um, mold, hot water, heat issues, lead paint, you know, these are all things that need to be, and, and asbestos, <laughs> Felicia's door, <laughs> Jesus. Um, but if there's, uh, it, you know, these different issues that are happening and it's making it so that, you know, folks are actually, you know, sick staying home, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's making it so that, you know, um, the, the, the funding for NYCHA um, has to come in um, or else, you know, we're, we're finding ourselves in an even more dire situation because right now, like we were just saying, housing is healthcare and we're making it so that people can't even stay in their own homes. So I'm gonna um, it, just unmute her really quickly again. Felicia, I hope that answers your question, but um, thank you for asking it. I think that it's really important that we do get that federal funding, um, but I also feel like our state needs to also be responsible and al allocate some funding and generate revenue to make sure that the residents of our state are protected. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Yes, that answered most of my question. I wholeheartedly agree with most of what you're saying, but I also believe that NYCHA misses out on a large stream of revenue opportunities. I mean, that's something that you and I spoke about privately. Um, that's something that should also be open up for a further conversation. And then there was also, and I just want to mention this really quick, quickly, a mention about um, COVID-19 testing on NYCHA sites. As a NYCHA leader and resident, I'm adamantly opposed against, uh, uh, against that because I think that is a lot of times when there are dangerous situations or things that could compromise our safety and our security, we are always the ones being volunteered. To have an, un, an unmentionable amount of potential COVID-19 carriers inundate our properties when there's no real um, guarantee how this virus is spread, if it's airborne, if it's 13 feet, if it's six feet, to have hundreds of people coming onto our developments that could possibly be contagious is a concern for me. That is not something that I would welcome in my development at all. All right, thank you, Felicia. Actually, um, I actually brought that up to uh just the other day when um, he was talking to us about uh, allocating sites to um, NYCHA developments. I actually did bring that up um, because I felt like that was a valid concern. I felt like, you know, we should be putting things in places where, you know, testing sites where there's not as many residential area um, and, and or that we um, actually take that into consideration that it doesn't have to be traveling far. Uh, you know, we want people to have access to it. I also think that that was something that, you know, was uh, of concern to me. Um, and Brian unmuted himself, so I think he has something to say, but then I'm gonna move to the next panel. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank, thank you for the opportunity to jump in. Just briefly, um, you know, I agree with everything that was just said. We need, uh, as we've been fighting for a long time for a huge infusion of capital funding. Um, and, and as Yulene noted, a lot of us joined, uh, you know, Congress member uh, Velasquez uh, calling for a $70 billion national pot of, which the New York City would get tens of billions of dollars out of. And the federal, all of the housing authorities in the country have now joined that in the context of COVID and pushed uh, HUD to uh, fight for that allocation as well. Just on, on if tenants in NYCHA, and this was asked earlier about Section 8 as well, if tenants in NYCHA or in Section 8 housing have trouble paying their rent, just remember that you are eligible to have a rent uh, adjustment downward. Uh, you're not supposed to be paying more than 30% of your income in rent. And when your income declines, you should be able to get an adjustment. NYCHA has accelerated uh, that process of, of, of approving those and, and adjusting the rent downward. 
So they are working on that. With respect to Section 8, I spoke with NYCHA just in the last couple of days. They administer about 90,000 Section 8 vouchers in New York City, and they said only 900 tenants had requested a rent adjustment so far uh, in March uh, and April. So that is a very, very small fraction. It is very likely there are lots of other tenants who have had reductions in income and should be eligible for a rent adjustment. So I would urge you to uh, contact uh, NYCHA or HPD if they're administering your Section 8 voucher. And if you have any trouble with that, call uh, Yulene's office or my office or one of your elected officials and we can help with that. Thank you, Brian. Um, I just want to uh, say thank you again to all our panelists for our housing and social services panel. Thanks, guys. And um, I just wanted to also introduce very quickly our uh, panelists uh, for our resiliency and environment uh, panel. And uh, I'm going to start with Liz uh, from NYPIRG. And Liz, will you introduce yourself and say hello? And then also make sure that, um, you know, we talk a little bit about, um, you know, our environmental uh, issues that were covered and not covered in our budget. And so um, just a couple of districts, the specific issues, um, we know that right now here in lower Manhattan, um, climate change remains a huge priority. No doubt that we're, there's going to be another severe weather event like Superstorm Sandy down here. The question is really about when it will happen. And I just wanted to uh, note that, you know, uh, lower Manhattan has had uh, several discussions about <laughs> um, what we can do for resiliency, but right now in the time of COVID, the, a lot of things have been on pause. So I um, wanted to kind of uh, hit up Liz and Kate on uh, both of these issues, but Liz, will you start? Thank you. Sure, thank you so much, Assemblymember, for having me at this event. Um, it's an honor to get to speak to you guys today. I love getting to speak with constituents. Um, so my name is Liz Moran. I'm the Environmental Policy Director for NYPIRG, the New York Public Interest Research Group. Um, and this was a really tough budget, but it's during that for the environment, there were a lot of positives in this year's budget. Um, so the Assembly may, member made some really important points about uh, the importance of fighting the climate crisis and making sure that New York City is resilient to the next superstorm event. Um, and there's so much that we need to be doing. I think it's also important to note that uh, the COVID crisis has really highlighted the importance of investing in our environment and having strong environmental protections. Um, for example, a lot of people more than ever are seeking the outdoors as a refuge in this time of crisis and space has become so valuable. We've seen a number of viral images from New York City where people are just crowding parks and it's really unfortunate. Um, so it shows just how important having access to green space truly is. Um, not only that, a number of images have gone viral from other parts of the country and world about how much cleaner the environment is right now. Um, there are images from uh, Los Angeles uh, of clean air that isn't covered with smog. Uh, images from different cities in China that have cleaner skylines in India with cleaner skylines. Um, there were images that went viral from Venice, Italy with the canalways being perfectly clean. So people really appreciate a clean environment. and. It shouldn't take people having to be stuck in their homes for our environment to be clean. It's not individual's fault that our environment is in the condition it is. This, these are uh, systemic issues that need to be addressed globally by our governments. Um, and not only that, because we have legacy pollution in this country, uh, because uh, there are communities that have been adversely impacted by air pollution, uh, by water pollution. Uh, those are the same communities that are adversely impacted by, the, um, by COVID-19 right now. There was a study that was released from Harvard that found that people who live in communities with worse air pollution uh, are more likely to die from COVID-19. Um, so this is a crisis that's truly highlighted why as a country, we need to be doing more to protect our environment. Um, but unfortunately, it's been left to the states. Our federal government has not just dropped the ball, that's putting it kindly at this point. Um, our federal government is 
actively harming public health and actively harming the environment and the decisions it made before the COVID-19 crisis and continues to make just in the course of this pandemic. Um, the federal administration has rolled back more regulations. Uh, they've weakened fuel emission standards. They have put forward a rulemaking that largely eliminates a number of Clean Water Act protections for streams and wetlands. Um, and on top of that, they have a blanket policy to effectively not enforce environmental laws and regulations during the course of this pandemic. So uh, well-endowed polluters, the fossil fuel industry, the plastics industry, have taken total advantage of this crisis uh, to advocate for further rollbacks. A number of states are enforcing a lot of plastics uh, laws and regulations. Um, and the fossil fuel industry and the plastics industry actually might soon enjoy a massive bailout while we just heard <laughs> in the previous panel, we have millions that can't afford to pay rent. Uh, so in the face of that, New York State has done a lot of things uh, in the state budget that are positive and serve as a good balance to what's going on federally. There's a lot more we need to do, but we're in a good place. Um, so if some of them are, I don't know how much you want me to keep going or if we should go to another panelist, but I could certainly outline much more of the budget if you'd like. Yeah, that would be great. Um, let's let's uh, let Kate talk for a little bit, but just because you mentioned it, um, I, I just wanted to touch base and let people know that some of the biggest highlights were um, on the ban on polystyrene, styrofoam, uh, food containers, um, and uh, the uh, big, uh, obviously huge bond that we are trying to put together for the Restore Mother Nature Act. It's $3 billion, but it's not nearly big enough as, we know, as we've been talking about, Liz, right? And um, it is dedicated towards climate change mitigation, environmental restoration, and conservation and resiliency infrastructure. And I just want to say why it's not big enough, because just here in Lower Manhattan, our needs alone are around $8 billion. So just, just so folks understand how much smaller it is in the in the conversation of the um, of the dollars, because even though it says three billion, it sounds really big to us who can't pay rent, like me, um, I, I just want to say that it is um, actually not even enough for Lower Manhattan. So just, just to put it out there. Um, I wanted to also put uh, out there that uh, the budget also keeps the funding level for Environmental Protection Fund, um, the EPF, consistent at $300 million, um, and, and that these are obviously steps in the right direction, but we, we need to find um, alternative sources of capital uh, to ensure that our preservation initiatives are adequately funded. So those are just a couple of things that we touched base at the beginning of our program, but I wanted to bring it back here. And I know that you have so much more that you can add, Liz, because um, you're an expert. And I will um, uh, get back to you right after Kate introduces herself and then also um, some of the work that the Waterfront Alliance is doing. And then we have a couple of questions that um, were submitted in uh, into our inbox and so wanted to kind of touch base on those before we um, kind of uh, launch into some of the things that we want to see down here, okay? Uh Hello, uh, thanks, so, can you hear me? All right, thank you so much for having me to the assembly member and thank you to all the elected officials and all of the participants that are showing up today on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I'll just briefly touch on who we are, uh, just a, touching on the, the budget as the assembly member just highlighted, uh, we completely agree. Um, and just briefly what we can do at the state level and, and a little bit of a highlight on federal. Um, so the Waterfront Alliance is an alliance of more than 1100 alliance partners. We work on making sure our waterfronts are accessible to all, that they are resilient and that they are vitalized and for generations to come. Um, I think we've heard a lot of pretty uh, pretty tough stats today, so just very stay light on those. But uh, we have more than one million people in the floodplain today in our region. We had a NYCHA resident that highlighted uh, her risk about COVID. We have 17% of NYCHA housing actually in the floodplain today. Um, so these are some things that we're concerned about as an organization. Um, last year, we developed a policy paper that we have been organizing around to build a coalition and campaign called Rise to Resilience. I want to acknowledge my colleague Trevor Holland, who leads uh, Tough LAS, 
tenants united fighting for lower east side he probably knows more about the east side coast resiliency and two bridges projects than i do so if you have a question definitely ask him too um so these are pretty tough issues we need action at federal state and local levels um one thing is the bond act we got three billion dollars the first one since 96 um so it's great and we need to vote on it and that just a reminder that it's something that we vote on and it's effectively raising the debt ceiling so uh, that's something we have to kind of keep going on um the the second piece of that is that vote, sure sorry when is that vote when is the vote um uh, that's in November. Thank you. Um, on the November ballot. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Just to make clear, it's not a not a preliminary measure, but a, a November ballot measure. Um, so we also um, the other piece of this is we need a long term funding source. We have a surcharge on your electricity bill that goes to fund NYSERDA. Uh, that's something we don't have for flooding at all. There's nothing that goes towards a long term flooding fund. Uh, we'd love to see that and, and it's it's critical. It's essentially a, a utility we're not managing. Um, we also kind of need a statewide framework for climate resilience. We don't really have that. I think that was the intention of the Climate Risk, uh, Community Risk and Resiliency Act of 2014. Uh, but a lot of the things that we're committed to in, in that act have not really uh, been realized and there's not really any large changes on land use rules and, and how the state guides that. Um, we also have talked to one of the senators, I believe that was uh, previously on here, about uh, right to know uh, our flood risk disclosure. That's something that you can kind of waive your right to know with $500. That's wrong and that's something we'd like to fix. Um, we'd also like to build bridges, increasing uh, what we see on COVID. We have New York State working with New Jersey, working with Connecticut. We're stronger together in the federal in the federal sphere uh, to get things like a federal stimulus, where we're investing in NYCHA, where we're investing through HUD, through uh, green stimulus and green jobs. Um, so those are some of the things, just a sampling of what we're fighting for. But we look forward to to fighting with the assembly member and all of you. Um, and happy to chat and take questions. All right. Well, it's a good thing you mentioned Trevor being an expert and asking questions to Trevor because Trevor's got a question for you um, <laughs> for the panel. Um, so Trevor's question is, how do we continue to advocate for resiliency projects in our neighborhood in the face of ranking priorities and massive budget cuts? And this is a very valid question. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of uh, two things. We're investing at the federal level in recovery dollars right now. We need them first and foremost to go to those that were hit first and worst. Um, and I think that that's um, complicated when you think about the multiple risks people in the floodplain, people in NYCHA housing in the floodplain face right now. Um, so I think we can do two birds, one stone with federal dollars and think about how we can both recover and invest in job recovery uh, that also is, is infrastructure development. Infrastructure is green jobs. Um, I think that that could be mimicked at the state level. Um, so there's, there's some of that. Um, and there's also, I think we're not really thinking long term. We generally pass budgets year to year without developing a long term funding source that incrementally builds. And that's why I think we keep coming back to looking at things like a surcharge on insurance, which is progressive, long term funding source for resiliency. Um, and it, you know, it's not going to happen tomorrow for sure, um, but it's something that we can start building on now. Amazing. Um, all right. So one other question. I'm going to also allow Liz to kind of talk a little bit. This is actually kind of wrapping into what she was talking about before um, about the state budget. But who is in charge of distributing the funds allocated for certain projects in the environment right now? And what is the current plan at the state level for these kinds of disasters? So Liz? I know it's kind of large. <laughs> yeah, I'll do my best to answer that because it's going to vary depending on the type of project, um, what fund it's coming out of, but primarily the agencies that are going to be funding these sort of projects um, would be uh, DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, but it could also be, depending on the type of project, uh, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, um, or if it's a water infrastructure project, it actually could from, come from um, the Environmental Facilities Corporation, EFC, 
Um, and that's another resiliency piece, a uh, part of the Mother Nature, uh, the Restore Mother Nature Bond Act um, is investing in, in water infrastructure, um, which in New York City uh, certainly needs uh, increased resiliency as well. Uh, combined sewer overflows are a big issue for the city. Um, and that's uh, part of the Restore Mother Nature Bond Act, and we also do have the Clean Water Infrastructure Act, which funds a number of water projects in the state. Last year on, in our budget, and that was Steve Englebright's baby. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's a really important measure. Um, Assembly member, you made a great point that needs are tremendous. The needs of your district alone could eat, eat up the three billion uh, Restore Mother Nature Bond Act. That doesn't come as a shock. Um, water infrastructure needs statewide alone uh, could cost as much as $4 billion annually to meet a 20-year need. Uh, so yeah, we need to be investing a lot more. It's good that we're making these steps forward, um, but it's, it's not enough. So I apologize. That was a, a little bit of a long answer to how do we fund these things? Who do we fund these things? But it depends. We have a lot of different pots of funding to dig into. Amazing, thank you, Liz. Um, and this one is uh, again about the East River Park. Um, Harriet feels very strongly that the destruction of East River Park this fall should not begin while this pandemic is still raging. She says, we have lost so many neighbors and loved ones and many of us are still sick and have lost income sources. It feels in inappropriate almost to spend $1.1 billion of city money on the ESCR when there is a cheaper plan that was thrown out. Can that money be re reallocated to help people still and pay rent and put food on the table? Yeah, I can answer part of that question. I'm not sure if I can answer all. So uh, feel free, Liz, to jump in. Um, just in, I think most of the, the folks on this call probably know about the history here, but uh, this project that initiated through uh, actually an authorization from Congress after Sandy um, was one of a rebuild by design projects where there was a strong community process, lots of back and forth, two-way engagement. And there was a failure to communicate. Um, I think a lot of concerns on the city side adequately from the beginning that they knew were there. And at the last minute, the plan was sort of switched and it became a new plan. And I think it eroded a lot of trust, including probably Harriet's and many of the others that I know working on this project. Um, it's, it's pretty offensive to spend your time and to, to have that flip uh, or rug pulled out from under you. In terms of, um, I guess there's two things to focus on here. Um, you know, one, what have we learned from it? And two, what can we do now? I think in terms of what we learned from it, um, we know that we, we probably don't have a good process for planning for flood risk and resiliency. Um, I'd say that we're just very much in our nascency of, of figuring that out, but there are things that we can do to make sure we codify process uh, and, and good process practices in any kind of project like this. Um, we also need more interagency collaboration so that these, these, these sort of projects don't sort of get so far along with disagreements between agencies that are not resolved and then come up at the last minute. Um, I think, you know, we've also learned a little bit more about cost. Um, I think that there were some cost concerns from the beginning of the project that were not necessarily communicated, but were there and uh, really came at the last minute. Um, so I think there are a few things that we can do to kind of resolve that. Um, one is thinking about a comprehensive resilience strategy or plan for New York City. Um, and in terms of the funding piece, the federal funding is already allocated through a very specific um, avenue, and we can't really change that easily. In fact, we're in danger of not having it if we don't spend it as soon as possible or by 2022. Um, in terms of the city money, I, I, I really don't think it's likely. Um, you know, I think that, that others might have more information on that. Um, they would have to do a complete redesign uh, or go back to the original plan and design that. And then in, in two years, I, they're already breaking ground. It's, it's, it's not feasible now, but I think we need to learn from it and, and, and really focus on what's next because there will be more of these. 
Thank you so, so much. Um, and one last question from uh, one of our uh, constituents is, um, you know, right now businesses are really affected, uh, especially uh, small businesses. What do you think um, the effect will be for the styrofoam ban and will restaurants, especially in Chinatown, be disproportionately affected given their reliance on styrofoam in the past? It's a great question. Um, so a couple things. The polystyrene ban won't go into effect until 2022. So it's not going to affect right away. So there's a little bit more time for small businesses to adjust. Um, the plastic bag ban went into effect pretty quick. But the other thing to note is um, New York City already has a polystyrene ban. Um, so New York City is already ahead of the game. In fact, that polystyrene ban has a specific carve out in the language that was passed in the budget. So New York City is going to get to keep their polystyrene ban, and that'll still continue to be in effect. Um, but that said, there also is a provision in um, the legislation that could allow for small businesses um, to have additional time, um, possible exemptions, but I think they would have to apply through DEC for that. Amazing. Thanks, Liz. And one last question that just popped up, and this is going to be the last one for our um, Resiliency and Environment panel. Um, Tommy, one of my very good friends, is just asking, what happened to the interim flood protection study we were promised as part of ESCR approval in November? And without it, community um, is vulnerable for more than six years. The independent consultant recommended it. Any um, thoughts on that, Kate? And, uh, you know, because it's on the city level, I think that I'm going to kind of defer to you on that a little bit. Yeah, um, well, I know that there are interim flood protection measures that are in some communities in um, lower Manhattan by the Brooklyn Bridge. But I'm wondering if Trevor, if I could phone a friend on this one, because I, I'm not sure um, what the status is of just the ones that are right in front of where the ESCR is supposed to be. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure if he's willing to comment, sorry to put you on the spot, but I, I do know of the ones that are in place in lower Manhattan. I'm just not sure how far that stretches north exactly. And to, to sort of just explain what they are, so these are these, they're called HESCO barriers. They're basically bags of sand that are in the shape of a cube and they lock together and they'll kind of deal with the sort of two to 10 year events, the smaller, um, more frequent flooding that we're more likely to face in the near term. Uh, they certainly won't deal with a sandy style, uh, uh, size event, but they will deal with a, a smaller event. And, um, and I just wanted to follow up on Tommy's question because I think it's so valuable. Like, where is the funding for that coming from? And does that take away from the funding towards um, actual permanent resiliency? Yeah, I, I don't, I think that, that that funding comes from the city itself. But again, that's a very specific uh, question that, um, you know, Trevor might know the answer to uh, if, if, he, if he has it. But if not, I'll, I'll try to get back to you and send it to the assembly member. Amazing. Thank you, Kate. And then, um, Tommy, uh, we have a couple of things that we had written up for uh, this specifically, so I will make sure to um, send, send you a note uh, personally. Um, also, we're, we wanted to thank our panelists again for all of the work that you guys put into making sure that our environment is protected. And I also wanted to say thank you for um, being on our panel today, because without you, we obviously, um, you know, Obviously, we have a lot of advocacy needs here in Lower Manhattan when it comes to resiliency and the environment. And without you guys, we wouldn't be able to do the things that we do. So thank you, Kate, and thank you, Liz. And um, we're going to be moving to our healthcare panel, but um, hopefully, you know, you guys can stay on later and uh, answer any questions that folks have as we go. So thank you so much, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, and now we have our amazing health and hospital panel. And we wanted to, of course, um, uh, say hello to our amazing healthcare chair, Richard Gottfried, who's been our healthcare chair um, and my mentor for a really long time now. So uh, thank you, uh, Dick, for being here. Um, also, I wanted to say that we have Pauline Ferrante from the Office of External Affairs at DOHMH on the call. As uh, She's on her phone, though, so um, I'm going to unmute her just uh, so that she can say a quick hello. Um, and then uh, we have Ding from uh, the Aperture Community Health Center. Ding, are you still there? I don't see Ding anymore. Um, all right, I'm gonna make Hello, sure. I'm here. Oh, there, there you are, there you How are. How are you? Hi, hi, hi. 
Um, and then uh, we uh, also have Rocky still on and uh, just wanted to make sure that uh, Rocky can answer some of the things on AARP's uh, perspective as well when it comes to seniors. Is that all right with you, Rocky? If I can. All right, thank you, Rocky. All right, so, um, uh, oh, and, and for the folks who um, were on the resiliency panel who might now be in the attendees, um, Sarah had another question on that. And we'll, we'll get back to anybody who has questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. Our office will get back to you on anything that you ask. Um, just make sure that we uh, have your uh, number and your address uh, and you can uh, info at Yulene New is the place to send that. Again, that is I-N-F-O at Y-U-H-L-I-N-E-N-I-O-U dot O-R-G. So thank you so much um, for joining us today. Again, um, we are taking questions in our chat. We are also uh, joined on three different, um, you know, I guess, platforms. My staff is trying to navigate all of them. So they've been, they've been put onto different platforms to help to answer questions. Uh, we're, we're also answering questions for folks um, at, at all times uh, as we go, but also um, we're going to be following up with those questions whenever people ask us anything. Um, I have a cheat sheet. I just wanted to let people know we have a cheat sheet. My staff will put that into our chat again. Um, every single uh, time we have our amazing town halls, uh, we have this great cheat sheet that I'm known for now. It's a it's very, very simple uh, breakdown of our budget, which actually is very complicated, but um, we try to help to let folks know what's going on in our budget um, at any given moment. And um, I wanted to, again, say thank you to our panelists. And um, I'm just going to kick it off with um, having our uh, healthcare chair, Dick Gottfried, um, kind of look through our budget highlights um, and and give us a little bit of an overview um, I gave an overview at the very beginning um, that really talked about the Medicaid redesign plan that cut 400 million dollars to hospital spending but increased overall Medicaid by three percent um, the Medicaid redesign plan uh, also made modifications to the 300 million dollars in restored funds from the previous fiscal year's budget which includes 94 million dollars to reduce across the Board cuts for most Medicaid providers, um, $70 million for indigent care pool funding for public hospitals, and $33.2 million to restore enhanced safety net hospitals. Um, we will also talked about the, um, the MRT2 uh, plan, which, um, you know, now I think is very, uh, <laughs> complicated and uh, I think our, our, our chair can tell us a little bit about what's going on with that. Um, that there was $94 million uh, put in to reduce proposed across the board reductions for most Medicaid providers, 70 million to restore, uh, again, the indigent care pool funding. Um, and then we also had this $17.25 million to restore the managed long-term care quality payments that would incentivize NLTCs to collaborate with providers to develop high quality programs and then 22.5 million to restore half of the workforce retraining and retention funding. Um, and I think that, you know, our district specific points is that in, you know, in any given year cuts to Medicaid mean that New Yorkers suffer, um, that hospitals go without and that nursing homes close and that there are staff shortages. Uh, and when we cut healthcare spending amid a crisis like this one, that means that a lot of people will die. And I think that, um, I know that that's not something that we, uh, we can't, you know, avoid and ignore. Um, and I think that, you know, it also means that um, we are cutting already, you know, non-existent resources too um, from those suffering from this virus. And we already know that we don't have enough nurses and doctors and ventilators and tests and countless other elements that we need in a robust public health. So um, we're answering to having to cut in the midst of a crisis. So um, our chair has been incredibly, incredibly vocal and incredibly uh, hard fighting in this crisis. And I just wanted to say uh, thank you uh, to my friend and mentor, Dick Gottfried. Um, and I'm just going to hand it off to you, Dick, expert. Well, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. And Yulene, it's great that you do these. Um, uh, the Medicaid budget this year was actually about as bad uh, as any Medicaid budget I've seen. And, you know, I've I've chaired the health committee since 1987, so I've been through uh, quite a few Medicaid budgets through uh, quite a few, uh, quite a few through uh, 
through four governors. Um, the, the problem with Medicaid, you know, it got sold to the public by the governor and largely bought up by the press that Medicaid was somehow overspending. And this conjures up images of, you know, waste and abuse and you know, money going uh, down the drain. Uh, none of that was involved. Uh, the the so-called overspending is because in 2011, uh, when Governor Cuomo first came in, he got the legislature, uh, over my better judgment, uh, to enact a, a cap on Medicaid spending, uh, a completely artificial number, uh, while it had an adjustment for uh, a certain level of uh, inflation, uh, that was, you know, a, a, a fixed formula that did not, that was not adjusted because of actual uh, increases in, in inflation, and also had no provision in it for adjustments for increased um, enrollment uh, or the needs of, uh, of Medicaid enrollees. And as with every other aspect of society, uh, we have been seeing more and more New Yorkers living longer, which is a good thing, uh, but it also means uh, their health care expenses going up, uh, particularly for home care uh, and nursing home care. And the governor's uh, Medicaid cap uh, makes no adjustment for that, uh, just as it makes no adjustment for the fact that uh, with the COVID-19 situation, we're going to see a, a, a dramatic reduction in, uh, in income levels for millions of New Yorkers, which means more and more New Yorkers are going to be eligible uh, for Medicaid, um, which will jack up the spending. Uh, going into the budget, the governor uh, said that projected Medicaid spending would be two and a half billion dollars uh, just of the state share of Medicaid. We also get federal matching money. Uh, and if you cut Medicaid by two and a half billion dollars of the state share, um, that's about a 10 percent, uh, five or 10 percent uh, cut in the program, which is pretty hefty. Um, we ended up, uh, have, because of the governor's power in budget negotiations, uh, we ended up accepting about a $2 billion uh, cut in the Medicaid program. Now that cut is by and large not kicking in right away because, uh, not because of any generosity on the state's part, but because with the uh, COVID-19 legislation from Washington, we are getting a, uh, about a $6 billion increase in federal money for Medicaid but it comes with a condition, and that is that it, it says we have to have basically a maintenance of effort in Medicaid. So uh, for as long as the federal increased funding continues, uh, which will be presumably for several months, uh, the various cuts in Medicaid that the governor imposed on us uh, cannot take effect uh, uh, until after we we stopped getting the federal money. And so the budget legislation for most of the Medicaid cuts says that they don't take effect uh, on, uh, until October 1. So they didn't kick in April 1, they will so far kick in October 1, um, which is good because the, the longer we can avoid those cuts, uh, the better. Uh, one of the biggest areas of, of cuts uh, is in home, home health care. Uh, there are a couple of major uh, hits there. One is eligibility uh, for home care. Uh, we have significantly raised uh, the level of need that you have to meet uh, in order to uh, qualify for home care. Uh, and you have to be uh, need assistance in three or more activities of daily living, like Cooking, toileting, dressing, etc. Uh, or if you have, if you are a patient with dementia, you have to also have two or more activities of daily living 
that you need help with. And there are going to be a fair number of people who've been, who, who would have gotten home care and, and need it, uh, but will not be eligible because of this higher standard. And on top of that, uh, previously it was uh, your physician uh, and the home care agency that you would use, uh, and there were some other players that would determine uh, what your need was, how many hours a day of home care you need, for example. Uh, we are now going to be farming that out uh, to a corporation, presumably uh, a huge corporation called Maximus, uh, which already does a lot of the administering of our Medicaid program. And they will be uh, choosing a panel of doctors who will determine uh, how much home care uh, you are able to get. Um, one of the few good things we did in the budget in the health area uh, was in the area of what is called indigent care funding for hospitals. Uh, it's something New York has done for decades. Uh, we, uh, as of many, as of a few years ago, a large share of that money went to uh, the major uh, academic medical centers, like, uh, not to pick anyone out, but Mount Sinai and New York Presbyterian and other uh, big hospitals, Lenox Hill, um, and they got a disproportionate share of that indigent care funding, largely because of their political clout. Uh, a few years ago, we passed legislation to redistribute that money so that more of it uh, would go to real uh, community-based uh, safety net hospitals that deliver the bulk of uh, indigent care uh, to people on Medicaid, people who are uninsured, et cetera. Uh, we were phasing in that shift as of several years ago, but again, largely because of pressure from governors uh, and the hospital industry, uh, that phase in of the fairer distribution system was pretty much frozen. Uh, one of the good things we did in this year's budget was we, we, resume, we, we implemented the full shift in the money to the new uh, formula that drives more of the money uh, to the hospitals that really take care of uh, indigent patients, uh, particularly for uh, the New York City public hospitals and public hospitals uh, around the state. So that was one of the good things we did. Uh, the last thing I want to mention, because uh, I try to mention this every time I talk about the budget, uh, New York State and, and this country as a whole uh, does not devote enough of our wealth to the public sector, whether you're talking healthcare or education or mass transit or a host of other things. Uh, every other uh, industrial democracy spends a lot more of their national wealth on healthcare and, and human services and education. Uh, the way to fix that and the way to have avoided some of the cuts we did in this year's budget is with that word that the uh, politicians don't like to say, taxes. And, you know, I don't, I doubt anybody watching this uh, town hall uh, feels they are undertaxed, uh, nor are they undertaxed, because average New Yorkers are overtaxed. The reason we're overtaxed is because we do not impose enough of a share of our tax, tax burden on high wealth. And so people in the middle and the bottom pay more in taxes than they ought to and get less in services than we ought to. Uh, and unfortunately, in this year's budget fight, uh, there was virtually no uh, advocacy, uh, certainly at the top level of the legislative uh, uh, and executive uh, branches, uh, on the tax question. And every organization that cares about anything in the budget, uh, I believe, has got to join the effort to, to speak out. Uh, it not, it's too late for this year, 
but we need to be working for next year's budget for a dramatic increase uh, in taxes on big wealth. And you know, some people say, oh, COVID-19, we're in a recession, how can you talk about that? Well, the people I'm talking about tax taxing, they're not losing their jobs. The, the people on Wall Street, the what used to be called the captains of industry, they're not losing their jobs. Uh, and if the stock market uh, was down for a while, it's bouncing back and they have the good sense not to sell their stock when the market is down. They buy when the market is down. That's how they got to be rich. Um, and so we really need to, to act. There's a, there's a variety of proposals uh, for raising taxes on big wealth and we really need to pay attention to that. Thank you, Dick. And um, we also have, right after this panel, a panel on economic justice. So hopefully you can stay for that and talk about it as well. Um, so one of the things that, um, you know, we've been getting a lot of, uh, you know, thoughts on is uh, obviously healthcare uh, for our community health centers. So I wanted to bring on Ding to talk about that a little bit. And uh, Ding, introduce yourself with Aperture and uh, also um, help us to get us a little resource and knowledge about what's going on with our community. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Assemblymember Nu, and of course, the, uh, the graduate for, for this opportunity to be here and for organizing this. This is an important uh, kind of conversation that must take place in our community. I'm the Chief Development Officer of Apicha Community Health Center. And as you know, while we serve um, the broader New York City uh, communities, we do, as a federally qualified health center, we um, um, do have a Lower East Side um, and a Chinatown area as one of our uh, components of our service area as a federally qualified health center. So, um, and uh, being, uh, being a federally qualified health center, we have to be. We have to remain open to provide services. You know, during this crisis, um, we um, are in the kind of in a background because our main purpose of being is uh, to be able to make sure that we can help prevent people from going to the emergency room. Um, we wanted to make sure that we have continuity of care even in this crisis. So um, another point of that is also because we are a community health center, our services are available to the community regardless of their ability to pay. Now, having said that, during the, um, the uh, when the crisis came about, um, uh, Apicha, I'm part of uh, a team of, of emergency 2019 COVID response within the organization. Um, the, one of the things, of course, we wanted to make sure that the safety of our, uh, our staff and our patients are taken care of. And then we also had to take on, so what is it? How, how can we provide the services under this condition? So um, we, uh, we um, decided to uh, implement telehealth. Um, that's um, fortunately prior to the crisis, we have already been investigating what telehealth at Ingunshan Junction with our um, uh, behavioral health services. Uh, so that when we, it was time to actually transform it, we were able to uh, set ourselves up, um, you know, the uh, remote uh, visits um, in, a, in a couple of weeks. So pretty much now um, uh, our patients are, are being seen either telephonically uh, or, um, you know, through, um, through um, virtual medicine. And um, some, of course, there's still a few who need to come for various reasons if they require to, but we do have a, a, a skeleton force in the premises and then a lot of our people are, on, are doing this online. Okay. So 
so uh, so um you you have asked about um so uh, how do we what kind of um uh, legislation can we possibly have under this condition I'm, am i jumping this so um the one thing that is really um i appreciate that um of course the subways are getting clean that's very important um we also learned that are uh, now um, the uh, personal protect protective equipment. It's already being uh, talked about as need that we have to make sure that we have abundant supply because that was the one of the most disastrous um, episodes in this uh, response to the crisis. So um, the, if we have, we do have to make sure that this uh, what they call PPEs are available to our uh, frontline workers um, who are interacting with the patients um, and they are uh, available um, immediately. Um, then of course um, we need to reflect on what it really means when our own um, uh, health workers get sick. They do, they do, uh, they do get uh, charged with um, all the cost of hospitalization. Um, um, somehow we need to think about how it's going to be, how they're going to be helped along those lines because it's very expensive when especially when you end up in an ICU. So um, then of course, um, when we think about uh, healthcare, in this, um, the way we are begin, we were beginning to shift care. It's not just our our medical providers, but you are also talking about uh, your care managers, you know, and other um, support services, the behavioral health services people who are part of that team that takes care of um, our um, our patients. So you know, we are happy to. Um, you know, report that, you know, in, we did track our data so far um, and during this last, the first three, we, we went on uh, telehealth on um, May 23 and tracked our data on, um, on, on that period. Um, we were able to triage around 260 people who were um, uh, reporting symptoms of COVID, and we were able to also continue uh, providing services to our HIV patients, the people who needing prep um, uh, visits, and um, and also to the other patients who were just needing ongoing primary care. Thank you, Jane. Um, so I'm going to uh, now call up uh, Pauline, our uh, DOHMH representative. I'm unmuting you now. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Assemblymember New, for having me. Um, so I will just go over the state budget for the health department. Um, so obviously, because of COVID-19, the projected fiscal year 2021 state budget has been very scaled back. Um, however, there are two bright spots for the health department. So one, it extends the authority for pharmacists to provide immuniz certain immunizations until 2022. And the list of what is currently allowed includes influenza, pneumococcal and meningococcal, shingles, and Tdap uh, vaccinations. So we're hoping the list of allowable immunizations will expand beyond the five, but we are glad that this authorization will not sunset this year. Um, and there were also a number of important tobacco policies that passed as well. Um, and in particular, the budget outlawed the sale of flavored vaping products in New York and retailers who violate the ban would face a civil penalty of up to $100 per item. And other notable policies included the prohibition prohibition of sales of tobacco products, including vaping products, herbal products in pharmacies. So restriction on the delivery of vape products um, and, uh, and ending any online um, vaping sales. Um, so that's 
So these two things actually are very important and tie into COVID-19. Um, obviously, vaccinations are extremely important and, you know, your general overall health um, prior to some pandemic is absolutely important. And we can talk a little bit more about um, the disparities that we're seeing in our neighborhoods a little bit later in case anyone has any questions about that. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, and then again, vaping and tobacco and smoking, we all know that that impacts your lungs. And in this particular pandemic, um, we do know that the impact of COVID-19 um, was um, in the lungs and the respiratory system. So I think overall, for the general health of New Yorkers, these two, um, these two priorities are really important, and I'm glad that they are continued to be funded. So I uh, can, can stop talking about this right now and then answer any questions people may have about COVID-19 specific questions. Amazing. Thank you, Pauline. Um, I'm going to keep you on the phone, so um, it makes it a little bit easier for us. Um, and uh, unless like folks are answering questions so then and background noise. Um, we have a couple of constituent questions um, that are a little bit more specific. Um, and then we also have a couple of uh, constituent questions that are a little bit more um, uh, general. And so I'm going to ask uh, two of the general questions and then I'm going to get to the more specific ones. Um, so the general one is um, how will the state ensure that New York's healthcare system fully recovers from COVID-19 itself? I'm going to give this to Dick and Pauline. <laughs> well, of course, you're assuming that New York State will make sure that our healthcare system recovers. Um, this is my and, and and unfortunately, that you know that's always an open question. Um, I think I think a couple of things. One, we need to have uh, a very professional. Uh, and independent team of people uh, looking at that question, not only specifically how we recover from COVID-19 uh, and, and what that may, uh, may mean, but also we need to learn the lessons about our healthcare system uh, that the COVID-19 uh, epidemic is, is teaching us about the weaknesses in the system, uh, the problems that come from so many New Yorkers uh, not being able to pay for their health care. Uh, and by the way, I'm not only talking about the thankfully fairly small percentage of New Yorkers who don't have health coverage, but millions of New Yorkers who have health coverage uh, still can't afford their care because of deductibles and co-pays and restricted provider networks and the like. Uh, and of course, the way to deal with that, in, in, in my view, uh, is to pass uh, the New York Health Act, my bill that would create a single payer health plan. And I think people all across the country are, as a result of COVID-19, becoming more aware of how the way we currently finance health care uh, has been making it difficult for people to get care and how that uh, has made people much more vulnerable uh, to severe, more severe symptoms uh, and death. Uh, uh, so we're gonna have to take a very careful look at supporting our hospitals and home care agencies and community health centers and nursing homes. You know, there's been all this discussion about the horrendous situations uh, in our nursing homes. Uh, we should also add adult homes and, uh, and home care. And all of those sectors have for decades uh, been severely understaffed. Uh, there's no news in that. And when you add on the care burdens uh, that come with COVID-19 uh, and the absentee rates among uh, uh, care workers, uh, that makes the staffing shortages all the worse, but they've always been a serious problem. Uh, we're gonna need to deal with that. Uh, and uh, we're going to need to deal with the fact that, you know, people are shocked to find that uh, there are problems in nursing homes and the health department wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't on the case. Uh, well, that's also nothing new. Uh, you know, our, in, our enforcement inspection and enforcement personnel uh, in the health department have for, for years and years been seriously understaffed uh, and 
and, and pretty gentle to say the least uh, in how they enforce uh, the rules. Um, you know, every year various national organizations put out rankings of uh, nursing homes uh, and uh, the quality of care they give, the number of patients that have serious problems, et cetera. And while New Yorkers like to think that we must be best in everything, after all, we're New York, the truth is when those national rankings come out on nursing home care, uh, we are consistently near the bottom. Uh, we're now seeing that uh, very vividly with COVID-19. Um, but we're going to not only need to recover from COVID-19, but to recover from the deficiencies that have been in our system uh, uh, all along. Uh, and, I, and, you know, that, that understaffing and underfunding is with long-term care, it's with our hospitals, community health centers. Uh, we're going to need to address those problems uh, or we're going to pay the price. Amazing. Thank you. Pauline, did you want to add to that? Um, I don't believe I have anything additional to add to that. I know. Dick is very, very thorough. <laughs> yes. Very thorough. Um, so here's another one. Um, it has been said that the only way we will beat this virus is when a vaccine is available. Is that true? And how will we ensure that the vaccine actually works and will everyone be able to receive it? Also, what about anti-vaxxers? Well, so vaccine, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead. Sure, sure. Um, so I was just going to touch briefly about vaccines aren't the end all be all. Um, there are different ways in which we could reach the other side. Um, we're seeing that right now with the flattening of the curve, but we can't have people um, go out and not socially distance themselves um, too early because we don't want to see a second wave. Um, vaccines are incredibly important as we know. Um, you know, diseases have been eradicated and we have been seeing some diseases come back in the recent years because people have decided not not to vaccinate their children. And so from a public health perspective, we encourage everyone to continue vaccinating um, themselves and their children. And again, um, it's extremely important just to prevent diseases and um, to maintain an overall healthy body so that when there is a pandemic like this, you have a better chance of being able to um, you know, recover or avoid it altogether. The other uh, big source of hope uh, uh, is medication, is you know drugs that will uh, that will cure uh, cases either fully or or greatly reduce uh, their symptoms. Uh, what is it? Remdesivir is showing uh, apparently some promise. Uh, other drugs are being developed and tested. Uh, so even if, even if we can't stop people from getting the vaccine, if we can uh, cure the disease, uh, that's certainly second best uh, and may well uh, become available long before uh, a vaccine is, is developed and, and tested. Uh, you know, a lot of people have asked, uh, you know, are the people who are, who are opposed to vaccinations uh, how are they going to respond to a COVID vaccine? Well, who knows? Um, it may well be that a lot of people will suddenly discover uh, that vaccines are not the invention of the devil, uh, but can in fact be life-saving. Um, so there was a couple of district uh, folks who asked a couple of questions. Um, one person uh, was specifically very um, concerned about folks with um, uh, developmental disabilities and intellectual uh, disabilities um, because she said that a lot of them have already ended up in emergency rooms um, due to COVID. So um, I don't know if you guys wanted to speak on that at all. It's, uh, I guess it's a, it's a little outside my usual uh, substantive turf, but I would, I would say people with developmental disabilities, people with uh, mental health issues, uh, like people with physical disabilities or, or, uh, or 
general infirmities of age, uh, their problems are, you know, are, are certainly highlighted and, and made worse uh, by, the, by the epidemic. And all the things that we know uh, can be helpful to those people, uh, we need to be paying more attention to, uh, as we should have been paying more attention to them uh, for years. Yeah, I think that disparities have really been highlighted um, across the board when it comes to um, healthcare, education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is the next question, and this one's from one of my very good friends, Melissa. Um, I have a lot of concerns about the budget shortfall in relation to healthcare and how it relates to Medicaid and other patient assistance programs. I've talked to Eulene about the adult cystic fibrosis assistance program that has been cut, which assists financially with uh, uh, for people with uh, CF that I would love to see recently. Budget. It was 800000 This is for people with Medicaid but can't afford vital costly treatments. Also, there are 33% of adults and 50% of kids with CF who rely on Medicaid coverage as well as many other populations. What can officials do to protect access for coverage for people with cystic fibrosis as well as the many people who rely on Medicaid? So I think they're asking in terms of the cuts right now. Um, and I mean, everybody can answer that one. I know that um, a lot of our community health centers and our, um, and of course our city government and our state government have um, certain things that they're, they're feeling um, in regards to what's going on, but also, um, mm -hmm. you know, with the services that they're providing, et cetera. Yeah, I wanna, uh, uh, can you, am I, okay. <laughs> yeah, you can hear me. Okay, yeah, just going back, to what I said earlier, we are not existing, community health centers not existing in a vacuum. We're all affected by what's happening. So what's cut in one side somehow also affects us in, in various ways. Um, the, um, the, that goes back to this whole notion of you know, ongoing primary care, you, you know, whether you have, are a person with disability and, or not, you, we still would, um, promote the importance of uh, ongoing primary care. And there are people who recovered from COVID. Many of them may not have um, primary care providers, so, and that's how they ended up in the hospitals. But um, so in this coming period, if we were to recover from this, it's important that we do everything we can to reach out to the communities that we serve um, so that um, they can then access our services. The problem though is that in the course of this um, uh, budget cuts and things like that, a lot of these services that are related to outreach to these communities are going to be the ones that are uh, gonna be on the chopping block. Now, um, so, you know, even before that, we already looked at how important it was to have this aggregated data. Up to now, we still don't have this aggregated data on Asians and Pacific Islanders. And, and we hear a lot of complaints from when the crisis in Elmhurst happened. A lot of these folks are from these communities that have a lot of uh, cultural and linguistic, um, you know, uh, uh, distinct needs that could have been addressed. Had we had the data, had we had how, so we would have known how to uh, do our customized outreach to, to these populations. Thank you, Dean. Did you want to add anything, Pauline? Uh, no. Okay. Um, I just wanted to follow up with um, Deborah's comment to um, Assemblymember Gottfried. Uh, Dick, um, so he, she just said, Assemblymember New knows of these concerns, but one of the issues um, that is contributing to the concerns with 
persons with IDD is the lack of availability of behavior analysts beyond individuals with autism. It is not equitable that you can only get the services if you have autism. Unfortunately, if we don't fix this, the numbers will continue to increase. Behavior analysts are needed for simple things like helping be families and group home staff to teach how to wear masks all the way to helping with severe challenging behavior. We are so hoping that uh, Bill 6389A in the Assembly and Senate Bill 4967A can pass this session so that individuals and families can get the help they need and to help keep individuals out of the hospital to, the de to every degree possible. So I, I, I mean, there's more of a statement, but I know that you have probably some. Yeah. Uh, well, as, as our questioner probably knows, it took a lot of effort over a period of years uh, to get ABB uh, services accepted in New York uh, for coverage uh, for people with autism. Uh, I think it is, it's going to take a major effort, hopefully fewer years to do it. Uh, it'll take a major effort to, to get that done, uh, I expect, uh, to get it done for uh, people with other conditions besides autism. Uh, it's something that I would guess most legislators are at this point not really familiar with the with the use of of, of ABB outside of uh, the autism population. So there's a there's an advocacy effort that's going to have to go on there. Amazing, thank you. And Deb has been advocating hardcore, so we want to say thank you for that because without your voice, we wouldn't be able to have um, that perspective. Um, we have one more question um, on the healthcare side. Um, that is uh, with a uh, given the current health crisis, how can we ensure that every patient that needs care will receive care? Well, you know, my, my answer to that question is the same as my answer to uh, a lot of questions, which is we need a universal single payer health care system uh, so that uh, we can get rid of the financial obstacles uh, to getting care. Uh, that's important to individuals being able uh, to get the care they need. Uh, it's important for hospitals and uh, home care agencies and community health centers and others uh, having the funding uh, that they need to be providing that care. Um, and uh, I, I think, I think organizations that uh, have not gotten on board with fighting for that issue uh, really need to. Uh, there are, I would suggest, two places that people can contact. Uh, one is if you uh, Google the, an organization called the Campaign for New York Health. That's the main organization campaigning for uh, the New York Health Act. Uh, people can also contact uh, my office or State Senator Gustavo Rivera's office. He's the Senate sponsor of the bill, and we can send people more information about it and help get you connected to the campaign for it. Pauline, did you have anything else on that question? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, having people and New York City residents as a whole in general, having better health from the beginning of life um, is also very important because obviously we know hospital beds are finite, right? There's a certain number of hospital beds available to people. And so if we can get our populations to be as healthy as possible, closing those disparities, closing the gaps, um, and, and having people be able to have access to those fresh fruits and vegetables and having people and communities be much healthier from the beginning of life, then you know when there's a pandemic like this, there will be a general healthier, more, more robust population that will not be as likely to be dependent on the healthcare system. Um, so I think the goal of the health department, of course, is to be able to work in those communities most hardest hit now, but um, even prior to this, you know, closing the gap, um, having our uh, health equity teams 
um, be in those communities and to work on priorities in, in making sure our neighborhoods and our, our residents are as healthy as possible. And uh, Ding? Yeah, I, I do have uh, something to add. Um, uh, um, Assemblymember Jatri, uh, you mentioned about, you know, the need to actually sustain the um, health centers and um, our uh, medical uh, 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 health care system. One, there is one strategic issue that's actually concerning with respect to the current language in the budget, and that has to do with the um, pharmacy carve out, um, you know, which we believe will impact uh, the health centers and other um, hospitals that may be um, using the money uh, that is saved from 340B program. So that is something that you know is be beginning to emerge because there are many of us in the in the state of New York that's uh, been providing services to our HIV uh, folks. Um, uh, as well as for other, um, you know, reprodu reproductive health issues and LGBT issues uh, that are using savings from the 340B program. Now, with the language that's in existence now, it looks like um, we will not be able to anymore uh, you know, with the transfer to the FFS. My understanding is that you know, we will no longer be able to avail of that savings if that will work to go through in 2023. Right. Uh, so we're, we're, we're well aware of that issue. Um, the, the language that is now, that got enacted in the budget uh, was pretty much dumped on us uh, by the governor. We didn't really have an opportunity to, I mean, we offered alternative language, but they didn't accept it. Um, I've been working with uh, on 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 new language to to remedy the 340B problem. Um, and for the people listening in, um, I think either of us could try to explain it, but we probably need another half an hour. Uh, but uh, we don't have that. Sorry. <laughs> right, we are, we are working with. Uh, with the with Chicanies, the organization of the mm -hmm. community health centers, and with some of the uh, uh, Medicaid uh, managed care programs that focus on people with HIV, uh, to develop language, which I'm I'm quite certain we can do, uh, that will res resolve the 340B issue there, uh, and and get things back on track. Uh, getting the governor to accept it uh, will be the next step. And so one last statement from Rocky Chin, one of our p former panelists and current panelists, I guess. Um, AARP welcomes support from Assemblymember Gottfried and colleagues from the Assembly uh, regarding long-term care task force. We need the Assembly and the Senate to advocate to Governor Cuomo to create it ASAP. Thank you, Rocky Chin and the AARP. So I agree, Rocky, you got my support and I'm sure that you've got everybody else here's support. So. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for all of your advocacy and all of your work. Um, you know, our, our district, actually, we had a long-term care facility that we lost and it was very, very hard for us. Um, you know, people know it as a uh, Rivington house and, um, you know, we need our long-term care facilities. We need um, our healthcare, um, you know, safety net to be working. And um, there was somebody else who had said something about Medicare for all, all day. And I think that we have to make sure that that we um, advocate for uh, Medicare for All. Um, thank you so much for uh, all of your support, Dick, and, um, and, and Ding and Pauline uh, for being here and uh, helping us to get through our, uh, our budget today on healthcare. So again, just wanted to say that uh, without uh, all of the advocates and without all of the advocacy work that we're doing around healthcare, um, we won't see the kind of recovery that we want to see. And, um, you know, COVID has really shined a, a, a spotlight on all of the things that are missing um, from our, um, from our government system of healthcare and from, um, from a lot of our social services and from a lot of um, the things that we need to be a robust uh, and have a robust public health care system. And, um, you know, this isn't a system that is broken. I like to say that a lot, but it is a system that is designed to hurt particular communities. And, um, and I think that 
it has done its job. Um, and we need to make sure that we are dismantling the system and changing things in a very real way to make sure that we have the change that we want to see in our healthcare system and um, in a system of uh, government that uh, will make it so that we value people over profits and uh, people over money and people over um, even our own budget uh, needs in our state level. So thank you so much to all of you. And thank you so much to our amazing chair uh, for um, providing all of this information. My pleasure. Yes, you're the guy with the facts and stats, man. <laughs> so thank you so much. And uh, we have an economic justice panel starting right now. Um, Dick, if you want to stay on since you know, you've had uh, a, a lot to say on that issue as well, because you and I um, obviously agree on so many things. Um, you know, if you would like to stay on, that would be so appreciated if you have the chance. And um, I wanted to introduce um, to everyone our amazing panelists for- I think I'm gonna have to sign off, but okay. thanks. Sorry, thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, and uh, we wanted to make sure that we um, introduce our panelists. Um, the first one is our amazing friend, Andy Morrison, with uh, the New Economy Project. Um, he has spoken on our panel many times um, on regarding uh, economic justice. And I wanted to say thank you and welcome back. Uh, we wanted to welcome Jennifer Sun with uh, AFI. She's the ED there. Um, and you know, that's Asian Americans for Equality, who is working a lot with our small businesses from their recovery. Um, and also Ricky Silver with Empire State Invisible, who has been kind of one of the leaders on the budget justice conversation. I also wanted to um, give a moment before the panel starts to my friend Luke Wolf, who's representing Scott Springer's office and has been very, very supportive. So Luke, can you give a couple of seconds? Because we, we are running a little late, so. <laughs> Of course, I will keep this brief once again. My name is Luke Wolf. I'm with uh, City Controller Scott Stringer's office. I want to start by thanking uh, the assembly member for putting this together, but also for all of her tireless work, um, especially talking about this panel on economic justice. We could not ask for a better partner uh, fighting for that day in and day out. So we thank the assembly member for all of your incredible work fighting for economic justice um, at the state level and also here in the city as well. Um, and I just want to very briefly uh, touch upon some of the work our office has been doing. Uh, specifically around this economic justice issue, but also uh, to do with COVID more broadly. Um, so we've published two comprehensive reports during this time period focusing on COVID. The first is on who are the city's frontline health workers. And what we found was that the, are, um, the majority of them are women, many of them are immigrants, many of them are undocumented, many of them are low income. And we put together a whole package of steps the city does need to take to make sure that these people are supported. Um, we also did a second report outlining what are all the disparities that um, impact who is more deeply uh, affected by COVID. So looked at housing, health, air quality, food security, and all the other issues that we've seen across our city um, and which communities are more drastically impacted. And we also, once again, outlined a number of steps to remedy many of those disparities to make sure that during this crisis um, and going forward, we can build a stronger and more stable economy for everyone across the city. Um, Another thing that we did this week was we uh, have start, launched a campaign um, through our labor law department calling for uh, a number of workers to be given the unclaimed funds and the unclaimed wages, which they've earned, but they have not been given. Uh, so we have millions of dollars that um, we have claimed over the years, uh, and we are making a really concerted effort to make sure that money ends up back in workers' hands, because this is money that they work for, they earn, but they did not end up receiving. So our labor uh, law and labor outreach departments are putting that campaign in motion right now to make sure that happens. One other thing I want to talk about is, of course, as the coronavirus crisis is ongoing, we still have the climate change crisis ongoing as well. And last week was Earth Week, so we took a number of steps uh, around Earth Week and climate justice too. The first thing is we called on all the major insurance companies to um, stop their business with the coal industry, which is poisoning our planet and really has been... Um, a horrible fender and making sure that future generations uh, are not given the climate that they need um, and the environment that they need. The second is we led a successful vote no campaign against a JP Morgan director um, who had a history of climate denialism. They wanted to put this individual in a um, very senior position and we led in a vote no campaign. So that person did not end up getting the position, uh, which is very important. We don't have uh, climate deniers in those positions of power. Um, number three, we call for the stoppage of construction of the Keystone Pipeline, uh, which is a um, 
right now an unnecessary and dangerous construction to do. Uh, so we've taken a number of steps related to Earth Week and continuing to focus on the overall climate justice movement as we are also focusing on the coronavirus uh, crisis as well. So once again, I want to thank the uh, assembly member for all of her amazing work. Um, and I'm looking forward to listening to this panel with all the uh, other great advocates as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, again, um, just kind of highlight the fact that in Chinatown, our small businesses really felt the economic impacts of COVID-19 uh, long before the rest of the state um, with the business district that really depends heavily on the restaurant industry and foot traffic um, to bring in revenue. Our Chinatown businesses uh, and our Chinatown business owners all across my district really kind of were devastated by COVID-19 and, um, and also the second epidemic that we need to face and deal with, um, which is racism, um, xenophobia, and um, anti-Asian uh, sentiment. And we know that with you know, there's no clear end in sight and there's a long recovery head. Even though we were hit the hardest, we're gonna have the hardest time recovering as well. Um, and uh, we have to ensure that, you know, we have the resources and that we can stay afloat. Um, many of my residents in my district have been laid off, furloughed, um, left without resources to support themselves and their families. They're having a hard time even applying for um, benefits, um, for unemployment. They can't even get onto the line. Um, you know, a lot of folks cannot pay rent. A lot of people cannot pay for um, very basic food items, services, etc. This is, you know, not, you know, folks who, um, you know, who, you know, have even traditionally been um, needing SNAP benefits, unemployment benefits, et cetera. It's just folks just are in a very different scenario right now. And we must at all levels of government really implement more efficient and effective support networks for those who are the most vulnerable in this pandemic. Um, we've, uh, you know, we've seen some good things in the budget. Um, obviously one of the biggest wins for myself personally um, was uh, the CDFI fund was finally funded. Um, we've been fighting for that for a very, very long time, but obviously, um, Funding it now um, and funding it three years ago is a very large difference. If we had funded it three years ago, we would have built a very large um, network and uh, we would have been able to have a very large pipeline um, to help people to get the help that they need um, from our community financial development institutions um, in order to be that pipeline for like things like PPP and we would have been able to um, dole things out a lot fairer than I think that the big banks would have done um, and I think that you know we need to um, talk a little bit about um, some of the things that weren't funded um, and things that weren't not were not raised um, because right now um, you know obviously we do not do uh, any revenue raising. Um, our budget had no revenue raisers and we desperately needed to make sure that we raised revenue um, in this time to be able to uh, fund things that we had talked about earlier, which is like healthcare and um, things that we're gonna talk about later, which is like education. And uh, we desperately, desperately needed that social safety net that we, um, that, you know, are, are basically um, the things that are keeping um, folks alive now and uh, you know we haven't had any of the help on the federal level that we needed uh, we haven't had any of the help on the state level that we had hoped to be able to bring in with our budget and um, and now we're very very um, much making a choice uh, to um, to let things hurt people um, rather than taking um, or cushioning the blow on the government level and so I think that, you know, this is a long time, this is much, very much a discussion that we need to have. And um, today we have some amazing folks to discuss that right now. Um, one of the things that uh, we wanted to kind of start with, I guess, is um, some of the uh, impacts of unemployment, some of the things that um, have been hitting uh, the economy and uh, some of the trickle down and down that our budget is going to um, cause. So I, I'll start with um, uh, Ricky on the on the budget justice agenda, and then I'll go to Andy to look at some of the things that we are um, hoping to, to um, I guess, or some of the domino effect things that are happening. And then we'll go to uh, Jennifer to talk about um, some of the small business um, things that we're seeing already. Um, and then some of the uh, residential and community things that we're seeing on the ground level. So um, I'm gonna mute you, Jennifer, and I'm gonna allow Ricky to have be unmuted. So Ricky, go ahead. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Um, yeah, so as part of the very large and sort of statewide budget justice coalition, 
we've been uh, working with the assembly member and a number of other allies in the assembly and the Senate pushing for uh, the need to raise additional revenue at the state level um, to fund the services and the critical needs of our communities. These needs existed prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we had, we were and, and remain ranked number one in inequality as a state. And so the need to raise revenue, um, asking the wealthiest New Yorkers to chip in more uh, to ensure that our state um, would reverse that devastating inequality was really critical. And when the pandemic hit, um, we've seen ultimately the uh, issues of that inequality come, uh, you know, totally laid bare in terms of how devastating um, the circumstances are for people that have been left behind by um, our state government and quite frankly, our federal government. And so um, in, the, in the moment, um, sort of in response to what, what happened at the budget, we were very disappointed to see the lack of a willingness to discuss additional revenue raisers to offset um, uh, the shortfalls that we know that the pandemic is causing. Um, but we continue to push and we continue to fight um, to make that case. Um, we know there are major shortfalls uh, due to the pandemic. And so now more than ever, do we need to see uh, our state government, the governor in particular, support um, the, the need to ri uh, raise more revenue. Separately, I wanna stress that right now, um, there are billions and billions and billions of dollars flowing through the federal government, more money than um, we've ever seen, uh, attempting to respond to the crisis. The initial attempts to do so, the first three stimulus packages, um, had some important um, um, and necessary uh, funding measures that made its way to New York, but fell woefully short to address the crisis on the ground. Um, and so at the same time, the same coalition is now fighting for what we're calling the people's recovery to really push to ensure that the funds that are coming from the federal government make their way directly to the people that need it, um, that are uh, meant to address the um, crises we're seeing uh, of affordability, of a lot loss of income. Um, the, we've already had a homelessness crisis in this state, in this city in particular, um, and that is only accelerating. And so I'm happy to talk a little bit more about how folks can get involved, but we'd love to pass it off to the other panelists as well. Uh, so I'm going to call on Andy next. Great. So it's uh, great to be here, and I hope everyone is um, staying as healthy and safe as they can under the circumstances. And uh, I'm at New Economy Project. Um, we've worked uh, closely with Assemblymember New on a number of efforts and really appreciate her leadership on economic justice. It's uh, tremendous, and certainly um, she uh, rises above uh, many, many of her peers in this regard, doing really good work on economic justice in New York State for New Yorkers. Um, I guess, you know, thinking about some of the comments that were made around the lack of revenues, uh, revenue raisers, two of them that were really good that uh, we would have liked to have seen is taxes on Wall Street. Um, one of the assembly members' bill, bills would have taxed uh, stock buybacks, which kind of manufacture inflated stock prices that really go to share, go to CEOs so that they can take more of the pie um, as if they don't have enough already. And then there's um, another one that would have put a tax on very modest tax on stock transfers, which the state already collects and then, and then returns back. Um, so it kind of makes no sense and would have meant billions and billions and billions of dollars. And I think, um, from our perspective, when you look at the behavior of the banks in this crisis, um, it's really appalling what the big banks have been up to. For example, um, with the paycheck protection, uh, particip uh, the paycheck protection loans that the federal government made available to small businesses, some of the biggest banks participating were kind of rigging the system instead of taking small businesses on a first come first serve basis, as you would expect they would, they were kind of cherry picking the biggest loans for the businesses that maybe weren't the hardest hit 
um, because that's where the biggest that's fees like were. The VIPs, the, the yes. VIP suites. <laughs> exactly. It's almost like, yeah, almost like having like a little VIP line that they got to cut in front of everybody else. Um, and, and that's just one example. Um, there were examples of banks garnishing stimulus checks um, from, from people who had gotten their stimulus checks, which obviously people desperately need funds in this moment. And if they had had a negative balance on their account, for whatever reason, the banks were using it, using the opportunity to take that money from them in this moment, if you can imagine that. Um, and so that kind of brings me to what I, what I really wanted to start off with in terms of the domino effect that the assembly member touched on um, at the opening is what at New Economy Project, we have a financial justice hotline. And um, I'll give the number out a couple times, 212-925-4929. And uh, it's a free legal services line for low-income New Yorkers. And we do our best to help people when they're experiencing, whether it's predatory lending or abusive debt collection. And uh, what we've been seeing over the past month or so is that many, many New Yorkers are having their wages garnished or their um, bank accounts frozen by debt collectors. And so people who, and we, we've created a story bank where we're sort of chronicling New Yorkers stories, firsthand accounts of what they're going through in this moment. And we're finding that people will go to the store to buy food or personal protective equipment or medicine and they try to use their debit card and they suddenly find out that there's a, there's a lien on their bank account because of a debt. And so we've been calling on the governor to use his emergency powers, which are broad, to put a, put a hold on debt collection. And, um, and it doesn't need, it needs to be even beyond the crisis because getting to the domino effect, we're just at the beginning of what's going to be a unspeakable crisis for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of low-income New Yorkers. It's, and, and as we know, the communities of color throughout the city have been hardest hit. And so um, we really need to be thinking big about how to address this and how we can uh, support low income and communities of color throughout the city. So that's been our perspective um, from, from what we've seen through our hotline especially. And um, I'll leave it there. I know we wanna to get to CDFIs and there's a number of other things in the budget to discuss, um, but wanted to start, kick it off with that. Thank you um, for mentioning the, uh, the, the canceled debt of a uh, whole agenda on that front because um, we've also seen a lot of folks who in the middle of having to stay home, get their um, debit cards and their credit cards completely canceled and completely um, uh, frozen. And so it's very, very difficult for folks to have no access to a way to be able to even order anything online or anything like that. So it's very, very difficult. And thank you so much, Andy, for bringing that up. Um, next is Jennifer Sun. Hi, Eileen. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this conversation today. So thanks for having me. Um, so I'm the co-executive director of Asian Americans for Equality, a community-based organization um, with offices in Manhattan, Chinatown, Jackson Heights, and Flushing. Um, and we also have a small business CDFI, or Community Development Financial Institution. And um, through that experience of operating a CDFI, we've really experienced both the real disparities in how the federal program um, and financial assistance to small businesses was very inequitable in its first round, um, and how important community-based organizations are in being able to provide culturally and linguistically appropriate services to really connect um, financial assistance to those who need it most. Um, I also want to really acknowledge the assembly members' you know, particular focus and advocacy on behalf of CDFIs. Um, I will say that, you know, I think as the assembly member acknowledged, um, uh, Asian small businesses have been feeling the impact of the pandemic since late January, um, really around Chinese New Year when a lot of the news of the pandemic in China began to really hit our, um, our shores. There was a really sharp decline in revenue for businesses in hospitality, um, food restaurants, retail, wholesale, travel, um, really sort of across all of the sectors that are the backbone 
of the economies of neighborhoods um, across the city. Um, you know, over half of the people who are employed um, in our city are employed by small businesses. And we know from our clients um, at Renaissance EDC that over 50% of them are actually in the accommodations, food retail um, business and wholesale business. And so we really saw immediately sort of the significant economic impact that Asian small businesses had um, with both the decline in foot traffic, um, but also in um, a lot of decline in even local residential support um, for small business activity. And so it had both an upstream effect um, with their supply chains, as well as um, in direct to consumer sales. Um, and so, you know, because of the advocacy of the assembly member and other elected officials, um, I think in the second round of the um, PPP program, there was a broader recognition of how important CDFIs would be in making sure that the federal assistance really got to small business owners. And so we were happy to see that there was a greater allocation of the PPP funding that was being provided to CDFIs for disbursement. But I'll say that even in the week that we've been um, you know, dispersing funds directly as a PPP lender, it's been really frustrating still to work with the federal government. Um, their website crashed. It was really hard to even be able to upload um, applications and the approval process was really, really slow. And so I think it's also really exposed how the lack of investment at the federal government in their own IT infrastructure um, and in their processes for being able to provide access in um, you know, the most streamlined way possible um, it's also another big area um, that needs to be a, a, a focus as you know, elected officials continue to think about beyond the immediate um, recovery, sort of longer term investment that needs to happen, both in community development organizations, in cities, um, but also in um, you know, IT infrastructure at the federal level too. So I wanted to also mention, um, so thank you, Jennifer, from, for, uh, uh, talking a little bit about CDFIs. I just wanted to go over it for folks um, who are at home and uh, don't know exactly what the acronym means. A CDFI is a Community Development Financial Institution and actually the history of it's very cool. Um, there's a couple of articles out there. Um, my friend Oscar wrote one and you guys should look it up actually, but the um, the the history of it is that New York State actually is one of the only states in the entire nation that has its own New York State CDFI fund um, infrastructure that is already kind of out there but but we have never funded it and so this is the first year that we funded it in this budget it was 25 million dollars which um is like a little tiny pool of money that will actually make it so that there's money for the um that it actually just needs to sit there what it needs to do is just sit there so that our credit unions our cdfis can grow and make sure that they have something to be able to lend off of Right. So it's not even like the money itself has to be lent out. It has to be like lent off of. And it, it's supposed to be something that will help them to be able to expand and grow their network. And so if we had had that network in, you know, the, the years that we it, that we had advocated for it, it would have grown and really been robust by that time. But now, I mean, still, our CDFIs are functioning at an incredible level. I think that, you know, we still have the infrastructure to be able to do, um, you know, the community outreach that's needed um, to get you know, the, the, the funding and the, um, you know, and, and the uh, federal dollars to the places that we need, no, we know that it needs to go. But at the same time, you know, I think that it'll be, um, it'll be very, very difficult to, uh, uh, to scale up the way that we hope that it would in this short runway of time. Um, I think that, uh, you know, right now, it's, it's good that we funded it for the first time. But obviously, we need to be more forced, uh, you know, I guess, foresight oriented in our budget processes. Um, I also wanted to kind of go back to Ricky a little bit and talk about revenue raisers. And I also wanted to talk about how uh, right now our like a lot of folks in my district have seen price gouging. Um, there's been a lot of consumer protection issues that have happened. Um, there's been predatory lenders that have been out there who have been growing massively and and benefiting greatly off of um, the backs of the poorest and the most vulnerable people because uh, people are getting desperate for um, keeping a roof over their heads right now and people are getting desperate for getting uh, food on their table and people are getting desperate for um, making ends meet in a time 
when um, most there's the most unemployment that we've ever experienced. And so I think that, you know, we need to um, to have that discussion about what are some of the things that are going on that are predatory, some of the things that our seniors are going through, and some of the things that need to be stopped, uh, you know, collection agency wise, et cetera. And I'm going to hit that with Andy, but let's talk about uh, revenue raisers and possibilities with Ricky right now. Yeah, and I'll say also just in terms of what the community is going through, in some ways it's been inspiring to watch the sort of mutual aid type networks that have been built up and the volunteer base that's coming in. But what I think we all need to recognize is the, the fact that there is such a gaping hole uh, for the needs that are there right now suggests that the system was broken before. Um, the system was not prepared to manage this type of a crisis. People were always already struggling. Um, and so I, I'm, I've personally, uh, every, every moment of inspiration has been met with just despair as we've watched these networks build up because they're simply not sufficient. Um, and so thinking of it designed this way, that it's not right. broken, it's yeah, working. <laughs> <It's designed. laughs> the other thing um, that, that, you know, I think is a good reference point or like a jumping off point for that is, is thinking about foresight is, you know, we, like, I, like I mentioned, the, the need for revenue existed prior to the pandemic. The need to address uh, the fact that the state was number one in inequality it was there before. And so I think in terms of the opportunities ahead, um, the, the, the ability to uh, raise revenue, um, we've heard a couple from Andy earlier from, for example, Wall Street type taxes, but there's a number of taxes out there with that target the very uh, top earners in the state and ask them simply to pay a little bit more. So for example, there's an ultra millionaires tax being proposed that's been out. Actually, the assembly has supported it in the past. And uh, for whatever reason, we simply haven't been able to get it over the finish line, which would uh, adjust the, um, the brackets only on the highest earning potentials. There's a, a few different versions of that out there. For example, though, if you make more than $5 million, the bracket above that $5 million would go up. Um, and, you know, uh, unfortunately, the governor suggested that, um, you know, that would be impossible to do in a moment like this. But if you're earning more than $5 million still today, surely there's an opportunity for you to chip in more to make sure our state has what it needs. Uh, there's other taxes out there that have been proposed, like, for example, a pied a terre tax that would um, uh, tax second homes, uh, you know, over, you know, millions of dollars in, in, in worth that, again, would drive billions of dollars over all this package that we've been talking about, the Budget Justice Coalition. So um, there's a number of options out there uh, as an activist and, and speaking to those on the call all that are community members, what I'd say is, you know, it, it's not ultimately up to us to determine the exact solution. Um, obviously, we do our part um, in the coalition to work with legislators uh, like you lean to come up with the right policy, but we need to see urgency um, from our elected officials on this issue. Um, uh, Assemblymember Mew has been phenomenal at creating that urgency, um, but we need to see it from the others and we need to see a willingness to go back and address it head on. Um, one thing I also want to flag or just discuss openly, and um, uh, I think there was a question in the chat about this, was sort of we know the budget process is is one in which our legislators uh, have a lot less power than they should. Um, and curious, that, you know, we can certainly discuss that what needs to happen longer term. Um, but I think the question I would sort of pose is in this moment where the legislators really have the power to go back and and advance. Uh, new revenue opportunities. We know it's possible that maybe the governor doesn't agree with those things, but I I'd like to see, and uh, again, I'm grateful for uh, uh, Assemblymember News allyship on this, but I'd like to see the legislature do their job and, and actually push through additional revenue raisers in the moment. Uh, public school education is a great point to think about what's going to happen long term, right? We have short term immediate needs right now, there's no question, um, but the, uh, the, the cuts that are being discussed to the public school system because of the lack of revenue right now will have impact for decades and decades, right? The same thing that happened in the healthcare system um, that led to this pandemic is, is, you know, we're on the precipice of the public education system uh, if these cuts go through. So the reason we weren't equipped to manage the pandemic at the healthcare, uh, in the healthcare system was largely because we had been cutting our healthcare system for the last decade, right? And so 
uh, said it, whoever said it perfectly, uh, whoever said it, said it perfectly, we need foresight. Uh, we also need some urgency. And so um, I know we're lucky to have some of our new who has both of those things, um, but hopefully more of our colleagues come to the table on that. Um, and Andy, I know that I wanted to talk, have you talk a little bit about consumer protection and some of the predatory practices that have been going on, but I also wanted to add in um, a little bit on what Ricky was saying, um, because there was a question in the uh, chat um, about how we've been highlighting the real need to, well, I, this is directed to me, obviously, and, and it says, Assembly Member, you've been highlighting the real need to raise revenue, and we are so appreciative of the public stance you've taken around this issue. We know that one of the biggest problems is that the governor has a lot of control over the budget process. Um, Assembly Member Gottfried is carrying a bill that would amend the Constitution to give the legislature more power during this process. Senators Biagi, Scoopis, and Rivera are carrying it in the Senate. It'll take a few years in order to get this enacted. Do you support this effort? Yes, I'm on the bill. And um, I don't know if they put my name on it because they're taking a long time to process those gold slips right now, but um, the, the answer is yes, I'm on bill. And do you have any thoughts on what we can do in the meantime to get the governor on board to raise revenue? And I would say that um, that's a much tougher question. And I think that the answer is actually all of the folks who are here and all of the folks who are at home right now um, and on the ground, uh, because I think that we really need to make sure that um, he's held accountable to raising revenue and ask him to. I mean, I've had millionaires call him. We've had, <laughs> we've had millionaires calling his office, telling him to tax them. And, and I'm not really sure what else we can do on that front. Um, and then somebody asked, uh, how will we avoid a veto from the governor on that bill? Will it take a Senate supermajority? I think that, you know, there's a lot of uh, different answers on that front um, on the process, but um, there is, I mean, a possibility that he would veto it and it will take two thirds of the entire legislature to um, override a veto, just an FYI. Um, those are just technical questions, but uh, I don't know um, how, <laughs> how to better answer it without um, getting too political on that front. Um, but the thing is, uh, the, there is that possibility. And then there is the fact that, you know, two thirds majority can override a veto from the governor. Um, Andy, consumer protection and uh, scary predatory lending stuff that's going on. Sure. And I, I'll get, I'll definitely um, touch on all of that. I wanted to just start by getting back to this issue of foresight because um, we've been talking a lot about that in our work at New Economy Project, where we focus so much on institution building, as well as the work to challenge systems of um, exploitation, financial exploitation, particularly on low income communities of color. And, um, but with our work on institution building, it's sort of a moment where you think, as, as the assembly member was saying before, boy, if we had, got, if we had gotten that CDFI fund funded you know, when the assembly member was um, doing a lot of work on it years ago with us, um, those institutions would be in better shape right now. And um, by the way, a CDFI is sort of like, one of the things we like about them is a lot of them are community controlled or in some cases community owned, like the one in assembly member news district, the Lower East Side People's Federal Credit Union. It's a, co it's a financial cooperative. So they're, they, f they function the way banks should function, but don't. With the CDFI, like the Lower East Side Peoples, you have responsible financial services, a place where people can save their, save their money, and an institution that actually roots wealth locally. So it's keeping the money circulating in the community instead of Wall Street banks, which um, use tactics like overdraft protection, um, which sucks billions and billions and billions of dollars from their lowest income customers. If you, ta if you tallied up the interest rate, for example, and this is something people are experiencing right now in the worst possible time, um, it would be 17,000% interest. Um, of course, the Wall Street banks have succeeded in having overdraft protection be considered something other than a loan. So it's not subject to some of the, some of the um, interest rate protections. Uh, but can you imagine in this moment um, getting hit with that kind of a, a fee? Um, and they collect, again, tens of billions of dollars. And the vast majority of the fees come from the lowest income customers. So that's the world we have. We have rampant debt collection, a rancid in industry that preys on the 
most vulnerable people in communities. We have Wall Street banks which refuse to serve people and in fact are using this opportunity to exploit many small businesses. Um, and because of those, because we didn't address these things years ago, now these problems are obviously worse than they might have been had we been getting CDFIs more robust and able to serve more New Yorkers. If we had been working on public banking and making, a, making public banking a reality, if we had been <laughs> working on many of these issues. So that's something that's very much um, something we're paying attention to. And I just wanna again, plug our financial justice hotline. Cause if you are experiencing anything, if you're a low income New Yorker who's, who's getting letters in the mail from a debt collector or your um, wages have been garnished or your bank account's been frozen, uh, we might be able to help you. If you've um, gotten a charge, you're not, you don't understand from your bank or you've, you've somehow took out a loan um, that was predatory. Um, these are the kinds of things that our legal team can support and help you with. So again, the number is 212-925-4929. Uh, 212-925-4929. Amazing. Thank you, Andy. Um, and also, I just wanted to add a plug that um, for price gouging, the AG does have a hotline for us. It's been very, very helpful in helping to get cases investigated as well. Um, just uh, for folks' information, my staff will stick that into the chat. Um, and this is a question right before I get back to Jennifer on um, how small business can get back up. Um, I'm gonna, uh, there was a person who asked and, oh, it's Tommy, <laughs> my favorite. Um, so I didn't say that out loud. I don't play favorites. Yes, I do. Um, but we are, we are told there is billions of dollars that could be raised by legalizing cannabis. What is holding this up, particularly when additional revenue is desperately needed and everyone seems to agree? I'm gonna go to Ricky on that one. Uh, I, I, you might know a little bit more on the, the ins and outs. My, my understanding of it. I'll talk about the ins and outs. I will talk about the ins and outs. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's true that the ability to legalize cannabis could bring in um, a much needed revenue. The biggest issue is that um, what do we do with those revenues and how do we set up um, a legal cannabis uh, industry that recognizes the sort of systemic racism that um, uh, has led to the over policing of black and brown communities uh, has led to a uh, tremendous amount of disparity in, um, in, in arrests and sentencing on, on you know, basic use of marijuana. Um, and other states have gone way too quick on this and have made really, uh, uh, have set up the industry, the revenue comes in and has never addressed and actually dealt with uh, the systemic issues that there, uh, were there uh, from the get-go. So I know a number of the discussions are around how to one is the industry get set up to account for that. Two, how do the dollars go actually go back into the communities that need it and have been um, most impacted um, by the prohibition of marijuana? And ultimately, my understanding, and again, uh, assembly member, you, you will be able to speak from the inside perspective. My understanding is that that has never uh, been fully agreed upon, uh, both within the legislature and, and the governor's office. So it is a shame. Um, two years now in a row with a democratic majority where other states uh, continue to lap us on this issue. Certainly uh, seems like we should have solved this uh, by now, but curious uh, your perspective, assembly member. Um, I, I actually, you, you, you are very good about um, putting these uh, bullet points together, but I think one of the biggest things also is that there was no actual, um, uh, I guess, uh, system for mo like the monetary portion of it and actually I suggested that CDFI would be a very good system for it and um, I actually think that um, this is a very good connector and you can actually speak on this a little bit because there was a lot of research done on it and um, we actually um, feel like that's one of the best ways to be able to um, put the right mechanisms in place that you were talking about to be able to collect and to disperse revenue and I think that um, you know it was very interesting uh, that this uh, discussion uh, wasn't had because we actually uh, had gotten so close. Um, I wanna say last year we were the closest we've ever been to legalizing marijuana. Um, but I think that there are a lot of different issues that other legislators had brought up. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I feel like, you know, it's a no brainer. It, I mean, I don't even think that it's very politically uh, difficult anymore. Um, I think that it was something that um, we've seen other states do uh, over and over again now. And, um, you know, we just, 
we also didn't have, like you were saying, Ricky, that, that the, the mechanical arm for it. And so Andy, you can answer a little bit to it um, yeah. as, we're, as we're going, but. And Andy, I, don't, I hope you don't mind. I just would jump in with one other thing, which would be this sort of goes back to the conversation around the budget process and how um, this, this probably shouldn't be done within a budget negotiation where the legislature doesn't have a ton of responsibility or uh, power. So, you know, I think we'd love to see um, this worked on outside of the budget process and really make sure we set it up for success. I mean, the only thing I can add, and we worked with the Start Smart Coalition, um, led by Drug Policy Alliance, which is really an amazing group that did, has been doing amazing work on this. And I think um, paramount is that, that there's a real meaningful equity provision um, in, the, in whatever does get passed eventually. And I think that's been a, that's been an issue. Uh, it's been a good point for sure, because um, Crystal People Stokes has a very good equity agenda on it, but um, on the Senate side and on the governor's side, I believe that there's been more um, difficulty in reaching that same point, I, and especially on the governor's side. Yeah, Andy, that was a good point. Yeah. So, and that, I know that's for us, and we're, you know, obviously taking our lead from the start folks, others in the Start Smart Coalition who've been leading the way and, and Drug Policy Alliance, but that's been um, key that if we're gonna, you know, after all the harm that's been inflicted on communities of color because of our just heinous drug laws, um, that those communities need to be prioritized. And that's where the CDFIs come in, um, although it's not the only thing that can be done to make sure those communities are prioritized. CDFIs are already stationed in those communities. Many of them are stationed in those communities. They make responsible loans to those communities. So if we wanna make sure there's real opportunity for entrepreneurship in communities that have been most harmed by uh, uh, criminalization of cannabis, um, they could help ensure that those communities are prioritized and that um, we don't just have big conglomerates coming in and profiteering off of the new market. Amazing. And uh, Jennifer, to close us out for this panel. Jennifer, are you there? Oh, I, oh you were muted, sorry. Jennifer, uh, you're going to give us the closing on um, how we can get out of this. Yeah, so thinking ahead about the long path for small businesses to recover from this, I think the access to capital that CDFIs provide um, in really working and providing direct technical assistance to immigrant small business owners and helping them, you know, renegotiate commercial leases. Um, even, you know, working with the city in potentially having to operate differently in order to, to practice social distancing in order to be able to reopen um, and have their operations active again. I would envision that there's a need for, again, sort of access to capital and also working closely with the city in streamlining any permitting processes that could get in the way of small businesses being able to adapt to a very different operating environment. Um, I think another key thing is thinking about the role of small um, private landlords in a lot of these ethnic neighborhoods. Many of them play a por an important role in community ownership of assets um, in immigrant neighborhoods and actually want a lot of these small businesses to be successful, to you know, be in their neighborhoods as tenants. But small private landlords also face operating costs like insurance, um, you know, property taxes, and mortgages. And we're finding that a lot of um, small private commercial landlords also need te technical assistance in understanding how to negotiate um, forbearances um, with mortgages that they owe. Um, and that also property tax reform is something that the city needs to continue to follow through on. Um, there was a lot of inequities that we had hoped that property tax reform would address, where a lot of you know, luxury residential and commercial developers have received huge property tax abatements, um, whereas a lot of smaller residential and commercial landlords have you know, paid a, an inordinate amount of the cost. And, the and so it's very, very red lines. Yeah. And so I think it's also just remembering sort of the upstream relationship between small businesses and their landlords and the additional financial relief that's necessary, but making sure that if we do provide, you know, property tax abatements, let's say to commercial 
landlord that that benefit is then passed on directly to tenants as well. But really focusing on creating the conditions for small businesses to either reopen or for new businesses to start as well. And recognizing that, you know, in a post COVID reality, you know, food retail and retail businesses are not going to be able to do the same level and volume of traffic as they were before. So their overall revenue is going to be lower than what they were receiving. And so that's going to have, you know, a domino effect again on the ability, on the amount of rent they can pay, on the amount of debt that they can service. Um, and so I think overall, we need to think about an environment that provides as much sort of financial relief, flexibility and affordability as possible for small businesses to still take the risk of either reopening or starting up again. Uh, that goes back to also bringing up my bills again on um, commercial rent forgiveness, residential rent forgiveness, and uh, mortgage forgiveness for um, commercial and residents. And also to uh, make sure that there is a fund for small landlords specifically to be able to recuperate um, uh, when, when uh, they're lost when uh, a third or more of their uh, tenants can't pay. And I think that's really important uh, because, you know, all of all of the things that you just mentioned um, for us to make sure that there is something for our small landlords and for our commercial uh, businesses uh, to be able to be covered. Um, because right now uh, th there's, it, there's such a small runway for some of these businesses. Mm -hmm and they've already ran out. And so mm -hmm. I think that it's really important that we're talking about that. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to point out was that there are some predatory practices that are happening uh, against um, some of these commercial um, uh, uh, commercial small businesses um, uh, their, and their leases. And I think that there's some things that uh, we need to address on that level as well. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to say again, thank you so much to Jennifer and to Ricky and to Andy for joining us today. And also for um, bringing up some of these very important topics uh, for folks to consider and think about. Um, we can't, obviously, uh, we can't uh, answer everything, but there are so many things that we need to be doing that we didn't do um, in our budget. Uh, we should have been, you know, cushioning the blow for our communities, and we have not. And, um, and, and I think that, you know, all of the topics you raised today are, are exactly the things that we should be changing and doing. So thank you again. Thanks for having us. You know thank you. Thank you. Bye. Um, and now we wanted to start our uh, panel on uh, civil rights and criminal justice. Um, we are running a little bit late, but um, so I apologize to our panelists and thank you so much for your patience. Um, we have um, some amazing panelists for you today. One of my favorites uh, is uh, my community mom, Joanne Peter, uh, she's the director of American um, We also have um, uh, Jared from uh, the Brooklyn Defender Services, I believe. And then there's also Aaron Lee George from Citizen Action of New York. I wanted to say thank you all for being here. Um, I think that we might be expecting somebody from Bookful, um, but I think that we may have um, had a scheduling issue because of our delay. So um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us. Um, some of the budget highlights that I think that we've already kind of mentioned, but I wanted to kind of again our panels are, are always shifting with the panels um, because of the issues that people care about. And I wanted to also, again, have my staff put in the budget cheat sheet for everyone so that you can follow along um, because it is very uh, convoluted and we're very well known for our budget cheat sheet. So um, if we can make sure that folks have that uh, and, and I'm just gonna go over a couple of the highlights of this year's budget and some of the things that shouldn't have been in there but were. Um, and so in the uh, fiscal year 2021 budget, uh, measures were passed to remove guns from domestic abusers by authorizing police officers responding to family uh, to a family offense to temporarily take custody of firearms under certain circumstances. Um, the other thing is, uh, additionally, the budget restores $4.2 million for uh, assistance uh, uh, fund LSAF um, in support of civil and criminal legal services grants. Um, also, uh, the fiscal year 2020-21 budget includes $4.2 million for the Legal Services Fund and $16.1 million for, I'm sorry, uh, Nick, I'm going to, um, 
sorry, so, and, and $16.1 million for various legal services, including funding for the New York State Defenders Association, prisoners, legal services, and domestic violence related civil and criminal legal service providers. Um, this budget also expanded the list of crimes that are eligible for a judge to set cash bail, which includes manslaughter, aggravated vehicular assault, sex trafficking, money laundering for terrorism, and first degree grand larceny. Um, this budget removes guns from domestic abusers, prevents individuals who commit certain crimes in other states from legally attaining firearms, creates a new class of felony for domestic acts of terrorism motivated by hate and allows judges to ban repeat sex offenders from mass transit for three years. Um, I just wanted to specifically say for our district, there were a couple of things that um, we really care about and that one of the biggest is that this year's budget rolls back hard fought criminal justice uh, reforms by extending the time for prosecutors to provide initial discovery to 20 days when the defendant is in custody and to 35 days when a defendant is not in custody. Um, there are a couple of other things that we wanted to mention, but I'm going to leave that to our panelists, our distinguished panelists, and um, make sure that uh, folks um, can can get a word in. So uh, I'm going to start with Joanne Yu, um, the ED of Asian American Federation. Joanne, can you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the things that were in this budget that you liked and some of the things that you didn't like and then the things that you feel like um, are, are uh, hurtful to our communities um, regarding criminal justice reform? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, Joanne Yu, Executive Director of the Asian American Federation. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I went outside for a hot five minutes today to go, to go to Staples to go pick up a printer and I realized what a beautiful day it was and that we had spent the entire spring inside. Um, but I'm also really grateful that I'm at a place where um, I'm safe and um, it's great to see all of you. Um, so, you know, I don't want to, I'm going to tell you that I don't, um, I don't have all the points of the, the specific points of the budget uh, that I need, I want to, uh, share and where, you know, where I dis agree with, where I disagree with. But I want to tell you what the challenges are in the community. And that is um, around immigration and legal services for the Asian American community. My God, I mean, how many years have I been saying this? Um, there isn't a system available for our community to have easy access to affordable attorneys. And so the Asian American community con continues to have in New York City it's the Indian, Chinese, and Bangladeshi community that has the highest rate of deportation. Um, there, you know, it's not the fact that, you know, and then now we have public charge uh, put in there. So um, people who are eligible now more than ever, people who need to go on public assistance, not because of immigration status, but they're fearful that, you know, use of public benefits will jeopardize a green card or a citizenship. They're foregoing life-saving programs. So, um, you know, we are seeing budget cuts everywhere, state and city. I mean, I need ultimately everybody I talk to in every forms of government, you know, I'm realizing we're broke. Um, we don't have money and we, this is a reality. And, but I think the thing that we need to think about and how do we work with our legislators and push our leaders is, well, what is the priority? How are we gonna prioritize um, what the essential programs are. Um, you know, I think about, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, um, now we're heading into week eight, and I think a lot about, you know, what kind of world do I wanna see when we come out, right? And, and you, Lena, and I have talked about this. Um, the fact that, like, you know, it's, this is pretty harsh, but all the essential workers worked, and all the people who were not essential workers uh, stayed home, and got to stay home and order stuff deliver to us, right? And so, you know, as much as I always tell people, like, as much as there are times when I think, oh, you're doing really good work, and you know, you're, you know, you're important. I speak for essential workers, but I'm not an essential worker. You know, those essential workers had to get up in the morning and go to work to put food on the table. And that was the reality. Um, and I think what I think about in the budget, I think about um, how society looks at this. I mean, this is, the first of many, many pandemics to come. This is not going to be something that is, you know, a one-time deal. I think what we're really going to see is how, you know, what we need to think about is how do we really value the people who had to go to work? Um, you know, how do we really value the frontline workers? Because it's, you know, and as I've been telling everywhere I've been invited to speak, I keep saying, you know, the new normal is going to be everybody's going to rush out and they're going to do exactly what they did before because that feels normal, right? Because we've been all been stuck inside. 
but that cannot be the way it is. And this is an opportunity. It is a once in a lifetime opportunity for us to really re think about re and think about and do rebuilding society that really values the people who do the real jobs, you know, the undocumented immigrant, the low wage worker, you know, the working class people who didn't get to access tests. Look at all the people who died. It's the communities of color, the black, blacks and the Latinos. I heard Jennifer talk about, you know, the Asian American small businesses during a great period, you know, the period of the great recession, we contributed 40% of the small businesses, but I don't think we got the help that we needed, certainly because I know small businesses right now are planning to file bankruptcy. And that means, and they don't have the protections that big corporations do in every, we've got to turn this economy on its head. We need to figure out how do we stop, stop valuing like I've, you know, like this ivory tower, um, you know, the white collar office, you know, jobs. And, you know, how do we stop to like, put that on the pedestal and really say, you know who, you know who helped me during the pandemic? The grocery workers, the garbage collectors, the food delivery workers. And I say that because, you know, for two and a half years, I fought to legalize e-bikes. Um, and now, you know, as soon as we got them legalized, they, you know, they were, they were getting tickets, $500 tickets at a pop, at least, you know, three tickets a pop. And then, you know, like a week before, the pandemic hit, or and we were told to be on lockdown. They're no longer, um, you know, now they're deemed essential workers. It should not have taken a pandemic for them for us to say they are essential workers. They've always been essential workers. And you know what? I will tell you what enrages me is that uh, some of the people who probably called and said, "I don't want these people driving through my neighborhood," because as we know, most of the workers are Chinese and Latino men. People who complained about them. Um, probably benefited and ordered food from them. And so, you know, I want to call hypocrisy out. And until we truly come out of this as better people who really recognize who kept the city alive and fed and like all the, all the, my, you know, the gears moving while most of us stayed, got to, had the privilege of staying home. I think we need to, um, I think we need to, make some, we have to have some, you know, I think this is our proverbial come to Jesus moment, right? And how we, how we uh, deal with this and how we uh, embrace this reality, I think is going to speak volumes about who we are. So. Uh, thank you so much. You just like, oh, everything that you said, Joanne, obviously is like close to uh, heart and home. Um, I mean, I'm hearing stories of folks who our delivery workers and no PPEs were provided by, you know, any of the folks who they work for. Obviously, caviar is not out there holding out like PPEs for folks. And, you know, they're even charging them extra. They're taking their tips, you know, and it's just like some crazy stories that you're hearing out there. And on top of that, um, I had a couple of Asian American delivery workers who told me some really severely harsh racist stories of folks who didn't want an Asian American delivering to their home. One guy even spat into the eye of one of our workers. Uh, I just felt like that was disgusting and like just horrible. And, you know, as the district that, you know, faced 9-11, uh, Sandy, and on top of that, you know, the first to get hit by the racism of COVID, um, I just, I, I wanted to say that, you know, we are always out there like at seven o'clock applauding our essential workers. At, after 9-11, we, we appreciate all of our first responders, blah, blah, blah. But like, we don't actually consider we constantly forget after, you know, like afterwards. And, and we constantly forget to, you know, consider all of the things within policy and all of the things within our government budget that, that should be protecting our uh, workers and should be protecting people. Because right now, even as you're seeing the statistics of like, you know, I, we, I heard a really incredible uh, presentation actually by some NYU students, but it was, um, you know, the fact that s certain folks uh, with certain uh, level of college degree or no college degree, et cetera, like you can literally tell, um, you know, who was going to actually get infected and who wasn't like it was, it was crazy, the statistics and the, the way that people um, just ignore the facts that, you know, folks don't even have hazard pay, people are not getting, um, you know, health care, uh, you know, the folks who are taking the most risks have the least protections in our system. And that's just, 
the the end all and and i just wanted to say um thank you again joanne because you know uh i'm going to come back to you in a bit to talk about the liberty defense fund and what we funded and and how asian americans have gotten zero dollars from it before and we'll talk about that in a little bit but i wanted to hit up and and in, uh, and also um uh introduce the fact that young me is here and so is nick from Vocal. So Young Me's actually from Brooklyn Defender Services as well, but we didn't get to see her earlier. So I'm sorry I didn't get to say you, that you are on the uh, panel as well. And uh, Nick has just joined up from Vocal. And so um, I know that we have a couple of questions here today um, about some of the things that had happened um, in our budget. And so um, I'm just going to start off with, uh, I think I'm going to start off with Young Me because um, I think that you know, folks really want to talk about um, some of the, the things that have uh, changed regarding bail reform. And so if you can just kick that off, um, because we have a question here that says, what are um, some of your concerns and for your organizations that you have heard about with the new bail, bail reform and are they valid? And then if there are um, things that changed, isn't that good? So if you can answer that for us, thank you. Uh so hi everyone and thank you for inviting me to this uh, town hall. Um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a complicated question. Um, the reason why uh, we needed bail reform in New York State is, um, is very obvious. We had um, racial imbalance and inequities. Uh, it wasn't just about money. Um, and uh, the numbers were significant when uh, you looked at uh, the race population in, in jails throughout the state, not just New York City. Um, and there was a real need to, um, to level the playing field for everyone, not just in terms of bail, but also discovery. Uh, discovery applied to everyone, um, where the prosecutors had total control over the information uh, that no one else had access to. It's very difficult to defend a case, even when you're innocent, uh, when you don't have that kind of information where you don't even know what you're defending against. Um, so we, uh, we had a great new bail reform law uh, discovery uh, starting in January of 2020. And of course, because it's very politicized um, and because there is, uh, I hate to say it, sort of a racism factor going on out there. There was a lot of fear mongering, a huge fear mongering campaign, especially when it came to bail reforms. Uh, and of course, unfortunately, uh, there were some capitulations made and uh, we have more uh, people who are now eligible for bail should they get charged with uh, a crime, uh, more nonviolent felony charges um, that are also eligible for bail. Uh, and anytime you increase these sort of money bail buckets, of course you're going to get more incarceration, uh, which defeats the purpose of having bail reform. Um, so we're, uh, yes, we are very concerned about that. Um, I think one thing about this COVID crisis is when we're looking at resources uh, and how under uh, served and how the poor really have no voice uh, and they're not receiving services, this COVID crisis really highlights the lack of services um, where people uh, don't have places to live that are safe. Um, some judges think that it's okay to keep people at Rikers Island without a true understanding that when you're there, um, there's no ability to maintain social distancing. People are calling us, they're terrified from jail every day. Um, there's a lack of soap. Um, people can't definitely stay six feet away from each other. Um, and so it's just, uh, it's pretty appalling that in the midst of this crisis, uh, we have now more people who are eligible for detention and, and with the governor's executive order, uh, we're not even getting um, sort of the due process protections, uh, such as the right to a grand jury indictment or even what's called a preliminary hearing where a judge has to find probable cause if a case is going to continue or if you're going to remain detained uh, on a felony and for some misdemeanors as well. 
So uh, yes, we're very worried, uh, not just for the long term, but especially now uh, when we have this crisis going on and it's, it's really, really bad at Rikers Island. So thank you so much, young me. I'm gonna go to Jared next, or was it Aaron? Aaron, I don't know. Uh... Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to hop in. Um, I think we're, the four of us have spent a lot of time uh, working on this issue over the last few years. So I think, you know, can kind of go, go with flow. Um, so um, thank you for inviting me today. Um, for folks on the call, I work for Citizen Action. Um, we're a statewide grassroots organization um, with eight chapters and affiliates across the state. And uh, we work to um, advance racial justice and socioeconomic justice through uh, legislative work, electoral work at the local and, and the state level. Um, you know, I think one of the most disturbing um, pieces about the bail and discovery law rollbacks that were included in, in the budget um, is related to the process. Um, I think it's really important to name that bail reform was working, right? The goal of bail reform was to reduce mass jailing across the state. The goal of discovery reform was to make sure that people had information about the case that was going to be brought against them instead of being you know, blindfolded to, to case evidence and then coerced into plea deals. Um, in New York State, 99% of um, of cases resolved through a plea deal. And if you don't have the discovery information, right, you're, you're making a decision um, based upon the, the fear of what, where the fear of what um, the prosecutor is telling you, you know, like this, I'm this, uh, you know, these charges carry a sentence of 25 years, um, but I'm going to give you eight. And the difference there sounds so terrifying that people will plea um, to to charges they've not committed, um, they'll plead to higher charges. And so, you know, these, these laws were working. Um, and, you know, despite all of the fear mongering and disinformation um, that was being spread through the media, through, you know, a coordinated, well-funded opposition campaign driven by law enforcement, prosecutors, um, you know, the very people who have a vested interest in maintaining their power in the system, in maintaining the status quo, um, crime was not going up. People were returning to court. And, you know, we saw a statewide a 30% decrease in um, jail incarceration overall. Um, you know, on any given day, there's almost 7,000 fewer people, uh, legally innocent people who are in jail right now. Um, and, you know, as, as Young Me mentioned, that's important. It's important to reduce incarceration on any day. Um, and it really became a critical public health protection, uh, the bail reform law in the face of COVID-19, where thousands of fewer people cycling in and out of jails um, every single day, right? Um, <clears throat> and so I think, you know, the, the decision to roll back bail was not to roll back the bail reform law, to roll back um, the discovery reform law. And, you know, I'm really grateful to um, Assemblymember New and the many other assembly members and senators who, who really fought um, for justice and fought for policy rooted in fact and policy rooted in, in advancing solutions that actually address the root causes of harm. Um, but the, you know, the rollbacks were, were the result of politics, not data, not facts. Um, almost every media article that we saw <clears throat> that attributed something, uh, you know, everything under the sun to bail reform actually did not have, was not the result of, of the bail reform law. And I think, you know, the something that I think is really important for us to think about and move from societally is that, you know, bail reform <clears throat> really represented and, and continues to represent the opportunity to shift, um, to shift our investment away from incarceration and criminalization um, and, and focus on funding the services and programs that bring stability to people's lives, right? Like jails have for far, for far too long been used as a social safety net to hide away issues of lack of investment in um, you know, affordable, sufficient housing, lack of access to sufficient education and, and lack of access to um, employment. You know, all of these social issues that we're seeing in, in stark uh, relief in this moment with COVID-19, but which exist always. Um, and, and to not hide away like racialized 
um, lack of access, which is what we know happens here. Um, so, you know, I think that, the, that our concerns are valid. We have the whole history of the uh, criminal legal system shows us that as much latitude as um, judges, prosecutors, law enforcement have to criminalize and incarcerate, they tend to use. Um, but that doesn't mean <clears throat> that doesn't mean that we can't fight at the local level um, and, and fight for accountability because the law doesn't require them to incarcerate people. It doesn't require them to jail people um, or set bail. So I think there's still opportunity um, that's really important. I'm going to go to Nick now, just to introduce himself and then uh, talk a little bit about um, some of the changes in bail and uh, some of the things that um, also, uh, I, I know that this is another fight, but uh, we had a question earlier about, um, you know, why is it that public financing of campaigns is so important? Um, and I know that Nick also can talk to that a little bit, so. Thanks so much. Um, thanks, thanks for having me. I really enjoy, um, I forget, but when, I, uh, you know, I enjoy hopping on a little early and hearing from Ricky and Annie and Jane about some of the economic pieces because um, often we look at issues about criminal justice and civil rights as somehow separate from the rest of the world and the other systems that people are trying to navigate. And I think, um, as Joanne said, particularly in this time of recovery from COVID, all of these, these systems and really the failure of these systems are coming into really stark relief in a way that maybe they haven't before. Um, so thank you again for, for having me. I really enjoy um, being involved in these conversations. Uh, but my name is Nick Enkelada Malinowski. I'm a civil rights campaign director at Vocal New York. Uh, Vocal is a grassroots membership based organization. We work, you know, we do organizing and policy work in four main areas ending mass incarceration, ending homelessness, ending the war on drugs, and ending the epidemic of HIV and AIDS. We do most of that work statewide. Um, our, you know, our office is in New York City, but we have organizers both in Western New York and the Capital Region. And then we also do direct services here in New York City for people who use drugs. And during, um, during the shutdown and, pa and pause for, from COVID-19, our direct services have actually been uh, considered essential services. So that, that's really the core of our work that really has been uh, on the front line, so to speak, um, continuing to work with our participants who are by and large street homeless drug users who are finding all of their you know, their, their lives completely upended by all of this, right? Places that people go to get food, people go to get shelter, places people go uh, to shower, to use a bathroom, right? All of these resources have been shut down. So um, yeah, just real shout out to everybody who is addressing this stuff on the front end. Um, in terms of the budget, our civil rights work really did focus on bail and discovery. Um, I don't, I don't want to repeat what other folks have said, but we're also very disappointed with the outcome. Um, it is, um, again, to go back to the way that these issues are intersecting with each other, the, the, there was this um, narrative that was put forward that somehow the bail law by itself was supposed to be either protecting public safety or creating some sort of absence for public safety. And, um, that is, I think, the, the piece that we need to continue to address going forward, because the reality is that any, any like no law can, can provide that, right? That every law, but specifically with laws relating to criminal justice, there is so much discretion in the system but for police, for prosecutors, for judges. Um, every county in New York State has a different jail population and that's really a result of the local politics and resources that they have in that county. And so as we, you know, as we review sort of the bad things that happened in the budget, one of them is bail, but the other piece of it is that we just saw huge cuts to funding for healthcare, for housing, for all of these other things that we know and our members know is what actually provides security and public safety for people. And so what we're looking at now in New York City, for example, is our homeless members, right, trying to avoid COVID, leaving the shelter, which is an unsafe, you know, is, a, is, is supposedly a government intervention, but is one that is unsafe for them, going onto the subway, and then 
getting arrested and having an interaction with the police, which is going to end up being the most unsafe part of their day. And so I think, you know, the, the, the budget is one piece of this, but that we really need to look at. Um, and as Joanne said, like, opportunity is probably the wrong word, but like coming out of this crisis, we do have possibly an opportunity to really reevaluate and look at the way that we structure society. And that if we do focus on the people who are the most marginalized, that the, the solutions that come out of that sort of inquiry is, is going to help everybody and is going to get us to the place where we do have the most safety and the most security for everybody in society. Amazing, amazing. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, thank you. Um, and uh, last but not least, there's Jared, who has to speak a little bit about um, his work uh, at, uh, as, a def as a public defender and also um, some of the things that you guys are seeing on the ground. Thank you so much, Assemblymember, and, and thanks, thanks also for having me. I also appreciate this conversation. So I'm actually not an attorney at Brooklyn Defender Services, but I do work uh, around all these policy issues. And, and uh, Brooklyn Defender Services, or BDS, uh, represents people sort of at the intersection of a, of a lot of the different injustices that we've talked about today. People who are accused of crimes, they're in criminal court. Uh, represents people facing deportation, uh, who are detained and in, in, in facing deportation by ICE people who are facing the loss of uh, loss of their children to ACS, um, as well as people facing loss of, of uh, public benefits or, or housing, people facing eviction. And often we see, um, to Nick's point, uh, how all these systems interact and how often it's uh, one person or one family facing uh, um, sort of the, the full weight of the um, government policies against them uh, across these different um, different court systems and 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 sort of different different issue areas, uh, and and sort of to that end, I think you know I don't want to repeat what's been said, but I, I think you know there's there's also you know from our from our perspective some disappointment in the outcome on the on the budget, but I do want to just zoom out um, and, and to put a finer point on it that you know we're in this this uh, this terrible moment. Uh, it's you know the 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 tr the, the weight of the tragedy uh, is it's almost you know it's it's it, it's it's hard to put it, put it into words. There have been over eighteen thousand deaths in New York City alone, right? I mean, so many of us have have loved ones, people we care about outside of the city and, and, and around the world, and that we're that we're worried about. You know these these are um, you know these these are rates uh, uh, far higher than. Uh, than the harm caused, than the, the rates of death caused in, you know, by crime, even in um, some of the toughest years in this city. And I think it's an opportunity, you know, it's, 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 it's a moment where we are sort of forced to reevaluate um, how we define community safety and what, what keeps us safe. Um, you know, we, we, we know that even in this moment where, you know, the government, you know, the local state, um, maybe to a lesser extent, the feds are, are marshalling resources to try to tackle this pandemic, that we're still so far behind uh, the eight ball here, and you know, look at just state prisons. There's less less than one percent of people in state prisons have been tested for COVID nineteen, even as uh, we know that social distancing is impossible in these facilities and that outbreaks are spreading there. So you know, when when we look at budgets as um, you know as you know moral documents and fiscal documents as opportunities for investments in, in what actually brings real community safety. You know, I think there's a missed opportunity here. We we were, you know, as at Brooklyn Defender Services, we certainly advocate for indigent legal services funding. Um, you know, our expertise and is is not so much in in healthcare and education, but other panelists before before us and and um, coming on soon, I think, have spoken well about or, or will speak about. You know, what what those re, you know what is really needed to uh, to fund those resources. And instead of that, the, the state took a step of, of rolling back some criminal justice reforms as they were um, working remarkably well. Um, you know, there was another opportunity, as, as was mentioned on the last panel, about, you know, or to, to, to help meet some people's needs with, with new community investments through the legalization of, of cannabis and, and reinvestment of revenue in, in the communities that have been targeted um, under prohibition. You know, that was another, another missed opportunity. Um, so, Again, I want to echo what, what Aaron said. As I remember, new and and many of, of, of your colleagues, many of her colleagues were incredibly um, 
powerful and, and, and consistent in resisting um, some of the rollbacks to criminal justice reform and also in, in demanding some of the investments that, that really bring about community safety. Um, and, and also to Nick's point that, you know, the fight has to continue inside and outside of, of budgets that uh, there, there's nothing in the law that requires um, anyone to be in jail pretrial where they're presumed innocent. And, and in fact, you know, under even the old law, there's, there is technically a prohibition on people being in jail simply because they can't afford bail. Uh, and that is only strengthened now under the new laws. So even as we're disappointed in the, in the rollbacks, the, we, we absolutely have to continue to come together and, and, and fight, for our, our, fight for, the, for our communities and, and fight for freedom. Thank you so much, Jared. Um, I also wanted to uh, bring up some of the questions that we've gotten from folks. Um, so uh, this one's a little bit more specific. Police officers will be able to take temporary custody of firearms in domestic violence cases. Um, you know, as a domestic violence survivor, I think it's really important that, um, that we keep people safe. But will this custody exist until everyone is safe? And if it lasts longer, is there a danger for a so-called violation of your Second Amendment rights? So um, I can take that question on. Um, uh, even before we had the bail reform laws that went into effect in January, um, judges always had the power and the authority to uh, prohibit someone from owning, possessing uh, a firearm or any dangerous weapon um, through the use of an order of protection. Uh, and if a final order of protection uh, was entered, and depending on whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony, uh, which is, the, those orders of protection can last for years, um, that final order of protection could also prohibit the possession of a, of a weapon, including a firearm. So there weren't really any constitutional challenges. Um, I can say that in New York City, most people do not have a permit to carry a firearm. Uh, so they're prohibited anyway for anyone. Uh, for most people, unless you're um, an off-duty police officer or a retired police officer, or I, um, there are a few who I guess are uh, where exceptions are made. Um, so, it, it's something that's always been in effect for a while. The new amendments don't change that as well. You, I think you're on mute. I am, thank you, good catch. Um, it, so one more question that we got uh, from somebody who wrote in ahead of time is, is the 20 day period versus the 35 day period for initial discovery crafted on purpose to favor that the defendants be released? It seems like prosecutors would almost welcome the extra 15 day period. Actually, um, that was not done um, in conjunction with bail to try to get people released. It was actually done to alleviate prosecutors' concerns that they didn't have enough time to produce discovery. Um, so I, I will tell you that um, even though there had been a backlog of cases that had started in 2019, um, starting in January of 2020, when the new 15-day time period went into effect, for the most part, with the new cases, the DAs were able to get uh, a, a big bulk of that discovery to us, the defense attorneys, within the 15-day time period. Um, so regardless of whether one was incarcerated or not. So um, it was doable, uh, but there was a real concern about uh, from the DAs and law enforcement that they couldn't do it. Um, and so they bifurcated it to try to ease um, the, the time period. And, and even if the DAs weren't able to make that 15 day time period, um, it wasn't as if they were going to receive huge sanctions. Um, so it wasn't done to try to get people out of jail necessarily. It was to make sure evidence was shared. Yeah. Yes. And so um, this one is probably citizen action and vocal. Uh, why is public financing? I, I, I know I asked it a little bit. Right now, I didn't really get to it. 
Um, I'm happy to jump in. I mean, I think sort of the <clears throat> just basic answer um, is public financing of campaigns is, is critical because we have to remove the influence of big money and well-funded special interests from politics um, and, and increase the power of small donations. Um, you know, we, we see the ways that, um, you know, big money plays out in politics um, and, and well-funded um, <clears throat> entities that, uh, that donate to various electoral campaigns have influence over the ways that the policies that affect all of our lives um, play out, right? We know that sheriffs, law enforcement give an enormous amount of money to various uh, legislators across the state. Um, and, and we know that that has influence on the decisions that various electeds make. Um, you know, I think it's also, it's also really critical to have uh, publicly financed elections or publicly financed campaigns because it gives everyday people the means to run for office, right, and represent their communities um, while relying on small donations from constituents um, instead of having to seek large checks that then create special interest control over um, or influence over decision making. Um, so it's sort of twofold, right, is, is removing that influence of big money, but then also creating a system wherein um, everyday New Yorkers can run viable can like can run viable campaigns to get elected. Um, you know, and I think that there's, uh, you know, there are many, um, there are many electeds, including um, Assembly Member New, who have taken this mantle up in their own campaigns and elections and refused to accept um, money from, um, you know, ex ex refused to accept big money, special interest money from, um, from entities that create harm in our communities and to drive forward their elections and their campaigns um, by relying on small donations. And, and I think it's important because that also makes those folks accountable to their constituents. Um, we did in this budget get uh, some loose, um, you know, it's sort of a, a loose, weak public financing system that is also something to build on. So there has been some progress. It's not sufficient by any means, but I think that there is momentum and energy to build upon that. Um, Nick, I don't know if you have anything to add. Nick? Sure. Thanks, Aaron. Um, that was pretty comprehensive. Uh, but I, the, the one thing I would add is, right, the, the reason that we want everyday people, people from our communities running for office, one, that's, it's just good for democracy, for anybody who wants to run to be able to run. But there's also um, a level of accountability that comes from people who are actually representing the needs of their community in the legislature. That is super important. And again, as we look at what the COVID-19 recovery looks like, that is, it's going to be critical. Like we've seen, for example, the bailouts from the federal government. You've seen uh, embassy suites and the Ritz-Carlton getting millions of dollars of bailouts. That is because the, the majority of elected officials of the federal government are not accountable to their actual constituents and they're accountable to their donors and wealthy people. And the same is true in the state of New York. For us to recover in a meaningful way, we need our representatives to be actually representing the issues of the people that live in their districts and bringing those issues to Albany and fixing them. And the only way that we can ensure that that happens is if we do not have people winning elections bankrolled by the real estate industry or other, um, as Aaron said, big money interests. So super important issue. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, and I also had to go back to Joanne Yu because the Liberty Defense Fund, something that we um, actually did fund partially in the budget and wanted to make sure that we covered some of that as well um, because we know that it's also very disparately uh, doled out. So please, Joanne. So a couple years ago um, when the Liberty Defense Fund was rolled out, we got a grant which we shared with 10 community groups. Um, and it was taking into account, um, you know, the major communities, the Asian communities, the language, uh, you know, the potential um, immigration um, actions that were coming down the pipe, like, you know, TPS, for instance. So 
that project became it was it was the first time ever that we you know uh, engaged in something that big that has to do with immigration um but it got reformatted and so i think a few groups had gotten that grant um but i think you know um what it does with grants like that where you know a few groups get it instead of like a collective is that it pits people against each other um especially by government off that doesn't often recognize the diversity of populations we are we are diverse by language culture religion anything you can think of um immigration history and um you know as a census information center my uh, research and policy director reminds me that you know a good chunk of our community this is the first time they're doing the census uh they are new arrivals since the last census so um you know we have a lot of newcomers and we need to people need to know what their rights are as immigrants and i talked about um public charge before that you know with this unprecedented un unprecedented unemployment people are going to need to know what their rights are and um so we're going to need to build up expertise we need to build up uh the foundation and i think this is where um you know where during a pandemic during when you really need the system to work is exactly what everybody's been saying is where you see the you know the fact that we don't have a system and this is where we're cracking um it's um you know people are panicking people you know my my question you know all the time is if people are disenrolling where are they going to get where are they getting help because i know that some of the big uh food programs have gotten millions of dollars already my community doesn't access that and my my communities are some of the poorest new yorkers so in every way not just immigration but in every way the asian american community i mean you know i've always been so frustrated about how government sees the asian american community but i've been very vocal that this crisis has shown that asian americans are not even second class citizens we're third class citizens because since january when um the hate crime started happening you know nobody, there was there was no help from law enforcement and i had been asking for that help and so everybody takes their own sweet time to be to you know to support our community my biggest fear has been um you know what happens when essential workers go on the on the subway and um you know their targets their victims of hate crimes you know that's a a real question um certainly this is an opportunity to build collaborations between communities of color we're actually working on a program to do that because this can't be like communities of color you know couple communities of color versus the asians because that's not how it's going down i think this really you know every like i said like every weakness that we've had as as a society this has um you know this has put the spotlight and you know i really appreciate the conversations conversations that Aaron and Jared and um and Nick had talked about with all the campaign finance right like the the money in politics but the other thing is you know you can put all the money in there but like unless people go out to vote it doesn't mean a damn thing how much money you have because this is ultimately what it is if you don't go out to vote um nobody's going to care about your community and this is i know the asian american community has one of the lowest votes no, lowest um you know voting power because people are always there's always some excuse right and um but the reality is that that's probably the single most powerful act um if they know that your community is paying attention and you're going to show up you know like literally i've been saying like i'll come out and vote for the dog catcher right because it means that it's one vote that is um critical to lending my voice to my community so i think this is exactly you know besides the money conversation it's also the the actions of the community and i the one wish that i have for the asian american community is the re the realization that you know we have been suffering for a really long time this covid thing hit our shores you know in in january and the asian american community from the get go started suffering and um there wasn't any help and everybody said hey you know um you know we're going to get around to it right nobody you know we've been asking for help pleading my god i mean like you know how many more you know public education you know news media things that i have to do to say the asian american community is suffering and there wasn't any help until it hit the mainstream community so i know for a fact that um asian american community um you know we don't you know it's harsh for me to say but you know i want people to prove me wrong um because the numbers bear out and the other challenge is that um you know as, uh, 
there are a lot of things that we could be frustrated with the governor and the mayor. The reality is that they've never done a pandemic before. So in my, in my own way, maybe it's because it's Sunday and it's, I'm supposed to, you know, I didn't go to church Sunday, but maybe it's because it's Sunday, but they've never done a pandemic before. So I'm, I want to not be like hypocritical. Like I want to say, I'm like, you guys were terrible. You did horrible things because I'm bored. <laughs> no, right. Like they've never done this before. So I get, I get that. But um, how we spend the rest of the dollars is going to really matter. And, um, and for all the budget conversations, it's also how the community will respond. They cannot go back to sitting back and saying, oh, it's a pain in the neck for me to go register to vote, so I'm not going to do it. You know, after all that we've been, how we've been treated, if people are not sitting at home for eight weeks and pro um, processing what this means, you know, that's going to be a damn shame. And it's a wasted opportunity. And I also want to say hello to, I see Carlina, but I also want to see, I also see Jason. So I want to say, Jason, it's so great to see you. Mwah! Um, I wanted to say, uh, you know, thank you so much, Joanne, and thank you so much for the other panelists. Um, we have uh, two other electeds who joined us, and I also um, want to give props to my very good friend, Jason Starr. Uh, Jason uh, was supposed to actually join this panel, but we, uh, we, we kind of had some time mix up because we had to shift from Friday to Sunday, et cetera. So Jason, do you want to say a couple of words on bail and on um, civil rights? Uh, so civil rights and criminal justice reform. Uh, sure, I don't think that I can probably <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's anything to be said that my, my colleagues here um, uh, haven't said, um, but I will say that uh, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Jason Starr, um, and I think relevant for folks here today is um, uh, I spent three years um, as counsel to Governor Cuomo for civil rights and federal affairs um, uh, from 2017 um, until um, uh, September of, of last year. So. Um, it's good to be here. Um, and I'll just say one thing um, that maybe wasn't um, touched upon, which um, is the importance, I think, of everyone in this moment um, to remember that, you know, the executive still retains a significant amount of power in terms of clemency um, to really respond. Um, you, know, what, you know, what happened with regard to the rollbacks of bail reform were definitely unfortunate. And I think they set up, uh, you know, more mobilization, more fights to come um, uh, in the future, but right now, you know, with what's going on in jails and prisons, um, we just have a responsibility, um, and you have someone sitting um, in a position that, by the stroke of a pen, can really um, uh, change folks' lives, but also, you know, change the trajectory of this public health crisis in a really meaningful way uh, for people who don't have voices. Um, he's shown political courage and willingness to do that before, um, but I, in my humble opinion, he needs to do uh, a lot more. Um, and I feel like the, prime, the pump is primed. Um, and so uh, I would just sort of also encourage all of us um, to remember um, that there are a lot of people um, uh, who need our voices um, and need us to advocate um, on their behalf, um, you know, to him um, to, make, um, to make that, you know, a reality. Um, he's on TV every day. He has a national audience. He's executing a national press strategy. So he should be um, uh, executing national leadership uh, on um, how to respond um, and use all of the tools in the toolkit um, to help New Yorkers, all New Yorkers, um, you know, weather this crisis um, in a way that I know we can. Thank you, Jason. That was such a good way to close. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your power and those words and for this whole entire panel for um, bringing awareness to folks uh, about, you know, some of the changes and some of the things that still haven't been done and some of the things that we need to do better um, for to, to basically dismantle and redesign a system that is um, working exactly the way that it was designed to to hurt particular communities. So I wanted to say thank you again to Joanne Yu, especially uh, on the civil rights stuff um, that we've been working on uh, together. And she's just an incredible advocate, especially for our AAPI community. So thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to start to start our education panel. Folks can uh, move to the attendees part or you can stay on if you want. So just wanted to say thank you. And um, for our, our, our education panel. Thank um, you. Thank you so much, guys. Um, for our education panel, 
want to take a brief moment before we start to um, say hello to our two elected officials today, uh, Carlina Rivera, our amazing city council member on the east side, and then um, Arabella Samos, who's joining us all the way from Queens. <laughs> so, uh, Carlina, can you say a couple of words, and then have, uh, and then Arabella, can you say a couple of words just to say hello to everyone? And um, also, you know, I know that you guys are doing so much during uh, this crisis, so wanted to say thank you um, for for continuing to support our community. Oh, thank you for your partnership, you lean and for like an epic town hall. Let me tell you, this is why you need more women in office. We are the ones that can hold down a six hour town hall, answer questions, go do the deliveries, maybe get 30 minutes of yoga in because we need it. But, um, I just want to, I want to thank you. You've covered so many topics today. I was looking at all of the things that you covered and right now the criminal justice piece is so important because we have been calling to release more people from Rikers Island, you have seen where this virus has really run rampant. It's in our prisons, it's in our nursing homes, and it's in really our shelter system where people cannot social distance. So really with a flick of a pen, you know, clemency can save lives. So thank you for that last panel and, and for, the, for the people here who are gonna talk on education, I've learned so much from, from many of you and we're really working together to try to kind of live this new normal, but also figure out how we're gonna help all of the, the, the children and the students in our city who, you know, I represent uh, school district one and two, and, and so does Yulene, and they are so, so, so different. And we don't want it to be that way, but, but that is our reality in, in terms of inequity and resources. So I know this is really about the budget, um, this kind of a focus there. The city is about to enter negotiations. I know the state will likely get back together they're gonna figure a few things out to try to help New Yorkers. And um, we're, I know, I know, mm, but <laughs> oh, we know. Let's I, hope. Know. I hope, I hope, but listen, listen, you know who the fighters are, you know where they were when, when it came down to making a really tough decision on a budget that left zero dollars for NYCHA, that left so many people out in the cold and we wanna do the right thing. So the city, we're gonna face a, a really, really, some really tough challenges ahead. $2 billion in cuts in this fiscal year, five to seven billion in the next. We are all focused on what we think are the necessities. That's housing, healthcare, food, and education, and in New York City, transportation as well. And so those are gonna be really what we hone in on in terms of making sure that we restore those programs and services that are so important. Um, every day we're working, we're working around the clock. And I just wanna thank all the experts, all the people, the panelists, the activists, the parents, uh, just the concerned neighbors that have helped us do this work. Um, it is not easy and um, it has been incredibly stressful, but we have so much talent and expertise here in New York City that uh, I know that we don't walk alone. So I just wanna thank you. Thank everyone for participating. Uh, I know we're going into education and you're about to hear from, uh, uh, again, a number of people. You know, Naomi Pena gave me the idea that for a Facebook Live special, we should have someone to talk about family wellness and coping with mental health especially when we're thinking about our students, our teachers, and what they're going through. The guidance counselors, the social workers, dealing with death, remote learning, and everything else. So we are bringing someone on this Tuesday at 7.30. I hope you'll join us. And uh, thank you, Yulene. Thank you, Assemblywoman, uh, for, for working so hard and, and continuing to slay. Thanks, Carlina. Arabella. Oh, oh, there you're unmuted now. You're, oh, you're... let me. Oh, great. All right, Hello, nice. everyone. Hello, Yulene. Hello, Carlina. Hello, everyone who's on this, uh, who's on this call. I really want to thank my colleague, Assemblywoman New. She is fierce. She can put this together. She can go out and help feed her constituents, get them PPE, do all of this, and look fantastic doing it. So. I see you there, um, but nonetheless, look, it's, in, it's an incredibly stressful time right now for everyone, particularly for families, particularly for students. Uh, you know, right now, during this whole crisis, what I have, un, what I, I've always recognized this and realized this, but I know it more than ever now, we have to reevaluate how we, how we fund and how we pay our labor in this city. I think we need to, reshuffle where our where our resources go because i think teachers and educators need to get paid at least double i can't tell you how hard it is to educate a seven and a half year old i have my daughter here homeschooling it's crazy i i mean i want to erect statues to all the educators because it is 
it really is God's work, what you're doing. So thank you. You know, Yulene, you and I have talked about um, this budget, which has been, you know, we didn't do what we needed to do this year in the state. What we need to do is make sure that we have more resources to pay for the things that we need. Particularly as our children start to go, start a new school year, we have to make sure that we have the resources to invest in them. Every child, every educator, everyone should have access to mental health uh, resources because this is an incredibly stressful time. And as much as you try to uh, make it upbeat and um, hopeful for them, they are suffering. They really are suffering, whether they express it or not. Every child and every educator should have an opportunity to talk to somebody starting the next school year, whenever that should be, or whenever they need to, in order to be able to get the help that they, that they may need. Um, so again, Yulene, I, I can't tell you how important this is because really what we should be focusing on, if we do do adjustments in our state budget and as a city is determining what their budget is gonna look like, we need to have more resources to pay for the critical things that we need. And the only way we can do that is if, you know, we tax more people and tax the people who can actually pay for these services. But thank you all, Eileen, thank you. Carlina, good luck on the city budget. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a tough one this year, I'm sure. And some of it's our fault, sorry. Sorry. Yep. Um, thank you so much, Arabella, for joining us. I'm gonna mute you now again, um, just so that we can our panelists. Um, I, I'm really excited about this panel because um, this is uh, one of the biggest issues going on right now for so many parents and so for so many students in our district. Um, we're going to talk about education and the way that our budget is affecting education. Uh, it's going to be a tough discussion, um, so everybody be prepared. It's not pretty right now. Um, we have the amazing Naomi Pena, uh, the president of CEC1. Um, we have Shino Tanikawa, the member of CEC2. Uh, I also have Zakia Ansari, the advocacy director and New York City director of the Alliance for Quality Education. Um, Zakia and I have been fighting side by side for almost, I want to say like almost 10 years now for, um, for making sure that we've got uh, funding for education. And I just want to say thank you to all of you for your advocacy. And right now, um, this is this is insane. Like, I, don't even, I don't even know what to say. This is traumatic. And so our budget um, this year has cuts to education and the governor is still proposing $10 billion more cuts. Um, and some of that's also coming from education and we have not fully even funded our education system um, in so long that the need has grown and the disparity has uh, grown um, larger and larger and larger every single year. Uh, our district, our school district here in lower Manhattan has been on the front page news of the New York Times for segregation and we've we've had issues here that have long time been um, you know it it been socioeconomic as well as um, uh, uh, racially and ethnically that needed to be addressed for a very very long time and I wanted to say uh, again that we have a ton of questions <laughs> that have already come in on education and so um, but I'm gonna just for, for brevity and for um, for uh, for us to be able to kind of get everything in, um, we do have a hard stop at six. But I do want to say that um, you know uh, this is one of the most important discussions that we can have. We are lacking resources, and I went over already some of the things that we lacked in budget for education. But I want to say that you know for just for the people at home and the process that things go through, um, education and healthcare are the two biggest pots of money within our state budget. And so anytime um, the governor looks to cut something, he reaches for the biggest pots instead of looking at the entire budget and seeing where it is like corporate tax rates. Maybe we can stop giving some of those. I don't know. Um, some of the little things that are, you know, mad horrible in our prison uh, system, like maybe we should be um, looking at, some, at cutting some of those things that we're, that we're paying for. And like, like maybe some of the things that we're doing um, when we're saving money and investing in NORCs and things like that, like in our healthcare system, we should be choosing those things as savings you know we should be investing in infrastructure instead of um you know instead of cutting where we can't afford it which is you know our students right now are one of the biggest investments that we can make in helping to restart our economy and yet 
and yet we're cutting everywhere, including our SYEP program, which I believe is actually a racial justice issue. I want to put that out there. Um, and I want to thank Carlina for her incredible advocacy on trying to bring back SYEP. Thank you so much, Carlina, for standing firm with us. Um, but I wanted to, uh, you know, kind of have a quick intro between the three of you. Um, and then uh, I'm going to go and jump right into questions because there are just so many. So um, I'm going to start. Uh, I'm gonna start with Naomi since uh, she's first on the list. Hi everyone, my name is Naomi Pena. I'm CEC1 president, but I'm also a lifelong um, born and raised in the Lower East Side. And I am fortunate, as I always say, that I can even raise my four kids in the Lower East Side. Um, just getting right straight to the budget. I think um, one of my biggest frustrations is that um, education every time we go into budget season regardless of what the situation is there's always a a a, a scared tactic around budgets even when we're like high money flowing in it's always the budgets are going to be dire we have to cut and it's always like you know how much do you call a bluff but i understand there we're in a dire situation now my biggest frustration is um as just as a parent and now a parent advocate and a leader, I think there are certain things that should be sacrilege. We should not be touching education. We should not be touching healthcare. Um, we cannot expect to continue to cut the only source of revenue that public schools have to educate the children, 1.1 million kids in the city. It is literally the only resource they have. So if you start cutting the money, what do you think that's gonna mean? That's gonna mean more kids in the classroom. That's gonna be less people to hire for the kids. Thus, we're gonna have more kids in the classroom. We're gonna not have the ability to hire enough staff to provide the related services that a lot of the students with disabilities needs. They're gonna to have to double and triple up. We already don't have enough money for um, guidance counselors that we're going to need direly when school goes back in session because of the trauma this experience has caused. So, you know, short of, of doing a, a form of like, I, I, this is why this gets really overwhelming, really stressful because, you know, every year we hear the same thing, but it became so clear by what was being reported out by Assemblywoman Yuleen and Harvey Epstein how depressing it really truly was that I was terrified. And the fact that, you know, yes, it has been allocated, but the fact that that is going to be threatened, depending on how this continues to move, doesn't sit well with me. And I, I think we all need to start taking a hard look at, at ourselves that we want to elevate everyone, but we really don't want to elevate everyone. Because if we really care to elevate every single person, every single child in the school system, we wouldn't be touching the budget. Um, because then now we are relying on PTAs to start funding the difference. And not all PTAs are built equally. So I think we, we have to take a hard look at ourselves and how we're gonna manage the expectations that we demand of our students. All right, Shino. Great. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, it's actually a little bit depressing on a beautiful Sunday, but it's important that we talk about it, right? So I want to start with just laying a little bit of um, a, a sort of on the ground research, anecdotal stories that I'm hearing from families of how remote learning is going. We still have families without digital devices. That is a truth. We have families with digital devices, but without reliable internet connection. We have families with a digital device shared amongst multiple students in the same household. We have families who are in a one room hotel room in temporary housing, trying to find food and trying to manage remote learning. So that is the reality. And even some of the more affluent families, some of my friends are struggling because their kids have disabilities and there's just no way that all their needs can be met through remote learning. They need one-on-one -on -one in person services. So what this all means is some students are sliding back. 
many students are not getting what they need in terms of academic instruction, but also emotional supports. So when we start the next school year, we're gonna be starting from a deficit place, right? We're going backwards or we're not making progress. And what that means is we're gonna need more resources, not less. Mm -hmm. There's just no way to talk about this without realizing that we are in a pandemic, we all know that. And what that really means is that we are gonna need more resources for our students, not less. And I understand finances are tough, but none of the revenue bills passed. And I really, really want those revenue bills to move forward. Yes. Right? I don't care what those rich people have to say. It's time that we, we elevate the needs of our most vulnerable students. And the only way to do that is their fair share need to be contributed. This is time when everybody has to contribute. Why should they get off? with their second homes and whatever and not kick in and contribute to the recovery of our society that made them rich in the first place. So the revenue bills are important. In terms of cuts to the education at the city level, we have to find another way. We cannot cut monies that go into the classrooms. That's fair student funding. We, can, we just simply cannot do that because if we do that, then we're gonna be paying for the cost, the price of that cuts for decades to come. And I think that's something that budget people have to understand. Cuts today, we're gonna to be paying for that for decades to come. It's not just a one year thing. That's right. It's in the services that are not being provided. It's in academic instruction that's not going to be provided. That's in remedial work the students need that won't be happening. All those things are going to make our system further and further and further behind. Ten years down the road, we're going to need a lot more resources to bring us all up to where we need to be. It's a short-sighted financial strategy that does not make sense in the long run. So the state revenue bills, and we also have to go after the federal funding. So I hope that parents out there and advocates, we can work together to get federal funding into the city system and push for the revenue bills at the state level and pressure the city government not to cut education funding. Thank you. Thank you, Shino. Um, I mean, you listed some of the most important parts and I'm with you 100% of the way because that's literally part of my budget speech, which was just to say like, you know, we should have taken on the responsibility of cushioning some of the, some of the blow, right? Because otherwise we're going to feel the deficit for a very, very long time and we're going to be entering the deepest recession that we've ever seen in our lives um, or in many lifetimes, actually. Um, and I just wanted to say that, um, you know, what you were saying was so true that the resources and the disparities are actually getting a lot worse. Um, because for some students, um, kids who are homeless, for example, and we have a lot of homeless kids in our school system, um, I wanted to uh, kind of just put a story out there because um, you know this was actually one that kind of broke my heart when um, I was talking to this little girl. She was trying to get some food. I was like, how's a home you know, remote learning going? And she was just like, oh, um, I don't have a computer, um, so I can't join in yet. And I was just like, oh, okay, well, maybe I can get you a computer. And she was just like, because I don't have a mom and dad to wait in line for me. And I was just like, oh, you don't have a mom and dad to wait in line for you. Like, they couldn't wait to, to get a computer. And then um, I asked her, you know, well, well, maybe they can ship one to you. She says, um, you're not allowed to ship things to the shelter. And um, you're not allowed to ship things to the shelter. You're not also, um, uh, you know, she said they will get stolen. And so, you know, there's, there's folks who um, are completely left behind. Um, you know, I gave her my own computer, which I, you know, my own laptop, but I, I shouldn't have, <laughs> um, you know, been, uh, you know, able to, I shouldn't have had to do that. You know, our system should have been covering that. Um, but, you know, it's like, it's a, it's so really devastating and she was only 12 you know and she was all alone um she was she had foster parents that you know put her place to place to place and then um and then i think that she ran away but went to uh still wanted to go to school and it, it it's a whole story but i wanted to say that you know 
uh, we have uh, folks who are who are left behind, but not just are they left behind, um, you know, within the school system as it was already, but the disparity is getting a lot worse and where, you know, they're missing months and months of school, even when they don't want to, right? And I think that that's really heartbreaking and um, something that we need to uh, figure out. Um, so I'm gonna actually um, have Zakia speak and then uh, there's a couple of uh, questions that I wanted to really kind of get to, including uh, ones that people have written in prior and folks that have written into the chat. Thank you, Assemblywoman uh, Woman New. Um, yeah, we're here again. Um, first, I want to start off by saying um, Ramadan Mubarak to all the uh, Muslim family out there. It's a uh, holy time for us, um, and sun up to sundown, we're fasting. So I think that's another thing that educators and others need to take um, heed of and understand and give parents and community members and students some grace in this moment um, to understand that they're fasting. Um, and what could that mean uh, and how could that impact remote learning? Um, I'll say real quick, uh, instead of going to a lot of stuff, we have 112 billionaires in the state, more than in the nation, I think, or more than in the world, uh, $525 billion of wealth. That was pre-pandemic, uh, where we know many of them have guarded way more wealth as we speak. Um, we, would, we don't need to be in this situation right now, but we have a governor who chose to put us in this situation right now. So let's be clear on that. I think as we talk about choice, he made a choice to do that and he has done that for the last 10 years. Um, and so while we might wanna elevate this governor and his response to the pandemic, um, that's your choice and that's your option, but his legacy of 10 years and his uh, mismanagement and inequity and, and his educational racism, I might say, and his, and, his, and his inequitable funding of our public schools cannot be denied. And we must constantly bring that up, right? Um, so this budget, zero dollar increase, uh, which meant specifically for New York City, more than $500 million in cuts, um, a $0 increase across the state, and uh, while at the same time, uh, we're in the midst of a pandemic, right? Um, so we need leadership, uh, and Governor Cuomo has not been there. I also want to call in and say, I don't know, I, you know, has, has anybody seen or heard from Carl Hasty or Andrea Stewart Cousins, but they've been very silent. We haven't heard them respond. I don't want to hear that it's behind the scenes conversations happening. Your community needs you to be public and vocal in this moment right now to say you do not agree with what's happening and these are the things you're doing to make changes. We also know that the governor has rolling powers now um, because of the state legislature, not because of the assemblywoman new, uh, but because others um, who allows him now, now he has the power to make rolling cuts throughout the year. Um, and we thought that was going to be on April 30th. It's clearly, it seems that he is waiting to see what we get with the stimulus before he decides what he wants to do. That is a problem. I hope that everybody thinks is it. I hope everyone who's listening and those who are not hearing believe that is a problem. Uh, this, this governor cannot be king and ruler. Um, he is he's a governor. Um, and for the fact that we are talking about what Naomi talked about, what Shino talked about, that's what we know. That's not even what we don't know. The impact, the trauma, the harm is there's so many things that we don't know. Um, we were on a call the other day and um, it was shared, how many students will drop out? I had never thought about that. How many kids will we lose? Because they had, didn't have all the things that was just shared. They're in temporary housing, right? And they're experiencing all that. How many will we lose? Um, and I don't think it's, we shouldn't have to lose any, right? And so I think the continuation of what the governor did on the state budget, and let's be clear, he's been doing this for his whole 10 years and yes, the, the, the gap between the wealthiest school districts, the 100 wealthiest and 100 poorest school districts have grown to more than $10,000. Unacceptable. But these are the things that no one knows because we're so um, focused, rightfully so, on this pandemic. Um, this governor ran as the anti, you know, I'm going to be the anti-Trump. I didn't vote for him either three times. He ran as the anti-Trump, was a low bar from the get-go. But he's done so many things. He's a corporate dem who cares about who's funding his schools. He's a corporate dem that doesn't care about the people, right? But he talks really good because he's a politician. I'd rather someone who's gonna make sure that if it's a, a budget, we believe a budget is a moral document. If that's the case, clearly the governor does not believe that. But if that's the case, where is the governor's morals lie? Because it is not for the people. When we had 220,000 less hospital beds, 
when we dismantled and did so much harm as it pertains to bail reform. We didn't, when we didn't do enough around housing and now we're sitting here talking about education. And I'll end with this and saying, obviously that translates to New York City budget. Um, I don't need to be a fan of Mayor de Blasio's. One thing we know we need to do is invest and divest, right? Or divest and invest. And we need to divest in NYPD because that budget is $6 billion. And instead of increasing it to create more police officers, which we see what they're already doing in our communities, we see what they already have done in black and brown communities. To increase that budget more is a slap in the face. There's 7,000 cops out six and there's still a bunch roaming. Why do we need more? How do we take time to invest and have a shared sacrifice? Like Brad Lander, Council Member Brad Lander said here in New York City, his community sacrificed a $23 million compost project this year. It was important to their community, but they understood that they had to share in the sacrifice. And so we need to do that. We cannot, we cannot withstand a billion dollar cut in New York City. We just cannot, it will not happen. And so what we can do is tax billionaires who have made more money now than they were even just two months ago. Um, and we need to push the governor and the state leadership to say, yes, we can do that. Yes, we need to do that. And yes, we must do that. Um, and we have a town hall, which was shared in the, in the, um, in the uh, chat uh, coming up this Wednesday, May 6th. New York City and Education is AQE and the Coalition for Educational Justice joining an emergency town hall because we need to all we need all hands on deck right now and we're hoping that all of you will join us in this fight. I, we're, we're not out for the count yet. Um, we got to fight hard because our children deserve every inch and ounce of sweat, tear, and, and, and strength we can to fight against this devastating budget. Thank you. The key is always fire. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, kind of get to the questions really, really quick. We had one um, that was in the chat here. Um, I'm gonna direct this one just to Naomi and Shino real quick, um, and then Zakia can um, follow up with the budget implications. So <clears throat> it says, how will the budget affect Title I schools who are already struggling and rely on PTAs to raise money from the disadvantaged school community? So this is what, exactly what Shino was talking about. With the new grading system the DOE has announced for middle school kids, how will this affect the admissions process for high school? And there are no grades other than N or S. Is that for the whole year or just remote learning? And no absences counted and no state tests. So for Title I funding for schools that do receive Title I, um, I think the DOE is trying to actually make sure whatever Title I funding that does not get spent this school year gets rolled over to next year. So that's one little sort of in the weed kind of thing that we're um, monitoring that makes sure that whatever is not spent this year should be rolled over. But the schools should be able to be spending that Title I money now. I think there are ways to do that just to ensure that the families who need resources are getting resources through that Title I funding. Um, in terms of grades, the grading policy the DOE came up with last week is for the, the final grades of the year. So for the marking period that the students are in right now, my understanding is schools are using the existing grading system for this current marking period. And for the final grades, schools need to use the guidance that came out from the central office this last week. So for um, K through five, that's meeting standards or needs improvement. Those are the two categories. For middle school, you have meeting standards, needs improvement, and there is another category called in progress. And the details we need to actually ask those who came up with the policy for what that means in terms of in progress. Um, because it's essentially, it's, it probably means summer school or additional instruction somehow to move you from in progress to meeting standards. I think that's how they're gonna do that piece. For high schools, it's um, existing either letter grades or 100 point scale, except no student will be given a failing grade. So those students who can't make the passing grade, they will be given in progress again. And the high school students will have until January 2021 to make up that lost work to gain that credit. So that's sort of the nutshell that I, the way I understand it. 
but I definitely urge parents to check in with their schools and also the DOE website to read up on the details of these policies. Uh, PTA fundraising, who knows what's going to happen? I really have no clue. And we'll uh, make sure the DOE website is on the uh, chat list for everyone. Great. Um, this one's coming from uh, Aaron. I'm having a hard time finding a simple way for my students to access telemedicine, telecounseling. Is there any easy resource that they can access? Um, that I don't know. I mean, DOE has posted a lot of sort of, um, you know, DIY resources for families to look up. Um, like websites and links. Um, personally, I know my one of my kids' um, school counselor has been reaching out to him weekly. They have like a weekly session. Um, you know, it's only like half an hour, but it's literally just a check-in. He's in, in middle school. So that's the way they've been working that. Um, but, you know, for her, she um, extended the option if you wanted to meet via video or via FaceTime. So that's the way that's working. Now, um, I am hearing through um, other sort of um, counseling entities that they have incorporated telemedicine because they have no other choice um, to meet with their clients. So I'm going to gather that CBOs that already have counseling services are continuing that service as well via telemedicine. I would just encourage you to um, reach out if you do have a list of CBOs in your school district. Like, um, If you are in the school district one, let me know. Happy to give you a list of those CBOs that have that. I'm sure Eulene has them as well. Um, and you can reach out to them and they can then give out those um, they can tell you what services they are offering and how you can partner, give, you know, offer them to the families that need it. And I'll make sure to um, put that into our, uh, I'll make sure to mail that out, but I'll put that into our, one of our newsletters as well. That's very helpful. Thank you for that question. And also, I think UFT is offering free counseling for students yeah. as well, right? So I guess, Erin, you're a teacher, so you may, you should be maybe looking into the UFT services. Um, I forgot to answer one part of the question from the last question from Melissa. Admissions. Um, I'm throwing my hands up. Who knows? I know that the DOE is thinking about it. I know, I know that central office people and enrollment office people know that they have to come up with something soon, but we don't know what that's going to be like. Thank you. Um, and uh, so maybe this one can go to uh, Zakia. Uh, if the state is $4 billion short of having a truly equitable education system, what parts of the system will actually not be funded this fiscal year? So what's going to be missing? I mean, we already know, if you, uh, you know, the, what's the first thing that normally gets cut, right? It's like art and music and Rochester, they're losing, they, you know, they had this great program. They hired all these social workers to support students in Rochester from any trauma and they saw results in, in actually academically of success and they've already had to cut some, now they're looking to cut more. Um, so we know what's going to happen in the moment of a pandemic where students are going to be so traumatized, families are going to be traumatized. The one thing we don't need cut are those kind of services. And we know for a fact those would be the ones that are being cut because you see what's happening in Rochester already. Like they're, they're fighting tooth and nail to keep the few that they have left. Um, and we don't need to be cutting those types of things uh, at all. And we, we, we shouldn't be uh, if we had a governor who cared more about us than he did his donors. Uh, fight wars. Um, how will schools be able to resume in the fall under social distancing rules if vaccines are not uh, expected to be available for another 18 months? I mean, I mean, Sheena could just to it too. I mean, the rumor, I, I don't know for it to be a fact, but what we're hearing is a lot of different uh, uh, analysis, analogies, analysis of how, what that would look like. So uh, we heard that it, would be, it could be part-time, like how do you have a thousand kids in a school? How do you have, uh, you know, 30 kids in the class or 36 kids in a classroom, like some classrooms have. And so it could be a hybrid of um, uh, off, off sessions, like some kids would come in a day and some would, uh, to come in the afternoon. Um, you might have some remote learning happening a certain period of time during the week and another half you might be in the school building. At the end of the day, all these things are just really bad, even if that's the case for parents and, and families, because how who works? 
if you have to go out and work and your child is only going to school potentially part time uh, in a building half a day and then goes in later, like who, how does that how does that work? Um, so I'll stop it there. I mean, that's what we hear, we're hearing. I don't know exactly what it looks like. I don't see us being back in the school, but that's just me, not AQE. I don't see how that, what that looks like right now. Um, but she know on there, we might have some. Either one of you. I have the same information. I know the DOE has a contract with a vendor to actually start thinking about a variety of scenarios, but I don't really know what they all are. I did hear maybe, you know, two days in the building, three days at school, I'm at home, remote learning, that kind of scenario that we don't really know. I was hearing like reduced class size, six feet apart, which will mean probably no more than 10 to 15 kids max, depending the size of your classroom, depending the structure of your building. And in school district one, we have buildings that are over a hundred years old. So that means like maybe six kids in the classroom. Um, I think sadly, this is really gonna go down to the wire um, of how this is gonna come because much like everything else DOE does, it's always super last minute or the day before. So. I don't doubt this will be much the same. Um, so, so you had talked about this before, about the correlation between funding and class size. Um, and if there is social distancing that makes it so that, I mean, we're already not able to get our class sizes down um, with the funding that we had and now with cuts um, and they're expecting uh, teachers to have even smaller class sizes where social distancing thing to happen. I'm just, I'm just wondering how that's going to work out and if there's any logical actual answer to that because that sounds like the opposite of possible. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not just impossible. It's like literally, I don't think that that's not, that's, it's, uh, that doesn't sound like math to me. That doesn't sound like the math is going to work out. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I mean, that's just a follow-up question, I guess. But um, I think, you know, if, if, if we've been fighting for smaller classrooms for so long and we couldn't get it with the funding we have, and then, um, and now with cuts, they expect people to social distance and have smaller classrooms, I'm not sure how that's gonna go. Well, I think the only way the math can make sense is if every student cuts down the number of instructional hours by half, right? I mean, that's the only way to actually create small class sizes. And I don't know if the New York State Education Department is gonna do something like that, I have no idea. But there, it's physically not possible to reduce class sizes with the current funding, let alone reduced funding. And we simply don't have enough space either because as you know, the capital plan is not funded at the full level that it needs to be. So I'm just, you know, guessing, but how else would you have small class sizes? You just scared the crap out of me. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Does that mean that they're gonna like just swap kids out as fast as ca they can, like 20 minutes each or something? Who knows? Who knows what they're thinking? I mean, I think that's part of the problem. Am I, am I on mute? No, I'm not. <laughs> I think that's part of the problem. Like, that there's so <laughs> many unknowns um, and that, um, but at, and at the same time, understanding that this is something very new and there's a lot of different moving parts and components that the Department of Education has to figure out how they pull together. But I think the fact that you're having this conversation allows us to elevate those things. So we should all be asking these questions. We should all be thinking about what that looks like. Because at the end of the day, if that happens, what does this look like? I think we've done a lot of impossible things, things that people said could not be done, right? We got nurses in every school, right? We, we, uh, paid sick leave and all these other things national federally that we couldn't do but somehow we did it all big businesses now you know found it hard to give kids computers etc these are things that could have been done but it took a pandemic i think i heard on another part one of the other panels say something like that it took a pandemic for us to all be in the same boat to realize that you know we we can do some things right while at the same same time understanding that disaster capitalism is happening at the same time Right. And so that's why Jeff Bezos, because everybody's ordering and his mindset, it wasn't like, let's make sure the workers are in healthy spaces. That wasn't it. It was like, how do we hire more people to, to manage demand? And now he's like a trillionaire. Right. So how do we pay attention to all these things and acknowledge that Joanne, I think on the last panel said, we cannot go back to normal. The only normal I want to go back to is being able to hug on folks and love on people. The other normal we had didn't serve everybody well. Matt, it didn't serve most of us well. And we're seeing that firsthand play out, regardless of Trump or not, like he's just, he's the, the bottom of the bottom. But we are really seeing 
a couple of things. One, how people can step up and support each other and what we should be doing from the get-go, checking on our elderly, taking care of our undocumented folks and protecting them, taking care of each other and looking out for each other and feeding people and housing them, right? Basic things that we should all already have been doing. And hopefully that reminds us that, and we don't want to go back to normal. So when people say, let's go back to normal, we don't want to do it. And lastly, I'll just say, I know people, you know, the, the, the Department of Education, I want to be clear, like Chancellor Carranza, you may, you can, you can say you don't like uh, um, the policy, but this man put forth equity for all. When for 12 years we had Bloomberg who didn't care about hoot about any of us, privatized the heck out of our schools, cut them as well, and put tons of NYPD to the tunes of which we spend hundreds of millions of dollars on police and schools. He put forth all these different agendas and put people in it who look like all of us on this call right now. All of us. When there was hardly anybody that looked like any of us on this call right now. And so while everything is not rosy and perfect, let me be clear, this man cares about our kids and he wants them to do right. And if anything, we should understand that we have to do the outside, in, inside, outside strategy because it's us, the parents, community members, and educators who are going to move the system because the system is not going to move if we don't. You're right. You're right. And I just wanted to say something else that um, just kind of close us out on stuff. But, um, you know, what, what you said just like hit home because I, I was, you and I actually had a little Twitter combo about it earlier, but, um, you know, we're in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. We're not, we're not like everybody's in different boats, man. And there's like some people who are in yachts and some people got a floaty device and sometimes the floaty device got a hole in it, you know, like some people got dinghies, you know, and a little raft or something, but it's just, it's, we're not in the same boat and that storm is going to hit certain people harder than others. And um, some people will be wiped out because of that storm. And I think that, you know, we have to make sure to be very conscientious about um, about how that reflects, especially uh, in our in our education system, where uh, disparity and uh, where um, you know inequality can actually start for a small child. And so, I wanted to um, just say, uh, in closing, for our entire uh, workshop and for our entire town hall, that you know, right now, um, you know, what Zakia just said was so so true. You know. Um, you know, this is a spotlight, you know, it took a pandemic, it took a pandemic to show us where there are so many things that we've done wrong, and so many things that we needed to change. And so many things that, you know, I mean, we shed pur purposefully, we shed 25,000 hospital beds. Do people realize that? Like, it's like a thing, you know, and, and, and so I think, you know, what Joanne was saying about how like, there is no new normal, like what you were saying, Zakia, also, you know, it's, it's true, but also I think that there are things that we are learning to. Um, one of the biggest is how interconnected we actually all are. And, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, we're interconnected and we affect one another. And so when we help others also, like we're helping ourselves, you know, when I'm helping my neighbor, I'm helping myself, making sure that somebody's safe. Like I'm helping everybody else around them stay safe too, you know? And we also know that the folks who are taking the hardest hits and the biggest risks and, 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 and forced to be at the front lines are the people who are also not covered by our system that are not, you know, even thought about in our system. And we also know that we cannot cut our way out of this. We cannot cut our way out of a recession and we cannot cut our way to recovery. And investing in healthcare will heal us. Investing in housing will keep us safe. Investing in our kids and in our education system will grow our economy and help us to recovery. And we need a budget that shows that we value people and that we value that interconnectedness and that we value um, infrastructure and the things that will help to build us, not to cut us and tear us down. And I think that um, these cuts are hurting us in ways that in ways that are just so visible that you can't deny it. The domino effect isn't hidden anymore. It's not like you can go about your daily life and just think, you know, oh, nothing's changed. The domino effect is right now it's every day and it's for that little girl it's for the restaurants it's for 
every single person who can't pay rent, who couldn't pay rent yesterday. It's for every single person who, you know, is traumatized by what's going on right now. And I just wanted to say thank you so much. We're all fighting for budget justice. We're all fighting to make sure that the folks in our neighborhoods can get the things that they need and so desperately need right now. Um, I can't ask for better partners in my elected officials. Carly and I, I'm looking at you right now. Um, I, I can't ask for better partners. I can't ask for better advocates than all the people who took you know, the time to advocate uh, today. And I, I just wanna say thank you for all of you for taking the time and for taking um, so much care of your community. Um, and I also wanted to add that there was one more question by Erin, um, but I think we're gonna, um, I, I, she wants to touch base. I know that all of you can see the chat on, on her plans and uh, to, to work on some of the education stuff. And so maybe Naomi, Shino, Zakia, maybe you guys can talk to her as well and reach out to her as well. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you so much to all of you. And I don't wanna leave any questions unanswered, but um, we have a couple and I'm, I'll get back to every single person who wrote to me um, and I'll get back to folks uh, with answers, uh, you know, regarding um, different services in our newsletters, etc. And again, um, thank you all for joining us. And, you know, hopefully we have uh, another town hall soon, um, but hopefully together. So thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone.